call the order of the meeting of the Common Council for Tuesday, August 16, 2022. Clerk? All 12 are present. Thank you. Uh, now rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so we are now on item D, appointment of the interim clerk. So this is appointment of Assistant Finance Director, Treasurer Pamela Manley, and interim clerk for this special council meeting. Entertain a motion. Second. Motion has been made by Alder Johnson, seconded by Alder Stevens. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. We're now on to committee of the whole. Um, item one, so this is from the August 2nd, 2022 Common Council meeting to hold a special meeting on Tuesday, August 16 at 5 p.m. to allocate the American Rescue Plan Act funding proposals. Um, since this would normally be an activity of the, the Finance Committee, I will kick things over to to Alder Johnson. Um, if yeah, he has I, mean, I would offer up a motion to just receive and place on file this item. Okay. Alder makes a motion to receive and place on okay. file. Um, that was made by Alder Johnson, seconded by Alder Weary. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. On to item two for consideration with possible action. to suspend the rules and take up items two through 47. Right. Alder Johnson moves to take up the remaining items at the same time. I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Is there a second for that? Second. Second by Alder Scannell. Alder yeah. Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Just to explain the purpose of the vote, we obviously have a lot of members of our community here who wish to speak on different items. There might even be some folks through Zoom. I was uh, talking uh, with the city attorney and some other department heads today about procedurally some things that we could do perhaps to expedite this a little bit. By suspending the rules and taking up all of these items at one time, it allows any member of the public to come up right now and speak on any of these items. We don't have to wait for their item to come up in this list of 47 things. That's the only purpose for the motion. Any additional comments on that? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Motion to open the floor. Second. Motion has been made to open the floor by Alder Johnson, seconded by Alder Scannell. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. And just feel free to, to pop up, approach the podium, state your name and address, and speak to the item that you're here for. And we will be monitoring Zoom as well, so just raise your hand on Zoom and we'll try to alternate back and forth between the, the room and the Zoom. Sir, go ahead. My name is Ray Greco. You can just pull the, um, there you go. My name is Ray Greco. I live at 3165 Nicolay Drive. I've been there since 2003. And I'm here, I guess, on item number four, the flooding along Nicolay Drive which has occurred initially, our first incident was in 2006. This has been a problem for 16 years that we've brought to the attention of our local representatives and both the city and the county highway departments. Um, after 2006, we've had some sporadic flooding. We've gone through maybe a year, a drought year where we didn't have any. We've had years where we have. It's really picked up in the last five years. We've had anywhere from one to three flooding incidents each year, including this year with a an almost flood on Saturday. We were within about five minutes of, if the rain continued, we'd have had another flood. We presented video to our older woman we hope to show that will show the, the extent of the flooding and how it affects the properties. We have basements that flood that cause us to, of course, repair our basements periodically as these floods occur, as well as having to clean up our yards from all the debris that gets washed down from the escarpment over Nicolay Drive and into our yards. We have to clean up rock gravel, mulch, decorative stone, every time this happens, over and over again. Um, along with the flooding and the damage to our property and the cost it incurs for us to repair our property and the labor it takes just to fix it, it's also a safety hazard driving on that road. As these floods occur, people drive by like nothing's happening and you can see them hydroplaning and it won't take long before one of these cars hydroplanes goes into the ditch and flips or shoots down one of our driveways into one of our houses. So it's a problem for us, a big problem for us that costs us a lot of money, a lot of property value, and it's a safety issue for people that drive through the, through the neighborhood. Um, I, I think that's pretty much 
what I had to say, I've got some other neighbors that are going to bring it up, but it's been 16 years, and it looks like now we finally have a solution. It's not what we see as a, a major project. It's a pretty simple pipe under the road to the bay to relieve uh, the water flooding. It's not a detailed, complex infrastructure solution. It seems like, a, to us, kind of like a no-brainer. Um, thank you. Thanks, sir, for your testimony. Any questions for a resident? Seeing none. Thanks a lot. Hello, my name is Jamie Zahn. I live at 3177 Nicolay Drive. Um, I want to raise neighbors. Um, I've lived there for 42 years, and prior to that, I grew up at uh, 3153 Nicolay Drive, which is just a few houses down, and that house is also affected by this flood. Before the year 2006, I've never seen that water come over the road, but after 2000, starting in 2006, it's becoming pretty regular, like Ray says. Um, I am worried about the safety factor, especially this last one happened uh, at night. So nobody could see that the water was coming over the road. And I don't mean it's coming over a couple inches. It's coming over four to six inches at, when it's coming over. And sooner or later, somebody's going to, cars are going to meet and something's going to happen. So it's a big safety factor there. Um, Ray hit up about it. Um, it's just happening more and more all the time, sometimes up to three times a year. And uh, it's not cheap fixing everything back up after it gets done. It's not just the water that gets in your house, but it's all the mud. Oh, that, get, that gets inside also, all the basements, the garages. Um, my garage, uh, the water level was almost 14 inches high. That's how high the water level was coming over the road and coming down and splitting apart. So um, I just think something has to be done about this um, sooner or later. So that's all I have to say. Thank Thanks you. for your testimony. Questions? All right, thank you. And just so folks know, that this item is the only one that actually has a resolution attached to it tonight. So if it is approved, it will be dispensed with and approved and won't need future approval, um, which is the case for the rest of the items. We can play some video games. <laughs> and, um, John Kelly, 3131 Nicolet. And we moved into that home in November, all excited about our new home, nice finished basement. And the episode in March, where the water did definitely come over the road, um, we now have our walls taken out, floors out, and we're really afraid to uh, do anything in our in half of our house. And um, on Saturday, in that rain, um, I came came home by accident and a day early from vacation. When when the flood was in March. Um, when we were coming home from Florida, our son called. He just got home from work, and he goes, "Keep going. I'm just gonna keep, unmute this." He, he and he goes, "Dad, there's, there's there's three inches of water in the driveway." And I go, uh "Oh, go downstairs." And there was six inches of water in the basement. And we came home from our our, our summer vacation a day early, to, and we found that, that that rain. And in talking to one of the neighbors, by the, there's these big grates that that keep debris going from um, into the, uh, the the drainage system. And in the five minutes that we sat there, um, the the water came up that that grate um, six inches in, in five minutes. And look, there were like three spots coming down the hill. There's 85 acres that flow basically through this small section of Nicolay. And, and, and they're coming down in, in streams like you're going through Baird's Creek in the spring. And it's like, wow, what is going on here? What, you know, what, uh, you know, somehow this has to get remedied. It, it is, it's, it's, it's been going on for too long. And it sounds like there's a good funding opportunity. And it sounds like there's a solution that has been got the initial engineering done. And um, it's time, it's time, you know, in the county meeting a couple of months ago, it was um, the gentleman's number one priority to get done and be done with it. And, you know, hopefully you guys can help us get that done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Questions? <coughs> All right. I'm Lisa Kosmoski. I live at 3283 Nicolay Drive. And my property is the one north of the former's eagle nest. And if many of you 
are familiar with that area, they did put in a drainage ditch um, to alleviate flooding for probably 10 to 12 people, you know, south of or north of me. And so I guess I'm here as a neighbor, you know, caring about other neighbors, but also I want to let you know that that did solve that issue for those neighbors to the north. So it sounds like this is a, a reasonable solution that still needs the additional funding um, to help take care of this property damage, you know, for other neighbors as well. But I thought I'd at least say that was a worthwhile investment, you know, on just south of my property on the Eagle's Nest. So it sounds like it needs a little more work, you know, as we go down, you know, closer to Green Bay. Um, but again, I'm just asking that you fund this project. Thank you. Thanks. Questions? Hello, my name is Maura Callen. I live at 3173 Nicolay Drive. We have lived at that residence since December of 2014, and since that time we have experienced flooding every year. So much so that it's created almost $50,000 worth of damage, and I sit in the same exact camp of not so sure I'm going to invest in continuing to maintain the property to that with knowing that it continues to come in. We did buy the the property um, to continue to overhaul and invest in um, and truly make Green Bay what we all want it to be um, and to have a Bayfront home was truly one of my my dreams I was more concerned about having flooding of the Bay and that was the majority of the questions that I asked when purchasing the home was not anticipating the amount of water coming over Nicolay Drive um, so I do ask we have four young children who live at our house and toys being washed away, the amount of mud that has to be cleaned up, the amount of toys that have to be thrown out every summer due to this issue as well. So I ask that you invest in this. Um, completely agree. It's been amazing to see the homes um, just north um, where that drainage ditch was put in of just the sense of relief that they have that they um, every time it floods. We have ring doorbells. We have water sensors. We have all of those types of things that put us on high alert. This past Saturday, we were in um, Mackinac Island. So as soon as you see all that water coming up, we're very concerned about our residents and even being able to be there to protect what we can. Um, if you drive past our house currently, we leave sandbags out in front of our home all year long. Um, so just in terms of giving a safety net to our children, that they're their home will be protected um, for the little that the sandpicks do. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marty Williams. I live at 3125 Nicolay Drive. And, oh, it is being on Zoom. Is Dan there? Okay. Um, I've been there for two years. And I can't. I kind of surprised that I wasn't, you know, told about any of this water before. I wonder what the people before me did with this water, because it comes whenever it rains. You get more than a little bit of rain. It comes in, fills my driveway. And when we had that big rain uh, last year, I ended up creating a little ditch around the side of my house. Unfortunately, it, it follows the path of least resistance. Went down there, but it washes out the side of the dirt along the side of my house. And if, if we don't do something, I'd figure something else how to, to solve that. But for now, that's kind of my temporary solution is I've got this little path of least resistance and I've also got a, 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 a pool cover pump that you put on your top of your swimming pool to drain the water off. I have that sitting in my yard with a hose going down around the side of my house uh, towards the bay. So fortunately, I have not had um, much of any water in my, my basin, but I've seen the damage in my neighbors and talking, talking to them and I'm one of the neighbors, myself and the neighbors of the South, who have uh, offered our property to have the pipe come between our yards. And I believe he might be on Zoom as well as my neighbor across the street who has a lot more information to, to share about kind of things that have been going on. So I've been, I've been there a couple of years and I'm just surprised that, uh, I wonder what people before me did with this water and I, it really, you know, hope we can come up with this uh, some sort of solution uh, more long term for this so myself and our neighbors don't have to worry about uh, the, the flooding thank you thanks sir somebody on zoom all right we do have somebody on zoom uh, ms cooper would like to speak 
just unmute yourself, state your name, and begin speaking. Uh, Bernie Cardowan and I were asked to join the meeting today to speak on Station 3 for the Green Bay Metro Fire Department. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, my audio is a little quiet. I apologize. That's right. Go ahead if you have comments to offer. Okay. Um, we had, uh, Ryan had reached out to uh, Bernie and I to speak about Station 3 since we um, have both worked there quite a bit. Uh, and Council had been considering the condition of the station and doing a survey. Um, and I'm just here to, to relay any information you guys would like to know about the station and my experience there. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Cooper? Alder Grant. Um, can you just speak a little bit about the, you know, restroom facilities and sleeping facilities for you? Sure. Um, the the layout of the station it's a it's a tremendous old building and it's got a lot of character. But because of its age, um, the way <laughs> the way it's laid out for accessibility is a little funky. Um, so dorm rooms are up on the second floor. It's a very large communal dorm. Uh, dividers kind of go up about chest height um, and the only facilities as uh, specifically as a female firefighter for me to use as a locker or a restroom are on the first floor right off the kitchen um, and that space in addition to being a, uh, a female restroom is also kitchen storage and overflow um, for various supplies kitchen wares and stuff like that so it makes it a a little bit congested um, and a little bit uh, inaccessible at times without trying to impede upon station activities, which might be cooking or cleaning or anything like that. So it's a little, it's a little bit funky. <laughs> Lots of character, but uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit dated. Any other questions? I'll just I'll add, add in, um, and I'm Bernie Carwarden. Um, currently working there at station three uh, just to follow up with what Sarah said you hey, know the uh, Bernie the if you could sir if you could just state your address for us pardon if you could just state your address for us as well before you absolutely 3378 Celine way C-E-L-E B-L-I-N-E way in Green Bay perfect go ahead so yeah, I just wanted to kind of follow up with what, what Sarah had said. Um, I've been there for the last three years and, you know, I, I kind of, you know, it's 85 plus year old station. Um, I kind of think of it myself as a car that you have that has like 200,000 miles on it and you keep trying to get those extra couple months out of it all the time. You know, I, you know, as far as living conditions that are there, um, you know, every time it rains, the basement floods, um, you know, the last few months we've been getting up in the morning, uh, make, you know, get something for breakfast, you know, like toast or something, uh, make something, you know, after a long night and we find ants in our, in our bread. Uh, you know, so it's getting worse and worse and worse where eventually, you know, I hope that in the very near future that we can do something to, to, uh, alleviate this. Yeah. The, the station in addition, uh, the apparatus floor is, is sinking. Um, you can noticeably watch the floor flex when we back our apparatus. Um, I, I know the concrete has reinforcement in it, um, but it's it's noticeable. There are cracks forming in the walls, um, and not just the outer walls for the at bay, but if you go into the internal portions of the station where um, we have main walls separating the kitchen, offices, and stairwell, um, there's some some pretty massive cracking in that concrete. It's it's definitely showing its its age, and I think its location. It's it's definitely soft ground around that station. Okay. Any additional questions, Alderac? 
uh, and it's for either one of the, the firefighters. Um, can you tell us more about the the door sizes and uh, you know the retrofitting of the engines and trying to back into that small space, please? So as as the fire service has progressed, obviously our our equipment has gotten larger. Um, it's we're very limited with the apparatus that we currently have that will fit into that station. If engine three is in for repair, we are, I think, down to one or two engines outside of it that will fit into that station. So if we lose any one of our small spares, um, we run the risk of not necessarily being able to place the apparatus in a secure location because of the size of that station. Thank other, you. Any other questions? All direct or uh, grant rather? Um, can you speak a little bit about during COVID when you were treating or helping uh, residents with COVID? Did you feel that when you got back to the firehouse that there was proper uh, space uh, to not spread COVID amongst yourselves? Um, well, I, I can speak on that. I mean, I think, you know, it's a, it's a, a station that has many, many rooms. Um, you know, the kitchen is not open like the newer stations would be. And obviously, like Sarah had said, the dorms are, are, are not small, but they're very close quarters. Um, I think, you know, it by okay, you know, it's livable. Um, we would have had more space, absolutely. I would agree with that completely. Um, it's a quirky little station. Uh, it's been kind of retrofitted and modified uh, as the years have gone by to accommodate extra staffing, the the type of hours we work, and uh, it's it's definitely a little close upstairs. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, yeah, the um, I know that there's a procedure where uh, when you come back to be able to uh, take off the um, clothing equipment that you have and um, separate it. I don't know how to explain it, so maybe you could explain that. <laughs> you mean like after a fire when we have to, to decon? Yes. Do you have the so, facilities for um, that? So that, that station uh, would definitely be limited. I think uh, restrooms restroom um, and while we do a pretty rapid job of deconning and cleaning ourselves uh, it's definitely a little bit more of a process uh, with limited showering facilities yeah, I, I would agree with Sarah it's uh, you know it's not like um, the greatest setup in the world but uh, you know we our most important thing is we want to get these carcinogens off of our skin to protect our firefighters from cancer in the future. So this, as soon as we can get that stuff off of our skin in the shower, um, that's really important. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you both for your testimony and your service. On to somebody in the room. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having us and thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thank you guys very much. Smith, 1525 Smith Street in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I'd like to address uh, item number 20. Um, I've lived at 1525 Smith Street, which is right directly next door to um, FAR LIN Park um, since April of 2010. And within a month or two of, of, of moving there, um, I immediately noticed a issue with people parking in front of my driveway and others and then also parking in the dead end blocking the uh, five, 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 fire hydrant constantly in the summer um, basically from May through end of August, September 
um, it's basically a day, uh, a issue that takes place er every day. Um, th the only fix to this issue because of the of the placement of the playground and splash pad some 20 odd years ago would be to relocate um, those two um, things um, next to the Farland Park parking lot, which is off of uh, East, 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 East Ben Avenue. Um, um, and that would basically address all of the concerns because everybody going t to use the park uh, would have to park there instead of parking right by my house. And um, so um, I, I, I think the expenditure of the, I believe it's $650,000 for, for the um, entire project would be a well used um, um, would be well used um, and that would also allow the Green Bay Police to much more easily patrol that area because of all of the crime that also takes place at night um, at, at, at the park um, but I believe that's all I have on, on okay. this issue. Thank you, sir. Thank any, you, guys. Any questions for Mr. Smith? All right, thank you. And then uh, we're going back to Zoom, Mr. Toll. our community for tourism. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to address the council. Uh, I was exposed to COVID, so uh, as much as I would like to be there, and, um, we're doing the um, hybrid thing tonight. I uh, also want to thank Alder Johnson uh, for helping us bring this forward. Um, as I know, everyone's aware the tourism industry was hit particularly hard. Uh, by COVID, and that certainly was the case in the Green Bay area. Um, while the leisure business is uh, back and uh, quite strong, business travel is still missing and, um, and something we're working on trying to bring back. Uh, conventions are happening again, and attendance is starting to improve. Uh, attendance was way off from what uh, would typically be the case. So uh, a convention of 750 might have 400 people that attended. So uh, that business side is, is what's still missing in the industry. Uh, a lot of people have said, <clears throat> what are you doing up? It's not really possible to make up business that was lost two years ago. Um, that's pretty gone. Uh, all you can do is work toward trying to fill the calendars in the future years. Uh, it be hard uh, in 2020 to get groups to rebook at the convention center rather than just all together. But uh, in a number of cases, uh, that was not possible because they were booked in future years uh, in other communities. Um, Discover is also working, as you uh, likely know, on building our community's first visitor center. Uh, crazy that a city this size has never had a visitor center to engage with visitors when they're in our community. And um, our goal there will be to extend a visitor stay, keep them here longer, uh, which of course means they spend more uh, while they're here and pay more taxes. Uh, we wanna expand their spend into more areas of our city and also encourage them to come back. A new thing that visitor centers uh, are taking responsibility for and in working with chambers is to also recruit workforce. 
Uh, every visitor is a possible resident or employee at one of our businesses. So it's a place that people can go to learn about the community and also potentially decide to become a, a part of our community. Uh, during COVID, of course, uh, we had to stop fundraising and uh, it came pretty much to a screeching halt. Uh, however, none of the costs stopped going up. Uh, they continued to rise and uh, put us in a position where we were close to having what we needed to being under uh, again. And the location for the visitor center is right uh, near 41 in Lombardi Avenue. That's where a lot of visitors uh, enter our community just because Lambeau Field is on uh, Lombardi Avenue. It must be where you, um, you come into the community. It's really a perfect location for a building like this. Uh, I know there's some people that have said uh, we should have uh, considered downtown, but honestly, the reason this is such a great location um, is actually a personal story for me as well. Uh, when people come into the community, they often go to Lambeau Field, and we know a lot of times people leave after they've done that, that info. Uh, I grew up in Wisconsin, but lived in Minnesota for uh, about 16 years. We came to a game every single fall, a uh, Packer game, uh, being huge Packer fans. When I looked into relocating to Green Bay to take this job, I didn't know where the downtown was from the stadium. And that is the case for a lot of people. Uh, a lot of the questions we get asked at training camp uh, revolve around where is the downtown and what's there to do if I go down there. And uh, so putting this uh, at 41 in Lombardi is an excellent spot and uh, will definitely benefit uh, the downtown area and the city of Green Bay as well as the entire region. Um, Okay, thank, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Any questions for Mr. Toll? Alder Johnson, then Alder Galvin. Thank you, Brad, for uh, speaking to us today. One of the things, um, if you could maybe just touch on a little bit, because obviously the KI Convention Center is a city-owned or RDA-owned facility. Could you speak a little bit to what your office and staff does to help attract uh, conventions to uh, lease that facility and, of course, spend time downtown? Sure. Uh, in a typical year, our sales staff goes to about 10 to 12 uh, conventions. They're considered marketplaces where you meet face to face with meeting planners. Uh, we go to those conventions to sell the meeting planner on Green Bay as a destination, uh, but primarily on the KI Convention Center as a facility for their convention, as well as the hotel package that we have downtown. Uh, that's where we get all of our new leads from. And typically the KI staff or the Hyatt staff do not go to those. They go to maybe one in Chicago with us. Uh, but that is primarily our responsibility to go find the bigger conventions, the city uh, and try to bring them into our community. We send the lead them to the KI staff uh, and work with them to try and book the business. So we play a huge role in bringing really those and any major event uh, into the area. We go to all the sales shows uh, for those kinds of uh, meeting planners to find those planners. Thanks, sir. Uh, Alder Gell? Thank you. Mr. Toll, are you talking about item 13? Yes. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Toll, for the testimony and the work. Uh, Alder Eck? Is it 13 or 14? Um, okay. You know what? On the, it's 7-2-214, so it's, um, but yeah. Um, I do have a question. Is this a project that you are doing in collaboration with the county as well? Uh, the county has been supportive of the project. Uh, they see the value of it. Uh, we also uh, have gotten support from the Oneida Nation. Uh, they've been a supporter actually from the beginning. Uh, we've also received support from the state of Wisconsin. And uh, we're also talking to the village of Ashwaubenon. Okay, and we have uh, over $2 million of private support as well from businesses and individual donors. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Toll. And with that, we're back to the room. Hi, my name is Patrick Stoa from 132 Burgundy Court. This is my wife, Stephanie. Um, and we're here because of, of a problem that's happened. Uh, every, every rainfall, what happens to us is the city has an area of about 200 houses. And, and I should say, this is project number 24 on the list. The city has an area of about 200 houses, including about two and a half miles worth of roads servicing those houses. And all of that stormwater goes through the backyards of myself and my neighbors. And so this has caused quite a bit of erosion. Um, now what's interesting is that it all comes out of one big culvert and the first two properties out of the eight properties affected actually have erosion control installed. I don't know exactly how long, but on the, um, the, the air maps that you can look at on GIS, that's been there since at least 2000. So 22 years, the first two properties. And those properties have very well controlled erosion. After that, it just goes downhill though. We're actually on property number four of that. And this is Steph right here at the bottom of, of the, the ditch. It's about 25 feet deep at that point. And you come up to the edge and it's just, it's down. So every year this is eroding away farther and farther. Um, the second picture, she's downstream in the neighbor's ditch. And that's about 25 or maybe about 30 feet down. That's the fifth property. It just gets deeper and wider all the way down to the eighth property. So um, from our perspective, we believe that the city already knows this is a problem because there actually was erosion control, control installed on the first two properties. And also there are plans that were drafted about a dozen years ago, detailed plans and studies fixing the problem. They weren't implemented at the time, but those are the plans that we want to bring forward again and, and proceed with. So um, that that's, I guess that's our story. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Alder Hutchison? Um, yeah, this, uh, they're in my district and I had the pleasure when I was campaigning to be able to be invited in their backyard to see what was going on. And being a civil engineer, erosion is kind of my, uh, what I did. Couldn't believe, I mean, it's pretty uh, intense. And this ditch goes in under a culvert under a railroad into Barrett's Creek and I think we there's someone here from Barrett's Creek as well but I just wanted to thank you for presenting that that was well done great thank you thanks Alder, Alder Galvin uh, how long have you lived in your home uh, coming up in two years and how old is your house uh, 2002 2002 okay when, when you bought your home, were you aware of this erosion issue? Uh, it was a nice day, so clearly I could see that there was erosion, but I didn't see the raging river that happens when the storms come through. There okay. was a, a trickle on that day. All right, thank you. Yep. Any other comments or questions? All right, thank you both for being here. And I think we have maybe one, well, we got a couple on Zoom. Uh, oh. Five is kind of oh, okay, um, sure, we can do that. Okay, I'll jump in quick. Holly Baseman, uh, 1270 Main Street, and I'll speak to 24 and 25 as the executive director at the Baird Creek Preservation Foundation. Um, number 25 is about another issue that we're seeing. Um, both of these we're seeing happening because of stormwater runoff that just hasn't been allocated correctly as to where it should go. And so what we're seeing in Baird Creek is a major erosion issue from both of these different stormwater um, management issues. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, not only are we seeing erosion, but we're also seeing the load of what's coming from those two areas landing in Baird Creek itself, which obviously is affecting water quality. And then it's also putting more of a load of the water coming from those areas um, that's going through Baird Creek and then into the East River. So just a couple of issues that we're seeing with that so um, we too would like to see some kind of fix um, go on those and then um, just quickly I'm going to jump to 47 which is totally unrelated 
Um, but I do want to speak up to um, that is about the snow machines uh, for Baird Creek itself. And just want to put in a word from the foundation that we're highly supportive of anything that just makes our community a great place to live, work, and play. Um, and we see this as just a great addition to Triangle Hill and the foundation is extremely supportive of just even helping from a fundraising standpoint too to make that happen, so. Great, thanks for your testimony. Any questions from council? All right, thanks a lot. And then like I said, I think we have a couple people waiting in Zoom. Um, so if Mr. Nielsen would like to unmute himself and state his address, that'd be great. Um, we're discussing in regards to the flooding on Nicolay Drive. Our address is 3116 Nicolay Drive. Uh, we've been here 15 years. We're on the east side of Nicolay. And um, I just want to talk a little bit about the flooding coming through here. I've been working this for about four years, trying to see what I can do. Our, our property, our driveway is collapsing. We've lost about four or five feet of our driveway passage for the culvert that goes through underneath lost six fruit trees and we've got one part of our property that is now the retention pond for the flooding coming down um, I've been trying to do a little experiment passing information along with uh, Paul who's leading this project uh, I had a discussion with Nick yesterday he's uh, sending he's been talking to me as well uh, I put up a little I filled my property in the back and put a, a berm at the level of where my property is, trying to control the water coming down, and it's worked. Um, it's worked for a while. The last two big rains, it worked, but this last one was big enough that it finally washed out, about 10 to 15 yards of fill, but it does control the water coming down. If this pipe can get put in, the culvert running direct to the bay, and I get this filled here and can monitor how much water is coming through the drainage on my property, I think what that's going to do is it's going to help my property. I can replant my fruit trees and help all the neighbors across the road. I think that's the bottom line and why we need to get this project passed through and get funding. Great. Thank you, sir. Any questions from council? All right. Thanks again for the testimony. Thank you. Back to testimony from the room here. Okay, I'm speaking to item number 14. I want to say hello to the City Council here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Alderman Brian Johnson, for uh, addressing this and proposing these dollars. My name is Terrell Knight. I'm the Executive Director of uh, an organization, uh, Downtown Green Bay, called the Shipyard District, Inc. Um, we're an organization that is new, about a year and a half old, and uh, what we'd like to do is help the City of Green Bay to oversee uh, the community and commercial development of the business area and potentially residential area south of Mason Street on the west side of Green Bay uh, in between Ashland Avenue and the Fox River. Right now we're working with the City of Green Bay uh, in discussion um, on how best to do that. And um, so I'm here talking about the proposal that Alderman Johnson made for $25,000 contingent on a resolution being signed uh, between us and the City of Green Bay that would see us uh, legally uh, recognized as um, a steward of that area. Um, let me pull up some of my notes here. Uh, I, I guess I want to talk a little bit about SDI, uh, the Shipyard District Inc., the nonprofit organization I'm here to represent, so you understand where we're coming from and why we're asking for these dollars. Uh, the Shipyard District Inc. is a group that is certified as a 501c3 tax exempt organization with the IRS. Um, we are inspired by the work that on Broadway Inc. and Downtown Green Bay Inc., Military Avenue Business Association, and a number of other great organizations across the greater Green Bay area are doing for their area, uh, their businesses, and uh, in helping to promote, revitalize, create a cleaner and safer area that invites people down to that area spending dollars. Uh, our organization is made up of 100% business and commercial property owners in the area. Um, and, and so we, we definitely have a vision and we're, uh, you know, very committed to our area uh, trying to bring that up to speed and match a lot of the different character 
and revitalization efforts that the other uh, neighboring organizations in our downtown have done and continue to do uh, with help from the city. Uh, like I said, our boundaries are from Mason Street at the north, which butts up against the um, Broadway district, uh, to Ashland Avenue on the west, the Fox River on the east, all the way down to uh, what we hope to be the city limits of the city of Green Bay down at Georgia Pacific. That means that we are sandwiched in between the Broadway district and the Legends district, an area of the city of Green Bay, right up by the stadium. So, you know, what we have to offer and, and what we can develop together uh, with this kind of funding and future opportunities is the ability for us to connect the stadium district and all of the dollars that are spent there on a regular basis. I don't have to tell you how big the stadium is to Green Bay. Um, and connect that all the way down to the downtown area. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, I think it's a necessity that this area is developed and we'd love to take a look at doing that with you. Uh, the $25,000 uh, that are being proposed by Elder Johnson are contingent on us working with the city on a long-term funding solution similar to OBI or DTGBI. We're looking at a number of options. And, uh, and that conversation is ongoing. But I want to talk a little bit about some other things that this money can do uh, in the meantime, uh, particularly things that are proposed, I think, uh, in the item uh, or, or in the proposal. And, and that's that a number of these dollars go toward uh, revitalizing the area in a visual way that invites people down to this area and, and helps people to feel safe and, uh, and clean in this area. Uh, in order to spend dollars at these businesses. Now, we do that with a couple of different ways that you're probably familiar with events, uh, whether they're a series or a single event, maybe a festival, uh, in order to draw people down and spend money at businesses. Uh, there are public amenities like banners that we could install that would give people a sense of, uh, of belonging, but also a sense that this is an official area of the city that's watched over and, uh, and really create the feel that this is an official destination. Uh, street furniture like benches and recycling and rubbish receptacles would help to create a safer area that, uh, you know, right now we don't have the density in that area, but what would this, what would this do? This would keep people down here um, and, uh, and make sure that people feel comfortable uh, lingering around and, and creating a sense of community. Bike racks without the density that the other areas of the downtown have, uh, this is a really bikeable opportunity. So having bike racks and uh, a number of different areas uh, in the public right-of-way, uh, improvements to it that allow for this area to be traversed by people on their bike creates a healthier environment for people um, to come down here and uh, invites a lot of family activities. Public artworks like sculptures and murals are certainly on our docket. Uh, investing in the area, creating something vibrant um, like Steve Grenier and Neil Stick Schulte's shirts there. Uh, we love a vibrant workplace for a lot of these people. and. Uh, and obviously I do too, so we're no stranger to vibrancy. Uh, we would love to install those things down in this area. Uh, maybe these dollars help us to get started on that track. Uh, there are a lot of really successful uh, opportunities throughout the downtown that we've seen happen. We would love to exercise and execute those same uh, certain activities in order to develop this area. These people have invested a lot in this community, and uh, we'd love for the city to come on board and help us out with that. So thank you for your time. Thanks for the Thanks. testimony. Any questions for Mr. Knight? All right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I think we have yeah. uh, Jay Salmon. Jay Salmon on the Zoom. And just unmute yourself and state your name and address for us. Oh, yeah. We're here. Can you, can you hear us? Yep. We can hear you. Go ahead. Hi. Okay. Um, we are here to talk about issue number four. The Nicolay Drive. The pipe for Nicolay Drive. Yep, go ahead. Um, so we are very well aware of the issues that all of our neighbors are having. Um, and we definitely want to be able to help um, in any way that we can. Um, we are 3119 Nicolay, so we are the house that the pipe will be going into with our neighbor, so in between our house and our neighbor's house, um, just to be clear of where we kind of stand. Um, and, um, you know, we want to help the community. We've heard all the stories about people's flooding. Um, we are lucky enough that we don't have any flooding in our basement. Our sump pump um, did go off a few times in the last storm, but we have not had any storm damage or flooding in our house specifically. Um, and our concerns are that 
you know, with this pipe now pushing all of this water to our house or closer to our house, you know, that could we possibly end up having some of these problems? Um, you know, we worry about that affecting us. We're also concerned about the size of this pipe. We have two small kids. Um, I do understand that it will be um, a, a bracket on the front of it or a grate, but kids are curious. And the other day when it was really raining outside, the pipe that's just down the road from us, a couple doors down, I mean, that thing was gushing water. Um, and obviously safety is a huge concern for us with small kids already living on the water. And so having something like that does kind of make us just a little bit nervous. Um, you know, our other concern is we do have some landscaping. We just poured concrete in our back for a hot tub that we have. You know, we're just concerned about what that looks like as far as those things go for us. Um, is the integrity of our break wall uh, and a lot of our own money um, fixing our break wall when it fell and the city was nowhere to be found to help us with that issue. So, you know, they told us when they put the riprap in, if your neighbor, the more neighbors subsequent to you that have the riprap and the more farther down, the more integrity that your wall has. Um, and now kind of tearing our break wall apart to put this pipe in just has us a little concern that we'll lose the integrity in our break wall after we spent thousands of dollars, you know, putting it in um, and protecting our, our land too, because, you know, we lost almost like six feet of frontage when the big storms came in and tore our break wall down. So uh, we want to be a team player. We want to help, but we definitely have some concerns about safety and our property as well. I guess we just want to make sure that we've looked at all other potential um, solutions before going ahead with this one uh, more than anything. Okay, great. Well, appreciate the testimony and uh, the questions offered. Was just curious if Director Grenier, if you wanted to weigh in at all on any of those concerns. Absolutely. Uh, in answer to the last question, have we exhausted all other possibilities? I can tell you with unqualified, the answer to that is yes. Uh, relative to concerns on integrity of the break wall, obviously anything that the county would disturb uh, during construction, they would restore. The pipe is intended to be underground, so visually there should be no impact once the, uh, once the yard has been restored and the grass comes back up. Um, you know, within several months of, of the actual construction, there should be no visible evidence except seeing the pipe down at the discharge end. Uh, it is normal engineering practice to put controls on the ends of the pipe to limit what can and cannot get in or out of that, that pipe, you know, so debris, trash, screens, that kind of thing. Um, obviously, during a rainstorm, we would not encourage people to be outside in near proximity uh, to the ditches or where any of the water's flowing. Uh, oh. Again, getting back to the, the integrity of the, of the break wall, the intent there would be at the discharge end of the pipe at the bay, there's typically a concrete end wall section that goes uh, on the end of the pipe. So in urbanized areas uh, or alongside of driveways, you often see them, they're sloped concrete or, or prefabricated metal uh, if it's a metal, metal culvert. Uh, here it'll probably be more of a cast in place one or it could be a combination of a precast concrete with some cast in place concrete around it and that'll help tie the natural stone of the break wall to the concrete of the uh, of the end wall ties that all together so the stone doesn't move and then it becomes an integral part of the of, of the break wall so um, would strongly encourage the, uh, the folks to reach out uh, both to myself and to Paul Fontecchio who's the uh, director of Brown County Public Works who's heading uh, this project up uh, to make sure that those concerns are being addressed. But I can tell you, you know, it, it's one thing for me to say something tonight, quite something else for me to meet with, uh, with the folks uh, independently. But everything that they've brought up are things that we have considered already, yes. Okay, thank you, Director Grenier. Uh, okay, I guess I'm just, that's just something that's being brought up just because, you know, we did hear some of our neighbors express at one point, like, we can't have this pipeline through our, our our road or our lawn because uh, our neighbor has small kids. And, you know, it's just like, well, 
So do we. So I just am hoping that, you know, every, every option was looked at and it's not just like, I, I guess we didn't understand the capacity that this pipe was gonna be bringing um, to our property. And since we've kind of learned a little bit more of what it means, we're just concerned about those specific things. So like we said, we want to be team players and help our neighbors. And I can't imagine all the flooding that happens around us, but just things that need to be addressed, I think so. Okay, great. Well, thanks for your testimony. Any questions from council? All right, thank you both. Thank back, you. Back to the room. Hello, uh, my name is Chelsea Koken. I live at 1785 Chapel Rue, which is in De Pere. Um, I'd like to talk about two items. I'll keep it short, but item number one, uh, 11, sorry, the Chris Kindle market. So quick overview on that. I, it's kind of explained in there, but essentially this is an event and an event series that we intend to host. Um, it would attract regionally. What it is, it's, it's, it's a holiday themed market typically after those German themed wares, holiday items, programming, small vendors. Um, and the request for funding is for the construction of these seasonal huts. So our plan is for a six week event in the heart of the Broadway district at the Red Sculpture Park, um, which is at 200 North Broadway. So with 12 to 15 huts, we're looking at you know cost estimate of upwards of $115,000. So this request for funding is to be put towards that these huts then would be taken down seasonally and stored. Um, but the event and the intent for the draw is you're getting people into the heart of the district. They're shopping within those vendors, but they're also spilling over into the district. And the loss of the events that on Broadway had through COVID and the vendors that saw the impact and also the small businesses. You get an event like this that brings in those regional people. They're spending further time in the district, downtown community as a whole. This is something where you see weekend visits, you see people coming hundreds of miles. Uh, these Chris Kindle markets are done throughout the world. Um, locally, there's none. Regionally, there are a few. But this is something that we feel would be a great impact on the Broadway district and really a nice touch in the winter months, uh, which is why we're looking for a nice, a nice influx in the cost, but then seeing more investment through sponsorships on Broadway would take on the burden of the marketing, the promotion, the programming, um, but the initial construction for the huts is what we're requesting the funding for. Great. Question, Alderic? Uh Yes, so would this be, do I need to lean in? <laughs> for the entire um, winter, like, or up until Christmas, what, what is the length of time for this? Yes, thank you. So our holiday programming kicks off with the lighting ceremony, which has always been uh, that Friday, mid-November. So it's Friday, November 18th, and we would run a Friday evening and a Saturday during the day in alignment with those small businesses that have their hours open during that time in the Broadway district and encouraging foot traffic at those times and then ending into the Christmas Eve weekend. So it'd be six weekends, 12 event dates, um, regular programming, those 12 to 15 vendors in the space. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on, on this item? One question, um, was just curious if you've identified a potential partner for the construction of the huts or if you have an idea of who, who that might we be. We have a couple, we're working on a couple of cost estimates um, with partners and waiting for those to come in. Um, and I'm assuming once the numbers come in and request for funding maybe are approved and finding out final costs and the increased um, amount to be raised where the bids lie. Okay. Great. And then your second um, item? Second item is, so it's number 12, the artist residency. That's a project that we as an organization um, on Broadway, so I'm also the director of special projects with on Broadway. We as an organization have been exploring for years now. Uh, and at this time, you know, we're, the pieces are falling into place. We've done a site visit in the Broadway district. So there are a few blighted properties, but one in particular that we visited that we think would be a great space for this. So when you think of an artist residency, it's a space for artists uh, who can activate a space with their talents, but then there's also housing typically above or within the same space. So they're able to live in a space that is below market rate, 
Um, you know, typically artists have that lower income or more diverse income. And so it gives that opportunity, but the activation of the lower space really becomes a community draw as well. So you can do events, you can have galleries, programming, teaching, all of those items. So as we look to fund that, um, and particularly that building, you know, we've sorted out some costs on renovation for the building, and they're upwards of a million dollars. So this request for the 500000 would go towards that, and then on Broadway it would take on the fundraising and financing further. And that million dollar cost estimate, that's just on reserva ren renovations, excuse me, not the purchased price of the building. Um, you know, we're just, we're still in conversations on that building, but we think it would be a great space. It's right, again, kind of in that core of the Broadway district in the downtown area. We already have a lot of arts in that district and culture, so we have great connections with the artists in our community and beyond. You know, you create jobs here for artists that can travel in. They have a space to learn and grow, and, you know, maybe they're becoming residents then, or they're growing in the community. The teaching piece as well, you're bringing in the elements to grow the arts within this artist residency, and it's really just creating a further impact for the arts. Great. Any questions on this one? Yeah. Alder Story. Thanks, Chelsea, for coming in. Um, have you studied some other communities that have these residences in place, and could you describe a little of that, how successful they may have been? Sure. So there's residencies of different scale. Uh, we've gone locally, there is uh, one in Appleton called the Refuge for the Arts. It's an old church. Um, there's many more rooms, so a lot of times they have more transient artists. The, short, the stays are shorter, um, you know, maybe even a weekend at a time they're coming in for a show or an art gallery. Um, but what they have, again, is different activation spaces. You're seeing sculptures, painters, you're seeing performing arts and music. So they have the recording studio. They have the space where the artists have um, the materials that they need. It's kind of a bring what you need, leave what you don't, and it becomes this community where they're you know, kind of living with one another and living off of one another and kind of earning their keep through the, the way that they're continuing to sustain the property. So the property itself then continues to host events and gives back to the community with the talents brought in by the artist. So that is one. There are others um, in broader communities that we've seen as well. Um, but I'd say locally that's the greatest, you know, except for size, that's a, a great comparison to show what it does for the community. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thanks for your testimony. Thanks. My name is Jen Metcalf. I live at 2506 Newberry Avenue, and I am the assistant director of Downtown Green Bay Incorporated and Old Main Street Incorporated. Um, I'm here actually, so we're gonna jump across the river uh, into this district. I'm here to talk about um, number eight, number 15, and number 16. So I'll address number eight first, which is the funding of an urban planner position. Um, we are excited to be part of a proposal that we believe the, will provide our city a unique opportunity. Our organization, as you know, is 100% committed to the health and vibrancy of our downtown. We plan events, we support and recruit businesses, we promote residential, we focus on cleanliness, and we invest in the physical assets like street banners, planters, lighting, but most importantly, we tie these all together by having a vision and um, how to make sure that we keep downtown relevant, attractive, welcoming, and a destination. As an NFL city, we all know that we need to provide experiences beyond football, and we know that we, know that we can make a great economic impact um, by having a strong downtown. So we have seen this model work successfully in other cities with an urban planner on our staff. Um, there is an individual dedicated to making great things happen. The role would be able to utilize our organization's private donations, corporate sponsorships, and grant opportunities. They would work with the city departments to execute existing plans, and they would also help to create new plans that would be focused on the advancement and enhancement of all of our public spaces downtown. We've visited cities, we've all visited cities across the street um, and have been wowed um, or maybe even envious. Uh, we want to make sure that we create a downtown here that is unique and memorable. 
So as I understand it, these ARPA funds are here to assist our community in a rebound and recovery stage, and um, the allocation of these funds would help strengthen our organization's team. And by knowing that there is someone dedicated to downtown, this will potentially free up some city resources to focus on other, other areas of our community. You can trust downtown Green Bay. We will use this funding wisely to keep Green Bay on the map, to bring people downtown, to visit, to play, to eat, to work, and to live here. And all of this will have a great economic impact. So that is for number eight. Any questions on that one? And then number 15 and 16, I'm gonna kind of lump together. Um, as you know, the Fox River and the Bay of Green Bay are amazing assets to our community, ones that we often take for granted. Um, 14 years ago, city council um, invested in the creation of a city deck and the Fox River Trail. And since then, it has truly become a destination and something to be proud of. Our organization has been programming and activating that space since the beginning and will continue to do so, um, but we would like to give it some new life. When you travel to other cities, you notice public art, lighting, plantings, cool gathering spaces, um, and we need to make sure that our city deck continues to have those features. If we think about our own community um, and you see all the amazing things happening at the Titletown District, we wanna make sure that we keep downtown relevant as well. When we have full hotels on a game day weekend, we want those visitors to check out the things that we have along our riverfront. We also want our own residents to come downtown because they enjoy our own urban center. So our proposal is for asking some fund, for some funding for that city deck corridor. Um, some examples would be uh, a dynamic art piece in the tunnel underneath the Walnut Street Bridge. If you've walked or ridden your bike um, there recently, it could use a refresh. Uh, we'd like to add some decorative lighting some signage, some entrances, some wayfinding to help people find their way to the city deck. Um, the original light poles down there have um, a bracket system for speakers that has never, have never been installed. We would love to see if we can carry out that original plan. Um, and maybe our biggest would be to per put a permanent stage. Nothing big, but um, we spend thousands of dollars every year to rent stages for Fridays on the Fox and other music performances down there. So um, we would love to be able to have a small structure down there on the city deck. These are just some examples of projects that we would love to work with city staff on. So again, my understanding is that these funds are to, um, to help bring vitality and people downtown, and we believe that these projects will do that. Thank you for your consideration. Great. Thanks for the testimony. Any questions? Great. Thanks again. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Garrett Bader, 300 North Van Buren Street. Thanks for being here tonight. I'm here to speak to you on item number 27 on my list. This is the request for $230,000 in ARPA stormwater dollars towards construction of a retention pond in the East Town Mall parking lot. As many of you know, I've spent the better part of the last year and a half remaking and redeveloping that property and bringing some life back to it. Uh, what we'd like to try to do now is replumb part of the parking lots. It's about 50 acres, the East Town campus. When it was constructed in 1980, stormwater ponds were not required in any way. So during any type of rainfall event, especially heavy rainfall, you'll have that rain running immediately off that asphalt into the storm sewer system and occasionally helping to overwhelm it. Many are also aware of nearby flooding in some of the neighborhoods. And while there's no silver bullet for that or magic wand to make that all go away, efforts like this can help uh, reduce the impact and severity of some of those events. If the city will graciously sponsor the cost of the pond, we'll, we'll donate the land, take out some parking stalls, and put that facility in there that not only greens up the parking lot a little bit, but also really helps support the neighborhood around it. Um, there was a memo that accompanied the item. If you took a look at it, it gives a quick little breakdown of the amount of peak stormwater flows and total suspended solids, as they are calling, that are eliminated by doing something like this. Uh, finally, I believe in discussions of staff, there was maybe an item on whether this should be a standalone item, it's number 27, or maybe funneled under number 41. As I hope you know, I would graciously accept your support wherever those dollars would come from. Thank you. Great. Any questions for Mr. Bader? Yes, Mr. Morgan. As uh, you know, I'm a supporter of everything you do there. That's my district. Could you explain to some of the new alders that may not know you at all, your background, your education, and why you believe this might help? Well, local kid, civil engineering degree from Marquette, uh, master's degree from University of Florida, came back 12 years ago to make my hometown a little bit better. So 
I rode my bike down the east town as a kid. Didn't think about the parking lots or the stormwater back then, I can tell you that. <laughs> but I think about it now every time it rains. So another way of making that area, my neighborhood that I grew up in, a little bit better. Great. Alder, Alder Hutchison. <clears throat> Garrett, will uh, this uh, facility help the intersection of Maine and Mason? Um, I'm assuming it would, but do you know if it would or not during well, a rainfall uh, event? Like I was saying, it, it, I don't think there's any silver bullet to Maine and Mason, but flows that end up there come from upstream areas all around it. Right. So one could argue, I think, realistically, that small efforts like this can help that downstream impact. Okay. It won't hurt it. <laughs> I don't think it can do it any worse. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other questions? Great. Thanks, Thanks sir. again. Whoever's ready. Thank you. Um, my name is Noel Halverson. Uh, I'm the president of NeighborWorks Green Bay, a 40-year-old not-for-profit that's been serving Green Bay neighborhoods in partnership with the city um, and uh, solving housing challenges and, and strengthening our, our community. Um, I'd like to talk with you about items 38 and 40. Um, the uh, Community and Economic Development Department has made some proposals related to um, grants that could be leveraged on top of uh, some existing loan programs uh, that we administer for the city of Green Bay uh, at NeighborWorks. My address at, at home, I didn't give it to you, 2443 Deckner, um, and uh, the, the office is at 437 South Jackson. Um, the two programs I'd like to talk about, number 38, the HILP program, that's the Home Improvement Loan Program. That's something that uh, we took over administration of a couple of years ago and it provides a lot of um, kind of near emergency loans to existing homeowners in the city who've got uh, maintenance needs that, that need to be addressed um, and are, might be a challenge in terms of getting conventional financing. Um, and uh, and the, this proposal was to leverage that with some, some grant dollars that could be used for energy related improvements to the home. So you could think about windows, uh, furnaces, you know, a new roof, things that will improve that energy envelope and reduce the, the costs of heating and cooling those properties. Um, and, uh, and so the, 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 the program as envisioned would be um, to provide a grant up to $10,000 beyond one of these loans um, that's improving a home uh, for those energy related improvements. At the finance committee meeting, I think back in June, um, there was some conversation about maybe using it for uh, uh, flood prevention things as well, and, and uh, that's certainly fine uh, in terms of the administration of it. And, and so the, the handout I just gave you just shows that, um, uh, you know, if we were to put, say, a $7,500 grant into a number of these uh, projects, um, that $500,000 of, of ARPA funds proposed for the program would leverage, um, you know, $2.4 million of, of community investment um, or $3.89 for every dollar of ARPA additional money that was either borrowed uh, uh, um, or uh, invested by the homeowner um, for the purposes of you know, making that home better, which is an investment in our neighborhoods as well because you know, if those folks are going to sell that home, we want to make sure that we don't have to reinvest in, in these houses um, uh, more than we, than we should, and we can do that by providing regular and proper maintenance to them. Um, the other program... I'd like to talk about, and I also have a handout for those. <clears throat> Any questions on this? Well, sure. On this one, Mayor uh, Alder Johnson. Thank you, Noel, for the overview on that. Uh, just a quick question: uh, This is an existing program that that you manage right now. Where does the current funding come from, and and what is uh, the current status of that? Sure. So um, I think Cheryl. Uh, may be better suited to answer that in the broad sense. Those dollars that we're lending currently uh, are granted to the city by HUD, um, and they're both home funds and community development block grant funds that we're using for the program. Anything to add? No, I mean, I think 
think right now uh, there is a waiting list for this program. So at last time I checked, there was over 100 people in the queue for these rehab loans. So we, we generally run out of home funds every year for this program. But So is there an income qualifier? There is. You need to be below 80% of median income to qualify for the Home Improvement Loan Program. Okay. Based on household size. Elder Gallon, did you have? So you're saying there's 100 people on the waiting list. Um, we're looking at 2.4 million. Uh, max amount you give out would be 10,000, if I'm reading this correctly. So that's 240 homes that could be improved in this community. Um, well, it'd be $10,000 of of a of a grant of the $500,000 pot. So um, we hope that the city continues to administer this program for many years with those home and block grant funds that come into it. This would be just a one-time addition of a, of a grant that would go on top of that loan. The loan might be somebody might take a $35,000 loan to address a number of deficiencies of the property. This could be $10,000 on top of that to do, say, furnace and, 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 and roof or something like that. And are they paying this back as soon as they can or when the house is sold or? So the, the loan portion of these uh, is a deferred loan. Uh, so it is only paid back on the sale or if it ceases to be their primary residence. If somebody moves out of the house, then, then that, that loan is, is, is due. And, and how many homes are we taking care of currently in the last couple of years, do you think? Yeah, so um, we've done, uh, I think we've got a dozen in the pipeline this year so far and, and, uh, and it was um, you know, a transition year before that where it was part of the handoff from the city uh, planning department was doing this and then we took it over. So um, uh, we've got uh, the capacity to do probably 25 of these a year. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you. All right, the other one I handed out looks a lot the same. It's got a pie chart on it and some numbers on it. This is no, item number 40, the Great Being Home Program. This was uh, something that was discussed among, again, the uh, Community and Economic Development Department, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, and others as we were exploring um, ways to incentivize employers to get more involved in um, housing their employees. Uh, as you all know, um, you know, our community, our state, our country is for facing a housing crisis. There's a shortage of homes. Um, Green Bay has is, is got a tremendous uh, gap in that. A lot of our work as a community in, in regard to housing has been thinking about this challenge and how to you know, develop more units and, and, and get people into homes. And one of the things uh, that we look at is uh, we talk with employers who are concerned about being able to attract and retain employees um, because of the lack of housing. And, uh, and so the Great Being Home program was envisioned uh, to be a, a way to create a pool that could be in some additional grant funds to help uh, employees of Green Bay employers purchase homes inside the city of Green Bay and, and make, you know, make this their home. Um, and, uh, and that we would work also with um, uh, larger employers to get their matching funds for this program so that uh, we would have additional investment uh, by employers into a pool um, that would create additional homeowners in the city um, uh, for folks who are working here. And uh, uh, NeighborWorks Green Bay currently administers several uh, employer-assisted homeownership programs with some uh, major employers in the area. We'd like to get them to convert their programs maybe to this, to this program if this goes forward. Uh, and then work in partnership with the chamber and others to promote it uh, to get more folks investing in it um, and capitalizing uh, basically a, a, a grant and or loan pool um, that we can use to, to make housing more accessible to working families uh, here in Green Bay. And in this case, um, you know, looking at the model of a $10,000 grant uh, under this program to help somebody uh, purchase that home uh, and employees of larger employers would, would, would be able to receive $5,000 with a $5,000 match from their employer. Um, and, uh, and so I modeled this uh, looking at $7,500 as the grant amount. Um, and, uh, and this could help 100 working families here in the community um, with this. Now, if we launch the program, we could sustain it much longer because we could get the employers funding it uh, you know, down, down, down the road. Um, but in this case, a half a million dollars of ARPA funds would leverage $12.1 million 
uh, in total investment in home ownership in our community, um, that would mean that for every ARPA dollar, $24 of additional investment would be made in our community um, and would be a forum for us to talk more with employers about having a part to play in the housing of their workforce, uh, which is something that some of them haven't done until recently or even started thinking about until recently, and I think it's something that's really critical uh, for our, our community to, to do. Uh, and in, and in just in a summary, then, both of these proposals uh, total a million dollars in ARPA funds, uh, $14.5 million in leveraged investment, uh, and, or $27.89 invested uh, for every dollar of ARPA money spent. So hopefully that is juice worth the squeeze. Um, and uh, and uh, thank you for doing this exercise and looking at all these opportunities for some really great things uh, on, this, on this docket tonight. And hopefully um, you can see your way to, to supporting some of these home ownership related programs as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Questions? Alder Steyer and then Alder Galvin. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks for coming in, Noel. Um, you know, with the homeownership uh, situation in Green Bay, is, do you have a number of uh, percentage as far as what uh, number of folks own their homes versus rental? Do you have anything like that? And is it improving, or what, what's your take on that? Yeah, it, it had been, you know, kind of a half and half thing, you know, uh, in a broad sense. Green Bay was maybe a little higher renter occupancy than some of the surrounding communities or as the county as a whole. Um, the homeownership numbers did take a little, uh, a bit of a hit uh, since the, the Great Recession, um, but we'd like to see those numbers come back. Uh, right now, the challenge that we're facing is that we're just short units, period, right? And so whether it's low-income units or market rate units, owner-occupied, renter-occupied, whatever, we just need to build more as a community. Um, but uh, we, we would like to bring those home ownership numbers up in these programs stabilize existing home ownership for families as well as uh, promote it for, for new arrivals in our community. So would, would your uh, office as well as uh, community development have better numbers on that as far as uh, the percentages that way? Because I, you know, I, it would be nice to have a, a graph or something to look at to kind of understand this whole dynamic. Sure, yeah, and, and I can provide that to you. We'd pull it out of the census data um, and take a look at that over time. Yeah, you probably could find that with a quick Google because I know I've, I've come, come across that. Yep. Um, Alder Galvin. Mr. Halverson, so this program is for people buying homes, correct? Is it for people coming into our community? It could be used by people who are currently renting in town and they want to purchase a home. Uh, so it doesn't have to be new arrivals necessarily, but uh, certainly folks looking to live here uh, after they land a job here, this would, would, help, would help those folks as okay, well. So if someone owns a house here, this would, they wouldn't be able to apply for this? They, they, right. The, this program would be for new purchases and, and not necessarily for somebody who's already a homeowner. All right. And would it be there um, for them to use of their building, or do they have to buy something that's currently... Yeah, we're not, in our notes, we haven't stipulated that. If those were things that the city wanted to add in terms of some parameters, uh, we'd be happy to work with community development on that. But right now, we're envisioning that both new existing homes as well as new construction would be eligible. And then the hope is that the private companies would get more involved with this, provide more funding. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I talked with a, a, an employer outside of the, the area recently who uh, was facing some similar challenges. Their, their community wasn't seeing enough building, and they told me that they'd had a new hire who took a job making you know, over a dollar less an hour far away because they, they couldn't find an apartment or, or a home near the plant. And so they were, they were you know, taking a lower paying job but, but not having less of a commute. And we've got folks making that sort of you know, uh, calculation every day. Uh, if they can't find an apartment or a home here, they're going to look someplace else, and then they might take a job someplace else, and, and we lose out as a community. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Any other questions or comments? Alder Campbell. I just want to know, when you say employers, how many actual employers and how many employers, I mean, the size of these employers that can afford to house their people, is my question because mm -hmm. I've never heard of this. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we'd be looking at here is that smaller, um, 
companies uh, with 25 or fewer employees uh, wouldn't need to make the match in order to have their workers qualify for this program. They'd be able to get the $10,000 grant um, without the employer making a contribution. So only the you know, bigger, bigger employees would be required to, to make that match. Um, and right now, you know, the, the folks that we've worked with over time have been ones who were concerned about loss of employees because um, uh, they, they, might, they might just leave uh, maybe to go try something else and then they'd have all these uh, turnover costs as they're trying to train up a new person. And so some of the first folks that got involved with us on employer-assisted homeownership were thinking about retention. But now it's something that employers are asking us about, thinking about attraction, thinking about how to land new employees because they've got a benefit that'll help that employee purchase a home. So, so what kind of numbers? I mean, who, how many are you working with right now? How many are doing it right now? So we have, uh, NeighborWorks Green Bay also does, offers this program as well to our employees, uh, Clarity Care, and uh, um, American Foods Group are, have been longtime partners. American Foods Group has helped many dozens of their employees purchase homes um, with our assistance in a partnership program that's been going for over 20 years. And we've got some other conversations going on. Uh, this program could help launch more participation in that and get even additional employees working with us. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alder. Any other questions? Director Stecksholte. We had um, just a couple points to question about the owner record. We in, our, in our housing study we did recently, it was about 44% uh, renter occupied, 55% owner occupied. Uh, that was in that was in 2020. Uh, but just a quick quick Google. Uh, it, it says it's about 56.44, so it's still similar numbers. Okay. In terms mm -hmm. of percentages. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. 56 owner occupied. Yes. Alder Scannell and Alder Weary. Uh, just if so if it's also looking at uh, retaining employees so then if someone is living in green bay as a renter it would help them also they could purchase a home okay thank you Lower. here thanks thanks mr Ellison. um i would imagine we probably have enough interest from people who are residents of green bay right now for this program that we could easily meet the demand right Absolutely. without reaching outside Okay, so if there was a parameter that said, hey, this is just for people who are currently living in Green Bay, you'd be okay with that? I think that there's significant demand in any facet of, of, of the market right now for folks to get into homes, and any tool that we as a community can provide would be welcome, and, uh, and, and whatever constraints or, or parameters you wish to choose uh, to, to put on that, I think we can, we can make that work. I appreciate it, because I, I'm sure there's a lot of people who would love to move here and get help with buying a house, but I, don't, I know darn well there's a lot of people who live here who, yeah, who would absolutely. like Absolutely. Right, We'd love to see some of those homes that got converted from owner-occupied to renter-occupied during the foreclosure crisis or you know, in subsequent years go back to being owner-occupied. So if this could help with that, that would be a good thing too. And just a note on that, Alder Weary, um, city, employee, city employees are eligible under this program. Uh, cops, firefighters, employees of City Hall, DPW, Parks, everything, obviously. So that would be the only thing that I would bring to light. If you were to restrict it to city residents currently, then maybe we wouldn't be able to attract some of those employees in. But just, just wanted to note that. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Thanks for the testimony. Any others in the room who would like to offer some thoughts? Any other members of the public who would like to speak to us? Right. Entertain a motion. Motion to close the floor. Yeah. Motion to close the floor. Offered by Alder Sorry. Johnson, seconded by Alder Scannell. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The floor is closed. Motion to divide items two through forty-seven into their respective ARPA categories. Sorry, I did not have your mic on. Can you say that again? Motion to divide items two through forty-seven into their respective categories. I can explain that further if you'd like. Is there a second? Second. Alder Johnson makes a motion to divide these items into the respective categories, seconded by Alder Scannell. Alder Johnson? Yeah, the, the reason I, I'm offering up this motion is because obviously 47 items here, there's a lot of items to take up. Um, if we take these up one at a time, it's, that means that we can only discuss the item for which is open, uh, and it's, it makes it incredibly difficult when you're looking at an entire bucket 
right? And which items do you want to prioritize within that bucket? But you can't even have that discussion the way this agenda is published. So by dividing it, putting it into that bucket, we can say, hey, we're going we're gonna to discuss all of the capital organizational needs bucket first, because uh, I would just put it in the same priority that we've seen within our reports. Uh, and then it allows council the ability to kind of negotiate items, uh, you know, like, hey, we're not going to give 500000 here. Maybe we'll give 400 so that way we can make sure that we fund this one with 100 It allows us to have a more holistic conversation rather than trying to shoot these off one at a time. And, you know, and all of a sudden you find yourself potentially at the end of the list saying, oh, gosh, there's a request on here for $500,000 for a snow machine at Triangle Hill. But sorry, Dan, we already allocated all the other we already allocated all the funding to the other items. So by dividing it, I think it just it, it, it allows us to have a conversation about every item within that category at the same time. Alderweer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, interesting idea, and, and I'm open to it, obviously. But currently, just for all of our sake and the public, what are the current buckets and the allocated amounts? If we could start Ms. there. Ms. Adams or Director Ellen Becker? You're asking for the remaining balances? Um, yeah, because uh, the reason for asking is couldn't we at any point really conclude that we wanted to reallocate money to different buckets if we wanted right i, I mean I would we're defer. not bound to x amount in each bucket we could say you know what we we feel our needs in this bucket far outweigh the other ones and we're just going to move it over so I, I don't want us to feel like we're bound to some some preset number unless the federal government's telling us that right Thanks. so we do have a resolution that is guiding our action that's, here i'd like to hear that thing um so, Attorney Bungard, if you want to just speak to the fact that there is a resolution that was adopted by council that has set out those categories. Correct. There is a resolution that was adopted by council that kind of set, not kind of, but did set the categories and the expenditure caps um, for each category. Um, so that was adopted by council. So that has already been put in place. So council has bound itself to certain parameters. And could you just relay what those amounts are just yeah. so we're all in the same. <laughs> Director Ellen Becker. Yes, we have, we have five categories and the capital needs and organizational priorities. Um, the allocation was $10 million. Our affordable housing development and small business support is with $6 million. Stormwater, green infrastructure and climate re resilience is $3 million. Crime prevention and neighborhood enhancement is that is two million and arts culture and tourism was 1.5 million for a total of 22 million five hundred thousand that was allocated through that resolution i don't have the packet open yet but that um summary of how much has been budgeted how much has been approved how much was proposed and recommended is on a page page 10 of the electronic packet i appreciate that um because it's by, by resolution, let's say tonight we decide we have more capital needs than we thought, we could hold up on some of this appointment of funds and redo our resolution to accommodate it, correct? And because we have, what, till 2024, not that we have to wait to the very end, but we have, we have two years to appropriate this money. So another couple of weeks to redo a resolution is fine. So I, I don't want us to feel like we're up against a brick wall if we do have more capital needs or whatever police that we want to allocate towards. So it's a good guideline, but I think there's room there to change it if we want. Yeah. And just, to, just one point on the capital needs. Uh, as Director Ellen Becker said, that's $10 million. Yeah. That is set by the federal government. That's the maximum amount that we were eligible for okay. in that most flexible category. So that is the only one that, that that's is. That's good to know. For and that is Thank absolutely you. fixed. Thank you. You bet. Other, Alder Johnson. Yeah, and I appreciate that additional insight, Alder Weary. Um, and by no means is my motion intended to, you know, kind of force us to have to make decisions tonight. In fact, I, I think uh, there's not a single decision on here tonight, technically, that we have to make. Uh, I was just trying to more so trying to add some order to how we go about debating 47 items, because I think that's this is messy no matter which way you look at it. And so I was just trying to offer up a motion that maybe kind of compartmentalizes it a little bit more neatly so that we, we kind of know, hey, generally we're talking about this bucket. And to your point, if, if we say, you know what, we'd really like to put, you know, 2.5 million in crime prevention, I, by all means, I would support having the flexibility to do that. Okay. Any other comments on this one? Alder Campbell? I know when I work with Dan on my project, he, 
he pretty much told me what it would go under. I just wonder that some of these, maybe what Alder Weary's talking about, not that we can change the structure of, of the whole plan act here, but maybe some of these ideas and projects could possibly fit under some other category. Okay, so I think that's building off of Alder Weary's. I think that's uh, kind of what he means. I was thinking what he's saying. Yeah, so I that, agree with that. That's a good point, and I think that applies to a number of these items that were that have the staff, re staff recommendation of referral, because some of them aren't the best fit for the category identified. But I would agree with that. Thank you. Other comments, Alder Grant. I just want to clarify too, because I think it's a little hard as a new member you know the old council created those categories but quite frankly if you look online at the actual arpa categories they aren't so for example um responding to public health and negative impacts of the pandemic you can't limit that necessarily to one of the categories you guys created so my question is how are we truly categorizing things when we're looking at public health, the impact of COVID. It's just, it's very confusing to me. There's a set amount left and we know what's capital needs and the remaining, it's very, it wishy washes back and forth between categories. So it almost makes sense to look at what's left of capital needs and separate the rest as a clump. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Alder Eck? Uh, okay, so um, I'm not, against your idea my concern is is because it's not really laid out on here am i not close enough oh thank you because that is annoying i whoo blinded um to i guess to or what it was good lighting for you yeah it was perfect oh thank you <laughs> darn i lost my halo um as far as trying to organize it in a way because our agenda is not laid out like that so we'll be skipping around so it's just I don't know, I guess I wish it would have been something thought of in advance. No no offense, but it's a good idea. Just No, I know, but just a thought to put it in categories so that it's more organized. Alder Scannell? Yeah, I still support the motion because if we do want to move things around from, I mean, we have a resolution and this would let us know if we need to play around with that resolution. If we just ignore, uh, just put everything together and ignore what we've, categories we've made and the bucket, you know, the buckets we've made, we're not going to know if we need to tweak our resolution. Certainly nothing is set in stone that we can't move things around and can't change things, but we should have a good idea of what our resolution is, the guidelines we set for ourselves, and that will help us be organized here but we need to be flexible in that organization and realize that we can move things. But it is going to take, perhaps, yeah. uh, setting things aside until we change our resolution to do that. But we won't know that if we throw it all in one bucket. So, it's Alder, Alder Graham for a second time. Um, I guess, and I don't mean to say one bucket, but if you openly look at the, if we look at all the proposals in front of us, they are categorized by those categories so if we vote yes or no to them and we lay out what's in front of us and we do see that there's an excess in one account or category and not in the other then we can make the resolution to shuffle if we agree as a council that that's adequate so I, I just mean I guess keep into consideration as we're going through these that we're not limited to and that's what I mean is my set of buckets any other comments on that motion Alder Johnson for a yeah, it just, you know, one thing that I wanted to point out is, um, you know, we had conducted the community outreach survey and, and hosted a couple of listening sessions from the general public. And, Mayor, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that gathered upwards of 1,500. I think it was 700 plus. 700? Okay. Yeah. Well, I like 1,500 better. But <laughs> seven, 700 is still very good. Yeah. Um, uh, bits of feedback from the, from the general public that helped guide what those buckets were. Uh, because it was able to help us identify areas of need and I know all those results were shared with council at the uh, the last council of course and again that's just more of a just an FYI to kind of catch everybody up uh, but the other question I have is more of a point of order for for attorney Bungert um, if we divide these items again my intent is for for us 
to be able to converse about all of the items within the bucket, not have to say, okay, we can only talk about this item because that's the item that's open on the floor. Um, does it still preserve uh, the option for council to act on those items individually within that bucket? Yes. So each item, I think just for the purposes of, of making clear what the votes are and what the council's wishes are for each item, you would still do an individual vote for each item or at least a motion for each item or a motion directing one big motion addressing each item but either way each item has to be disposed of in some fashion whether it's in one motion or two or four motions depending on how many um, how many items are in, are each in are in each category by dividing it into categories it just organizes the discussion and the debate flowing forward so okay. it can be best captured in the minutes perfect thank you okay holder act um, so uh, I'm it's more of a request that um, we do talk about all the items prior to voting on it mm -hmm. so that we have it, all of the information I just want to clarify that's yeah, the plan that, right yeah that doesn't change okay yep. so that's a good point of clarification because I wasn't clear on that I guess your intent Alder Johnson is to run through for example all the capital needs and organizational priorities and then conduct votes at the end of that discussion yeah I guess that's the point of order that I was seeking and it's my understanding that's what would happen because I, I I just want us to be able to talk about every item within that bucket okay and and I think this motion allows us to do that and still individually act on each item got it any other questions or comments so with that all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. opposed nay the ayes have it um, and that motion to divide is successful so we will begin with capital needs and organizational priorities um, with item two um, and I'm also going to ask <clears throat> director Ellen Becker to be prepared to offer the staff recommendation um, on these items as I as I run through them because um, it's not here on the agenda but it's in the packet so that item two is for consideration with possible action for the use of American Rescue Plan Act allocation within the capital needs and organizational priorities category for a total of $25,000 to be used for project 61204 fire station analysis. Motion to approve and refer the findings to the ad hoc facilities committee. Motion has been made to approve. That was made by Alder Johnson and seconded by Alder Stevens. A discussion on this item. And Director Allen Becker, that's, that's a recommended item, I believe. Uh, Alder Eck. Okay. Um, yes. So um, you're referring it back for the ad hoc committee, but it is a different ad hoc. I say that funny. Um, it's a different analysis that we're looking for. And I just want to clarify, is that what you're referring to? Alder Johnson. The um, GIS, Geographic Information Systems Analysis. Yep. I, so my motion is to support that study. Okay, but, just making but sure. But the reason I'm, I'm requesting that it be referred back to the Ad Hoc Facilities Committee, again, just for the benefit of all council members, that was a committee that was created uh, really in response to a, a large number of repairs that were required at City Hall. The capital, uh, the five-year capital improvement plan was calling for $10 million of improvements to City Hall over five years. Uh, it was designed to address some of the needs uh, with the police department in, in past proposals to construct a new police facility. And it also, within that facility port, includes, uh, and this is already undergoing and will be reported back in a couple, couple weeks, uh, facility conditions of fire stations one and three, which is part of this proposal. So even though your request, like the facility needs is already being done as part of that committee work, um, and so your your report understood is different so but it makes sense to me that if you have a facilities committee that is currently assessing facility conditions uh, that that committee also continues to look at fire stations one and three uh, so it's complete support of, of the proposal but making sure that that because the other thing that facility committee is doing is assessing financially how to achieve these goals right do we sell buildings do we put them back on the tax roll? Do we do TIF? Do we do opportunity zones? Do we do bonding? Uh, it's really meant to look at all of those things. And I think that it makes sense to continue to have that committee look at all of those things, which is why I'm proposing that it be referred back to that committee. 
Um, is it okay if we go to Chief Litton for a clarification on the differences? Sure, uh, Chief Litton. I think I understand the proposal from uh, Alder Johnson. Um, so the, the $25,000 under item two uh, is specific to uh, firms that are out there that work in the state, uh, specifically in public safety buildings for uh, an analysis of space needs, uh, first of all, and then uh, geospatial location. So um, based on station three's location as an emergency responding station, uh, where are the optimal places that should be placed in order to create uh, the optimal response times in an emergency? So that's what we're talking about under the $25,000 study there. I would suggest, however, that um, while I have the floor, that when that report comes, that it remains confidential um, so that at some point down the road when the city planning department is starting to uh, negotiate or look at land acquisition for uh, such, a, such a building, that it remains confidential so that we don't pay three times the price of what it would have been. Right, in terms of the geographical recommendations? So I would ask for that amendment if... Uh, yeah, no objection to that. Great point. And then, Director Grenier, if you, if you could maybe just enlighten everyone here about uh, the status of the, the BSA analysis and what that would actually entail. Sure. Uh, BSA, Berner Schober Associates, our consultant, finished uh, physical on-site walkthroughs through the candidate buildings, I believe, last week or the week before. So they are currently in the process of pulling together a draft copy of that report. So we do hope to have it extremely soon. Okay. All right. Any additional questions or comments on that motion? Alder Galvin. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, I keep uh, quoting Alder Johnson on this. Why take money from ARPA if there's other funds available to be used for this? And I, I I would bet that if uh, someone went looking in the fire department budget that there's probably some money that's been saved this past year that would pay for this study. I'm in favor of the study, but I mean, I'm, I'm certainly they could find $25,000 out of salary savings or anything else like that where instead of using ARPA money, we could, we could use that if possible. Is that a question for Chief Linton? Yes. Well, I'd, I'd refer that uh, to either Director um, uh, Ellen Becker or, or Assistant Director Manley, but I will tell you that uh, as, as it's tracking as of right now, we'll be right down to the zero penny at the end of the year. Either Director Ellen Becker or Director Manley? I would agree with Chief uh, at this point, um, the way the overtime is going, um, I would not expect that they're going to have any surplus in the fire department in their 2022 um, operating budget at this time. Okay, thank right. you. Thank you. Other questions on this item? Okay, so we have a motion and a second. I guess I'm cl clarifying again. Th this would dispense with the item if we approve yeah, this so motion. So is that is that what we're hoping to do? Well, I think I think we should maybe allow conversation on any of the items within that bucket. Right. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, so I guess then we don't really want the motion. Technically, it's a motion on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I got a little trigger happy. Sorry. Right. Um, Sometimes I try to be too efficient. <laughs> So yes, a uh, motion to withdraw. Yeah. Uh, I, oh, that's right, we gotta do that, don't we? Motion to withdraw. Second. Offered by Alder Johnson, seconded by Alder uh, Stevens. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay, the ayes have it. That item has been withdrawn. Um, ready for item number three, which is um, consideration of possible, possible action. Um, under the capital needs and organizational priorities category for a total of $9 million to be used for project 6-1-205 fire station project. Um, and just a, a housekeeping note, if you could press your buttons under the overarching committee of the whole, I think I should be able to check the queue there. Um, that might be easier so we don't have to be scrolling up and down on the individual items. Does that make sense to Alders? Okay. Comments on this item? Do, yeah. Yes. Um, <coughs> Director Hronick, are we all no set over here? Oh. <coughs> Excuse me. And just a reminder for Alders, uh, 
we do have a you know, a council resolution or something governing our discussions that does limit um, comments from alders to five minutes yeah. per item. Um, so we've got two alders here, so we've got about ten minutes for a presentation. Did it show up there? Okay, um, so I just want to start off with, um, so Alders Grant and I, Alder Grant and I went in and did a tour of stations one and three and um, saw just what disrepair it was in and that was why we decided to take this project on um, because we really believe that our firefighters deserve much better than the conditions that they're working in and some of them are um, in station three specifically living in, in the station. There we go. Okay, so um, it is technically in the um, the revenue loss, uh, which is has the ten million dollar maximum. Um, they do respond to public health and negative impact, or and responding to. Pub what? Are, why are we going through these? This, these are just the standard ARPA categories. So this is what I'm talking about. If you find on the federal website, these are the categories that I was talking about as far as buckets go. The categories that the previous council picked was off of these guidelines, so they technically need to fall between these guidelines to apply. Be I don't know if there was an extra slide in there. Okay. So the reason that we thought, so like we said, there is the lost revenue that there's only about 5.3 million left. So what we were discussing today with the with Attorney Bunger is that we think the remaining amount should be able to apply to the public health and negative impacts of the pandemic. What we want to do for this new firehouse is we want to provide our firefighters a separate sleeping space to avoid the spread of COVID and other viruses. Through the pandemic, they were, um, they are all cross EMT trains. So they were handling and dealing with COVID patients in a sense and bringing them to the hospital. So there was a, a chance that they could contract COVID and bring it back to the house where they're all sleeping on top of each other. Um, they are a lot in a newer houses they have a more separate dorm style sleeping arrangements and that's what we would like to see for our firefighters there will be viruses in the future they're not going away um, newer houses also have a drive-through garage which would also allow us to utilize this space for drive-through testing or any other needs through crises it just gives us that flexibility we were able to use vacant shopco buildings and sear building this year but that doesn't guarantee those buildings will be vacant in the future for any future um, public health issues. And I know we have an emergency operational command center on the east side out at the county jail, but as we know, sometimes the river does separate and divide our city. So this would offer a command center on the west side. They have the technology and the equipment. So it's just working together with them if this, again, additional opportunity to, for any emergency situation. Okay, so um, the main issues we're facing, uh, and in your packet, or your, um, yeah, the packet, you have the um, list of Station 1 and 3's facility issues, uh, specifically, you know, talking about Station 1's 90 years, 93 years old, Station 3 is 86 years old, there's structural damage, um, if you get a chance to go on a tour, you can sh uh, see the different um, issues, cracked foundation, um, and again, there's non-separate restrooms and sleeping space for the men and women, as you heard earlier from our firefighters, uh, specifically from the female firefighter, uh, what her type of um, restrooms are and the, and the sleeping space is right in there with the guys and they just have like a half wall separating them. Um, the, the buildings are non-ADA compliant. Um, there's stairs, there's no um, elevators, things like that to get to all of the floors. Um, there is also in your packet the facilities report summary, um, it's the colorful one. Um, it was actually done in 2015, and it, there was listing of almost $693,000 in repairs specifically um, for these stations, and almost 545,000 in total capital projects um, on there. So 
So like I said before, with the qualifications of this project, there's also additional benefits that this project brings to our community. Uh, we have a unique opportunity to use federal tax dollars, that's what the COVID relief funds are, to save on future tax, local tax dollars. Um, right now we're paying utilities and maintenance and upkeeping of two locations. We're talking about combining stations one and three because one is a no longer servicing station. So we're kind of paying for two buildings that don't need to be separated. And like we mentioned before too, station three is actually paying extra to customize fire engines to fit into the stalls. So as a taxpayer, we could reduce some of those costs for future. We have the opportunity to update this building and make it more energy efficient, which also in the long run would save on utilities. There's a lot better things available now that cost a lot of energy to us. And the improvements to the features throughout the building, again, there's that cleaning, clean and dirty equipment station that we talked about, and that actually does give our firefighters health benefits with cancer prevention. Um, we have the opportunity to do better exhaust emissions control, better ventilation system, crew quarters for female personnel, like mentioned. We would like to see a community room in this station so that the fire department actually has a room to do trainings and they are welcome or open to welcoming that to residents for showers parties you know birthday parties letting the kids experience the fire station on top of it so it's a great way to draw the community together as well and then like we mentioned as well drive through stalls that's more common now in newer houses but it's also a safety feature for the fire station Again, more spread out sleeping arrangements so that they're not spreading viruses or anything like that. A big thing with this one is the longevity of this project. I understand $9 million is a big price tag, but the existing buildings are currently 86 and 92 years old. If you're looking for bang for your buck, we're looking at $9 million to last a good amount of time. This is something that will last decades, if not generations, and serve our community for a long time. And again, this is not a project that is if, but a when. So what we're trying to do and work with the ad hoc committee is give them funds to start moving forward with a plan that has been too big. Um, so right now the existing plan is unobtainable without costing taxpayers. And what I mean by that is what Alder Johnson referred to, the ad hoc committee, in trying to combine the different municipal buildings that are needed. Um, there's been different uh, amounts of 45, 50 million, and I think it's going up for that. Um, and we have talked to uh, you know the different departments, and police and fire don't necessarily want to be combined in the same um, building, and in light of different the different um, situations fairly recently with riots and different things like that, there's other communities that had that situation where the fire department and the police department were within close proximity of each other and they were surrounded and they were unable to get out of the community or that um, or their buildings to get and help the community. So that is an issue of having them all in one for security reasons as well. Um, again, our firefighters deserve better. All of our firefighters are EMT cross-trained. Um, there's, uh, you know, we, we want employee recruitment and retention. We have been told that there are some uh, firefighters that weren't sure if they wanted to take a job at Station 3 um, specifically because of the state of the building. Um, so it, they also help with structuring and implementation of the COVID response um, along with the county. Um, they were the first in the state to obtain an ISO, which is um, specifically here, um, an A rating. And so that, it's an ISO class one rating. And what that does is it helps to lower the cost for insurance for our residents. So that's a, that's a big cost savings for us because of them being able to provide that service. Um, and again, which we've had this a few times, men and women need separate bathrooms and sleeping facilities as they are on 24-hour shifts, so they do sleep there, they live there. So where we came up with $9 million is the firehouse was actually built in Hudson, Wisconsin, and it was built in 2020. It cost them $7 million. I would do have some pictures to show as well, but it has four wide stalls for bigger engines, two for smaller, um, two for police, or I'm sorry, the chief vehicles, 
They have the double-sided doors. Their living quarters are on the second floor with six dorm-style rooms, a first floor admin, a community room, protective equipment that has their own room with their own ventilation system going outside, in floor heating throughout, along with 10 feet heating coils outside to prevent the doors from freezing. And they were able to do all of this for $7 million two years ago. Um, I'm just gonna show you some of the, the pictures that that we have. Um, this is the basement flooding during heavy rains due to the cracked foundation walls. Um, some more examples of that. Um, this is peeling walls in the dorm area at the head of the bed where the firefighters sleep in the, so uh, obviously in the. And you can see the, oh, sorry, oh. the dividers, yeah. Yeah, you can see the dividers and I do have a, yeah. see this picture shows you the more of the, the dividers to show you that is the, that is the dorm area where both the men and women sleep. And there's the ceiling of the basement below, below the apparatus bay. Um, the, our um, fire, what is it? Just a time check, we're at 10. Uh, firefighter, she, well, she was mentioning how the apparatus bay um, was sinking just, in, just and a, this is below quick, that. And okay. thank you for your consideration in supporting our local heroes. Thank you, again. And that floor they are monitoring monthly. Great, thanks for the presentation. Questions or comments from council? Alder Steuer. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Alders, Eck, and uh, uh, Grant. I'm having a hard time here. I'm getting older. But anyway, thank you for what you've done here. You know, you've done a lot of work. Uh, I had an opportunity to tour uh, Station 3 as well, so it does need help or work or whatever you want to call it. But um, I noticed that our remaining uh, monies for capital needs and organizational priorities is like 5.6 million, and you're looking at nine. So, have you thought of that as far as other alternatives? Yes. Yeah, so if this goes through, that's where we brought up those categories as far as um, again the ARPA requirements. There is the public health. Go down two more. So num number two, responding public health and negative impacts of the pandemic. They did do that in 2020. And again, we're planning for the future to make sure that if we do have another public health emergency or natural disaster, they have the facility to do so, whether it be testing, handing out supplies, administering vaccines, anything like that. So it would technically qualify under the responding to public health and negative impacts. What that means for our categories, that would be something we would have to do a resolution because our categories don't match verbatim to the to federal the categories. Okay. So our consideration, um, and we've been in contact with Attorney Bungert and a lot of different staff about it, and um, hoping that we could hold the money until we can um, clarify with the Treasury whether we could use a different category for the remaining funds. Okay, and I think Thank you. just given those comments, uh, I think it would make sense to go to Attorney Bungert. She can summarize the memo that um, that she prepared and has been included in the packet for Alders. Trini Bunger? Yes. Um, as Alders mentioned, um, the city, when it did its survey as far as figuring out um, the biggest priority needs um, for the city with respect to the recovery funds, there were five categories that came back and were adopted, which is the capital needs and organizations priorities, which is the revenue loss bucket. Uh, the affordable housing development and small business support, stormwater, green infrastructure, climate resilience, crime prevention, neighborhood enhancement, and then arts, culture, and tourism. And then as the alders indicated, there are standard um, ARPA categories that initially came out, and then the Treasury also implemented a final rule which essentially expanded those categories and provided additional guidance on what projects were eligible, which ones were not eligible, um, specific, more particularly under the public health and negative impacts category. So in, in preparation of this memo, essentially I looked at the fire station project as it was presented and looked how it would fit under both the revenue loss category and the public health and negative impacts. So first taking in lost revenue, the purpose of this category is essentially for um, municipalities to be able to do just that, recoup lost revenue that they lost during the pandemic um, and then now are now experiencing 
um, shortfalls and deficiencies in funding and uh, an ability to be able to um, invest in capital expenditures, invest in new buildings and, and other things. So it's basically a straight revenue replacement um, based on um, whatever the Treasury's calcula calculations are. Um, and accordingly, um, that category is capped at $10 million. Currently, I calculated with calculator, because nobody wants to trust my math, <laughs> is 4 million, about approximately 4.3 million has been approved and allocated under the lost revenue um, bucket of funds, leaving a remainder of approximately $5.6 million, which isn't enough to cover the estimated 9 million that's being proposed for creating um, this new fire station combining stations one and three. So there is a possibility to allocate what's left um, in the lost revenue fund for this category. However, it's going to effectively exclude any other projects or proposed projects from both alders and staff um, that are on the table under that same category because it's just going to use up the, the, um, the remainder of the funds. Um, but more importantly, it's also going to require um, an additional identification of a funding source by council for the project, for example, bonding or another source of revenue, um, which would potentially be in excess of $3 million to hit that $9 million estimated mark. Now, moving on to the public health and negative impacts category. So capital expenditures are eligible so long as they're enumerated looses, uh, looses, uses. I also attached to my memo Appendix H, which basically gives an entire list of enumerated looses, did it again, uses from the US Treasury of types of capital expenditure projects that would be covered under this public health and negative impacts category. Um, that list isn't meant to be exhaustive. The Treasury did, Treasury did provide kind of a, um, another path forward that if your project is not an enumerated use under that appendix, you could potentially still qualify under the public health and negative impacts category. However, you have to go through a two-part framework analysis. I put down the, the um, I identified both of those. You have to identify some sort of public health impact or harm and how that harm will be addressed or responded to by the project. Secondly, your project has to be reasonably designed to benefit an individual or a class that experienced that public health impact or harm. And then it also must be reasonably proportionable, reasonably proportional to the extent and type of public health impact or harm experienced. And then an additional caveat is if your um, if your project exceeds one million dollars, which this would, you have to find you have to provide additional justification um, uh, for that um, for that expenditure, which includes the description of the harm or need to be addressed, i.e., number of individuals, an explanation as to why the expenditure is appropriate, why existing resources are inadequate, and a comparison of proposed capital expenditure pr uh, project against two other alternative projects and why the proposed one is superior to the two others. Um, so it's a fairly robust additional analysis that has to be provided in order to qualify under this category if your project is not an enumerated use. Um, because rebuilding or providing or putting together a new fire station is not an enumerated use under the list, it would have to go through this additional analysis. Um, and eligible uses under the category still have to be, regardless of whether they're enumerated or not enumerated, they still have to be in response to the disease itself or the harmful consequences of the economic disruptions resulting from or exacerbated by the public health emergency of COVID-19. Um, to kind of list off some um, eligible projects that, that qualify under this bucket would be building of schools, childcare facilities, medical facilities dedicated to COVID-19 treatment and mitigation, like ICU, uh, ICUs, emergency rooms, temporary medical facilities, emergency operation centers, behavioral health facilities, affordable housing and permanent supportive housing, primary care clinics, improvements in vac uh, to vacant and abandoned buildings. Um, things that were deemed ineligible specifically by the Treasury included construction of new correctional facilities, um, construction of new congregate facilities, and construction of convention centers and other um, large capital pro projects basically for the intent of economic development. 
So taking all this into um, as a whole, um, the likelihood that a replacement re replacing of a fire station as presented, the likelihood of that um, qualifying and meeting those fairly expansive and robust eligibility requirements is, is rather low. Um, and specifically, a big hurdle is the fact that the need and impact of replacing the fire stations is proportionally more focused on improving the conditions and security of the employees themselves rather than benefiting the public health that has been connected to or impacted by the pandemic specifically. Um, there's no clear connection how the impact and the response of replacing the fire stations is attributable to the COVID-19 pandemic or how it will directly address the harm experienced by the public or to public health. Um, in addition, due um, beyond the, the likelihood, the low likelihood of eligibility, there's also a significant risk of audit failure. So for every expenditure, we have to provide backup and reporting. Um, and such a failure, if, if we allocate this fun, these, these funds and spend them on something that is determined ultimately to be ineligible, um, it, it obviously carries a, a significant risk of, of liability exposure, um, potential uh, consequences of, of future blocks of federal funding, um, as well as obviously the, the, the possibility of having to repay those funds back to the federal government. Thanks, Attorney Bunger. Mm -hmm. um, reaction to that or questions? Uh, well, we... Um, Alder, Alder Burnett? Oh. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Attorney Bungard. I do have a couple questions on that. Uh, the state of the... I took a tour of both of the facilities, and the state of the facilities are, are rather poor, and uh, it is possible... Is it possible that at some point that those fire stations, especially Station 3, which responds to calls regularly, could be deemed unsafe or uh, uh, unable to be used anymore. Is that a possibility in the near future, like within a year or two? Um, I don't think I would be the best person to answer that question. I think that would probably be best suited for um, our inspections division and our, our buildings officials um, as to, you know, the current status of the building and at what point um, a building, you know, slated is for okay. slated for condemnation or um, razor repair or any other kind of um, abatement mechanisms in place. Chief Litton, if that bay collapses, that station would no longer be usable, correct? Station three? Yeah, I think that's an accurate statement. Uh, what is the possibility of that happening? Uh, you know, it's hard to say. I, I do know that uh, city staff engineering does check the building. Uh, I'm not sure what rotation they're doing right now. Um, am I concerned about an imminent collapse? I am not concerned about an imminent collapse. I am concerned about the long-term um, usability of the station. Okay, thank you. Uh, Attorney Bungert, um, we're talking about COVID, you know, the, the effects of COVID, the, the money that goes into projects to respond to COVID. The, the two largest projects, aside from the fire station, which is at $9 million. A couple of the, the larger, I should say three, but the largest other than the fire station would be Bay Beach, and that's $1.45 million. Mm -hmm. And that is for historic Bay Beach pavilion improvements. You know, perhaps COVID didn't cause the deterioration of the fire station, but is it I mean, we can't argue that COVID caused the pavilion at Bay Beach to get into disrepair to the point that it needs improvement. I, 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 a, I would need to clarify under what category um, that it's funding. <coughs> it's revenue loss. Right, so it's a different analysis altogether. So there is no, under revenue loss, it's a straight allocation. You don't have to provide justification for how it was connected or caused by COVID. It's essentially, we know that you're, you need money because you've lost revenue because of the pandemic. Here's a bunch of money invested in capital expenditures because you are not gonna be able to tax your way out of it, essentially, and generate enough revenue to overcome the losses that you have experienced. In this category of public uh, public impact of public health and negative impacts, it's a different analysis. There has to be a connection to addressing a negative economic impact and, in, and 
addressing a public health impact and it has to be related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's a different analysis. So the Bay, Be Bay Beach project doesn't have to be connected to COVID because it's being utilized under the revenue loss bucket. Yeah, While the there isn't enough money to cover the $9 billion estimated um, ticket price essentially for the fire station. Thank you. The, the reason I ask is you had mentioned all of the different steps and criteria to be met for the fire station to be considered. I mean, we're, you, I think, I don't know the word you used, but you said it's, you basically is, uh, made the assumption that it would be very rare, possibly. I don't, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. But it is possible, though. We, we don't know what the federal government would rule if we made a case <clears throat> with the proper city departments that the fire station is in such disrepair or potential disrepair in the next few years that it could no longer be usable. Like, we could make the case, though, is what I'm getting at. Is that true? And just put it in the hands of the federal government to make a ruling? I don't think there's a mechanism by which, by which we can get a ruling. I think we can get best guidance um, and consult with experts, but there isn't a mechanism by which you apply and get a green light and then move forward. Is there, I'm, I'm just thinking of ideas, is there a way to get a consultation from the Wisconsin League of Municipalities or any other municipal organization perhaps at the federal level that we're part of because other municipalities have done it I know you don't know necessarily every right circumstance in those municipalities to but clarify other municipalities have done fire station projects and all, all of those to my understanding have been under the revenue loss bucket I'm not aware of any projects um, that have occurred under the public health negative impacts bucket with respect to creating simply a fire station uh, before we kind of, I don't know what the council is going to do as far as the vote goes, but before we possibly close the door on this as a possibility, would you be willing to consult with the Wisconsin League of Municipalities to get I can a, certainly reach out. Um, that's always a possibility. We have a standing call with the league yeah. um, to see how they view these rules. Um, however, again, because this is kind of a nuanced act that was just handed down a couple years ago this has never really occurred previously this isn't something um, that a, a lot of the, the same questions are arising with other municipalities that are arising yep. here so but yeah, I can I certainly I can always reach out yeah uh, thank you for that and I know sure. other questions I'll just say this to the council like we know that the fire stations are in a bad shape we don't know how long they're going to last we do know we're going to have to replace them at some point as a city government Chances are we're going to have to use bonded money for it unless we raise taxes, the tax levy, a couple of years to make that <clears throat> make that uh, cover the, the the cost of doing it. I just don't want to close the door. We we potentially has you know four or five million dollars here that we could allocate towards it, and without some ruling from the Wisconsin League of Municipalities or an outside entity say nope, it can't happen. It's just not going to happen. I just don't want to close the door on on the project. Thank you. So there, um, was looking at committee of the whole queue. I don't see anybody in there. So just reminding, I don't know if I need to refresh or right, something. Just but, making sure. Um, oh, I think uh, the speakers wanted to. Yeah, yes, and then yeah. Alder, yeah. Grant, yeah. Alder Grant and Alder Eck and then Alder Weary. Can I, I, I just want to clarify because um, we want to make sure that everybody understands that our proposal just, I, I'm, it's on there, but I want to make sure that we are proposing to combine stations one and three together. Um, the station one is administrative offices, and they're perfectly happy moving in with station three, which would also reduce the cost of maintaining two buildings. So I wanted to clarify that. And then second, um, we've had extensive conversations with, uh, you know, various staff and attorney Bunkert even today, um, and talking about um, flipping some of the wording on what our proposal was to help make it um, qualify specifically and so I just want to put that out there that um, we're there's things that we can do to tweak it and to make it more fitting for the other categories and to build on yep alderman uh, brunette's point so while I completely support it but kind of some examples that I think are kind of double standards gun violence reduction that how is that directly related to COVID license plate readers 
a bronze statue, sidewalk repair. The point is, is they all kind of are wishy-washy. Uh, it's because I brought the bronze. Oh, this <laughs> Yep. But one thing I want people to keep in mind too with the lost revenue aspect of it, we talk about making an impact to our city. Everybody was affected by COVID. Hours were cut, people lost jobs, people lost businesses. The city itself lost tax revenue. People weren't developing, people weren't opening businesses. So when you think about a broad span of people that this is actually affecting, it is a very big portion of our community. Our fire stations aren't restricted to streets or boundaries. So Chief Litton informed us if there's a lot of engines on the east side working on a call some from the west side will shift over in case there's another call <coughs> so it is a very community-based fire department that we have it does affect the whole city and no offense to the other projects they're all great <laughs> they are all the weary thank you mayor um alder zach and, and grant brilliant idea well put together presentation um where there's a will, there's a way. I mean, all you have to do, I just Googled here real quickly, and, and you can see around the country, other places are doing similar things. Sandy Springs uh, is using $13.9 million to build a new police headquarters. Uh, in Florida, you have uh, Armdale spending $5.8 million, <coughs> Palm River, $6.2 million. Uh, it just gives the address on Gun Highway, $6 million. And, and those are just a few I, I just barely brought up right now. So I think where there's a will, there's a way. I'm really hoping and I hope this is not true, that the red tape and hoops that are kind of being laid out are not due to the administration's uh, disdain for the idea. So I'm, I'm hoping that's not the reason. So I think it's worthy. So and I think we, well, there's a will, there's a way. Thanks. Sorry. We did um, include three firehouses in the packet that were approved under ARPA funds as well. Just a note for folks, uh, communities that have a public health department had a much higher revenue loss calculation and you can look across the street for an example <coughs> which is brown county i think their allocation was about 53 million dollars it's almost entirely revenue loss so they can allocate things incredibly flexibly communities like ours without a public health department or other divisions or departments that experienced a tremendous amount of lost revenue are just more hamstrung so just wanted to note that for folks additional questions or comments from alders yeah. alder johnson mm -hmm. um so uh, I, too, want to thank uh, the both of you for putting this presentation together. I think it's really kind of calling attention to, obviously, a, a desperate need that we have. The, um, the one thing I want to make sure of, though, is that we're having the right conversation here tonight. And I, I would hope, after seeing some of these photos, taking the tour, um, I've been through that building uh, before as well. Uh, at least from my perspective, I don't know that anybody's arguing the urgent need to do something about this facility. Um, you know, but what I do think is probably more at play right now, today, is whether or not ARPA funds is the best way to achieve that goal. Um, you know, one, one thing is, it, I think it's highly unusual actually to go through a process where you haven't done the study, we haven't done anything, you know, but we're requesting a funding amount, even though we, we don't know what that amount is. One thing I would be curious to know, Chief Litton, that, that study that I attempted to, to approve, uh, does that study, because, you know, like the facility report that we're going through right now, I would imagine, to Alder Burnett's point, that facility report's going to go through and say, hey, these are the things you have to urgently fix or you're going to have to condemn this building, right? I would think that's going to happen in that report. But the report that you're talking about that we're trying to approve, will that report give us an estimate for construction costs? Yeah, the, um, the report that we're talking about under the $25,000, again, space analysis, they'll actually lay out uh, whether they feel that a uh, single spread horizontal building would be more cost effective, whether a, a stacked building with uh, you know administration on the second floor, so to speak, um, it'll identify how many potential acres are needed based on the the analysis of how those stations operate and, and how we use them, um, and then it'll identify. Uh, I'm going to ask for five um, primary located sites within the boundaries of District Three, uh, again to be kept confidential. Um, mm -hmm. So that we can start looking at what p potential the, you know the needs are out there. Now, is it a brownfield site? Does it take re remediation? Is there houses that have to be taken down in order to accomplish these things? There's a lot of unknowns out there that we have to really you know this uh, this analysis will tell us, uh, and that's really the the starting point for getting this thing going. Um, you know, recognizing that. Let me just say this and, and get the fire department out of the middle of all this. 
uh, recognizing that I've been talking about this for four or five years now, the needs for this station, um, and it's not going away. Um, and I think that uh, under a perfect situation, there wouldn't be one alter that, alder on this uh, council that would vote against, uh, you know, getting a new facility there. You know, the fact that we're talking about using ARPA funds and, and maybe some other, you know, sources probably makes it more uh, contentious for sure, uh, from my perspective. Um, I'm asking for the analysis to be done. I'm asking for the council to be thinking about uh, in the short term here, next couple of years, um, about how they're going to rebuild that station. And I think that's a serious, uh, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a serious need. I think it's a, a fair request. Um, and, and I would just ask that the, the alders uh, consider that as they're going forward here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief. And I appreciate that insight, you know, because one of the things, of course, it, is the chair of the ad hoc facilities committee that crosses my mind or some of the other facility needs we have. And then, you know, how do we combine this one with the others, which, you know, which is more urgent? Certainly we've talked about fire department, but I know each of our other facilities has similar needs. And, and to your point, I don't feel comfortable prioritizing one or the other. We don't have any information in front of us to, to intelligently make that assessment. So, um, so to me, it seems to be a lot of wisdom. There seems to be a lot of wisdom in getting that assessment back, that report back, to tell us exactly what it's going to cost, so that we can determine um, which financial mechanisms uh, are going to be appropriate. I mean, when I look at something, when you take out a mortgage in your house, you take it out for 30 years. I don't. I mean, for a facility, I would imagine you do a 20-year bond. Uh, maybe Diana, when the time is right, can can give us a little bit more guidance on that. But my my fear, a little bit. And, and I'm open to more conversation on all these items, is that if we exhaust this bucket to hold the funding that could be bonded for, right? Just saying no to this doesn't shut the door on us at all. In fact, after this conversation, I'd be shocked if anybody shut the door in this dialogue. But my fear, though, is that we find ourselves in a precarious position where we've allocated all of the funding out of the most responsive bucket available to us. And now we're still looking at needs that are being proposed in that bucket, like the Bay Beach roof that was brought up. Can't let a roof go and repair it forever, or, or we're gonna do indefinite damage to that building. And what's gonna happen? Well, then we're gonna bond for that, right? So it's either bond for this or bond for that, or switch it around. I don't think it really matters, but I think one path allows us to be more efficient with how we proceed to achieve all of these goals. And the other, the other sort of quasi fear that I have is that we potentially find ourselves again rather than using ARPA in a short-term situation to to tackle some of these more urgent needs that we find ourselves back in that situation where we're pulling out a 10-year bond because it's only our, our only option to take care of a three-year problem and I just want to make sure that from that we're being fiscally responsible with how we address all of these needs and, and again I want to be clear I don't think anybody in this council would argue the need for a new fire department it's just how we get there fire station. what I call it the fire well, technically, <laughs> technically, we like the people. We yeah. love the people. <laughs> Thank you, Alder. Additional comments, Alder Scannell? Yeah, yeah, for me, uh, there are just too many unknowns for too much, much money to be set aside for this yet. Uh, I fully agree, you know, for years uh, we've been looking at uh, – the, the hor horrible infrastructure needs we for, for our police and fire. It's been an issue. And it, I think it's time we really start get going on it. I think COVID did kind of set us back on tackling some of that, which is unfortunate because it's long overdue. Uh, I'm going to blame the councils before us who didn't. Uh, you? Uh, no, no, before, before, <laughs> long before who uh, let this <coughs> deteriorate to such a degree. I mean, I think maybe sometimes we were uh, penny-wise and pound-foolish, but um, I, I wouldn't mind perhaps uh, setting this aside, seeing what kind of money's left, and maybe some ARPA money could be used if we could put it in a different bucket. You know, if we, if we don't have to go through all that rigmarole of justifying it, if we could come up with something else, make it much more easier, but I think for me, most of it, I, I think bonding makes more sense. Uh, we're going to have to, you know, bond for, we need to bond for our needs. And for me, this is uh, uh, years ago when we started, the, uh, before the ad hoc committee, and we had a group looking at uh, where to put a fire station and a police station and everything. Um, the talk was of bonding, you know. Uh, 
I never thought of using any other funds for something that was going to, you know, we were projecting at the time $50 million possibly. I, I think uh, our other funds need to be allocated elsewhere and our bonding needs to go to these big, big expensive expenditures. So, but if we can have some money left over and we can figure out a way to put some of that towards the fire and I think the police as well, uh, I, I, and I think that'd be great. I think it's long overdue to, to address some of these needs. But um, for our purpose here tonight, the ARPA funds, I would rather set this aside, go through everything, and then see what's left, and then see what we can do, uh, what dance we can do to maybe get some ARPA funds to some of these capital needs like that. But I really feel that, I mean, we don't know. We, ha we haven't had the inspector's report. Could it last longer? How long can it last? We don't really know. I mean, it, it looks horrid, <laughs> and I'm sure it is horrid to live through it. I really feel bad for the fire department, uh, fire personnel that have to work out of that station, and for the police who got to work out of the police department. I mean, and, and at a fire station one, uh, those aren't no picnics either. Um, so, uh, well, I just repeat myself now. So I, I'd rather set this aside for now see what we can do with our ARPA funds. And then for me, mostly I see this as probably bonding, but if we can use some ARPA funds to help this along, I'm all for that. Thank you. Thanks for your comments, Alder, Alder Campbell. Yes, thank uh, Alder Grant and Alder Eck. It was a great presentation. It, it's a great need. Uh, we could talk about parks, we could talk about infrastructure, and we could talk about a lot of things, but I find it, even with my proposal, I feel selfish to the point that that I could put a park or a roof. I mean, there's some things here. We got a deteriorating fire station. We got a deteriorating public building that we haven't used in years. And we're comparing it to something that's used every day to the safety of the citizens of the Green Bay. And I don't even think that's a fair comparison. So I'm all in favor of moving forward with this and uh, no matter how we go but I just want to clarify uh, safety over pleasure you might say uh, entertainment I think we all got to make sacrifices and we got to make hard decisions and uh, to me that's not a hard one to take safety and put it behind entertainment thank you Thanks, Alder. Uh, just before you speak for a second time Alder Hutchison um, <clears throat> I have a question um, with regard to timing of when the project needs to be done. Um, end of 26. At the end of 2026, because I've been on projects like this, um, and it takes longer than you think. And I'm wondering, what's the potential, if we don't get done with this project, uh, what happens? Like, if we're just in the throes of starting the project at the end of 2026, is there a potential we lose that money? Or? I believe there is a clawback, but I don't know if Director Allenbeck or you have any additional comments on that? No, I think just according to the Treasury guidance is that it must be obligated by the end of 2024 and that it has to be spent by 2026 and it would have to be showing that you actually paid the bill. You can't just, you know, have intentions to pay or you have bills outstanding. It, um, right now, the way the guidance would say it, it has to be paid, the payment has to be out the door. Um, by 1231 of 26 and you can't prepay either you know it really has to be if our service is completed okay so that puts it at 2025 or in the middle of 2026 so I'm thinking and by the way thank you for the presentation I was in the walkthrough we need to we need to build this building uh, the question is the finance mechanism I think there's a lot of potential things we, we may put on this that we don't necessarily have to by making a, it an ARPA funded project. Um, we need to look at that because the intentions are very good to get this building built, but there's a lot of stuff that's just, it's more than a typical project heaped up that could potentially bite us in the back. So we gotta be careful, this isn't just a project that can be done in a year. We don't even know the location yet. 
We don't know if we have to do an environmental study. We don't know if we have to do contamination review. How long is it going to take to buy the property? I mean, a month, a year? I mean, there's a lot. So I think we got to keep this ball rolling. We got to do it. We got to do it. I don't think this mechanism is the appropriate one. So, are there additional comments or questions? Alderac? Okay. Um, yeah, so you were asking about how long that would take. Um, and I know Chief Litton would be, you know, he could answer the, as far as the study, it's only like a, could be done in three months if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yes. So as far as getting the information back and having that analysis done to find out a location, I just wanted to answer that question. And just, I guess, to give a little bit of a time frame, if we, so, excuse me, Alder Scannell, but you said councils have been pushing this off, but what you're asking us to do right now is continue to push this off. So at the end of the day, I under, again, I understand the price tag, but if we were to break ground in 2023, I've never seen a construction take more than three years for something that's a fire station. Um, okay, but 2023 is not possible. That's not possible. I, I, and How I'm speaking from experience, so. There, there's no way you could, and I, it's probably going to be late 2024. That's why I'm concerned. But we don't really know that until the study right. is done, and that's why we're asking to consider holding funds even for this. Okay. Because, again, we all keep saying this is a need, this is a need, but no one's willing to talk about how we're going to get it done. And if Director um, Ellen Becker can kind of elaborate, we did talk about the finance, where we're at with debt to income ratios. What we are currently bonding, 10 million is actually a lot to ask for bonding. We will have to increase taxes to our residents who just got slammed by COVID for two years. Any additional questions or comments? It's not showing up. Alder Galvin and then Scannell. Um, Director Grenier, could you uh, give us some more uh, comments about uh, how quickly this project could take place? Well, just being brought into it tonight, um, my read on things, the the $25,000 study that was talked about originally, by the time you get meaningful results back on that study, you're looking anywhere from six to nine months out. Council will have to accept the results of that study. We'll have to go out for a consultant um, design on a station. You're probably looking anywhere from six to nine months for the consultant to design the station and prepare plans and specifications. I don't think Alder Hutchison is too far off. You're probably looking best case scenario late 24, early 25 before we'd have any kind of, and that'd be fast tracking it before you'd have bids received. Thanks, Director. Alder Galvin. Thank you, Director Grenier. That's all. Okay. Alder Scannell. Yeah, I, I do want to make the point that we should be careful about um, mixing apples and oranges here. I mean, uh, for me, this always was a bonding issue, and that those issues were less affected by COVID. I don't know why we put it on a back burner when COVID hit, because we could have kept going as far as planning. I don't know why the planning went off, got off track. It wasn't part of that. But Plan planning for what? For the police fire station and all that. I mean, right. the, the combination of stations one and three has never been contemplated in, no, a, not in, a, that, in but a formal way. There were plans. There was a group that met fairly regularly for one and the police station to get together. And then that seemed to get derailed. But anyway, uh, this is ARPA funds. And I think the, the case to be made for parks maintenance was far more directly affected by uh, COVID. The arts community was far more directly affected by COVID than our public safety as far as our infrastructure goes, which was always, for me, a bonding issue. Uh, I, know ten, I know bonding isn't, we just can't bond to the moon and back. It, you know, we're gonna have to work some things out there. I think that was part of the problem why it maybe got derailed a little bit. But that was a planning thing that got derailed. 
uh, as far as actual monies going into things the city needs to do and that affected our community, our businesses, uh, our uh, parks. Uh, that is far more directly related to COVID. So uh, I think it's just wise that um, we take care of our other issues here. If there's money left over, we can see what we can do, what dance we can do, because I think to go the path we're going is just going to be too complicated. We need to figure out a different way to use some of these funds for that, if we can get them that way. Um, but it's going to take bonding. It's going to take bonding. And we just have to start getting a nose to the grindstone and getting these studies done, getting the site plan set in place. Where are we going to put this thing? Because uh, that will affect everything, too. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do, should be doing, before we actually get to the point of funding this. So uh, uh, I, I think it's, as far as ARPA Fund's purpose, taking, addressing the di most direct items that were affected by COVID, you're going to look at parks before you look at fire stations. Can I respond to that? Certainly. Okay, just, um, just to clarify, it, it's not a matter of whether this qualifies. Other communities have built fire stations, so I, I just want to make sure that we're not um, we dismissing it because of that, because there's a lot of other projects we could sit and pick apart that are on the list. I, I don't, you know, I just don't want to get back and forth on that. It does qualify under, because other communities have done it. We've already checked into that. It's just a matter of having enough money in the particular bucket. Yeah. Those communities are not our community. There may be vast differences. They may have a uh, health and human service be responsible for that program, for that. We are not. Our municipalities are not all generic set up the same. We used to have a health and human services in the city. We then contracted with the county to take that, and, and we no longer have that. But other municipalities might. So it's much more easier for them to use these funds for that purpose. We can't just say other people are doing it, we can do it. We gotta well, know. We've already clarified, it's been but confirmed is all I'm saying. Even if we, well, there's other avenues we yeah. can check into. My point is, is it's not a hard no yet. So what we're no. asking is potentially hold off on spending these funds because it is such a big dollar amount. Let's find out for sure. Let's check with other avenues and confirm that before we make a very big decision. I would just direct Alders to the analysis and conclusion that Attorney Bungert provided, rather than just offering opinions. Um, any additional comments? Uh, Alder we've talked to her, so just Burnett, to clarify. Then Alder Stoyer, then Alder Johnson. Thank you. I, I don't want to get into a thing, but I want to respond to that. Attorney Bungert did say that we could get an opinion from the Wisconsin legal municipalities, so the ladies aren't making wild claims. I mean, let's be a little more charitable <laughs> towards them. They're not offering just opinion. They've researched this quite a bit. Thank you. Alder Stoyer. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor. Um, again, great presentation. Uh, I'm just looking at, uh, there's 15 different you know, categories or items that we're looking at under capital needs and organizational priorities. And I might direct this to Alder Johnson a little bit, you know, the way you set this initially up. You know, the fact is we're, we're going to talk about each of these items. And we, if we decide to say, look, let's, let's go this route, you know, let's just put it all there, does it even pay to talk about the other items? You know, I, I realize that we're holding off a little bit on this, but I'm just trying to get some clarification as far as, okay, let's say we decide to put the money in this bucket, per se. And then the other 13 items that we're going to be talking about in this bucket, um, what do we do? So I'm just. Alder Johnson? Yes, I would like that. I, I would not be comfortable at all voting on allocating this entire bucket without having any conversation on the other proposals. Because uh, there's obviously other proposals here that have been brought forth not only by staff but members of our, of our public. That's what I was leaning toward. Yeah. I think it's important. So all of them. Okay, any final comments on this yeah. item? Yeah. Alder Johnson, yep, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to provide maybe a point of information. Alder Scannell had alluded to it, um, and it, maybe it was a little bit confusing. It certainly was for you, maybe a little bit for me too, about uh, what passed committee, and, and it made me think of um, 
historically there was a group of individuals internally at City Hall, I believe it was comprised of some reps from the fire department, police department, and at the time the chief of staff. And that's where that $50 million you know, number came up. Um, the, the challenge that existed at that time, however, is that you didn't have some of your key players involved in those discussions, including your finance director and how to pay for such a thing. So I don't know, Alder Scandal, if that was the time you're referring to, but more to the point, I mean, that was years and years ago. That was even before I was on council. So that was five plus years ago. So it's definitely a pre-COVID thing. Um, but, but I think that was the point of the ad hoc facilities committee. And so, um, you know, the, when, when that committee was created, it intentionally required that every impacted department head be a part of that committee. And we also brought in, and you may recall this body appointed four community members at large to kind of help fill in gaps. Uh, that existed from a, from a, a skills or expertise area uh, to really kind of help rein together the complexity of things like site selection, facility needs, financing, um, assessing scope of project. And, and, uh, and even though I know that it was brought up, you know, that there's this opposition between police and fire, the hope was that maybe <laughs> that committee could act as a mediator to facilitate what's truly in the best interests of our, our residents. And it may be separate facilities is what we need, but it'd be interesting to at least look at it from a financial analysis. Um, and, and, and I think at the end of the day, again, it just boils down to me, I wanna make sure that we're having the right conversation, um, which is and it, from what I've heard from everyone here today, we need to tackle this now. And that's why that committee was created. Um, but, but Alder Hutchinson really kind of alluded to some timelines and one timeline that wasn't even uh, alluded to or discussed in, in while Grenier did sort of that really rough sketching was how long it's going to take to select the site, negotiate it, purchase it. And, and, and the last thing I'd want to do is find ourselves in a situation where we handcuff ourselves, can't get it done on time. Meanwhile, then we're going to end up bonding for this project to give us a lot of flexibility, which provides, and we're going to end up bonding for everything else that was on this list that we bypassed today. Thanks, Alder. Any other comments on this item? We are nearly three hours in, and we have not voted on a single item. Just a <laughs> it is reminder. The one, though. <laughs> yeah, just a reminder for folks. Alder Burnett for a second yeah, time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just, again, just doing research. As Alderman Weary said, where there's a will, there's a way. I can't predict the future. I don't know what this council is going to decide. But as far as the timeline goes, and it, this is North Carolina, but there's a city called Statesville, North Carolina, in 2021. Uh, they picked a location for their fire station and they um, they actually just uh, used 7.2 million of their ARPA funds to uh, build the station and they're anticipating to be operational by 2023. That's a two year period of time. Uh, you know, we put Alder, or, uh, Director Grenier on the spot a little bit, but again, where there's a will, there's a way, the resources of our city government, if we really are dedicated to this, we're all working together we're not sure if this is going to happen but i'm just saying it's possible there are other municipalities that have done it and we can pursue bonding in the spring with partial dollars from arpa we allocate some arpa funds for half of the amount and then use bonding for the other it's possible so that's what i'm saying thank you thanks Alder. <clears throat> anything final on this item all right well thanks for the presentation appreciate it uh, next one on the capital needs organizational priorities list is item five, which is related to $800,000 for Bay Beach. Yeah. Alder Johnson? Are the buttons working or not? Uh, they are not. Okay. Uh, it's a direct uh, uh, question. Oh, uh, are you going to do a presentation? I can. I, I'll wait. Sorry, I had a question for you, but I'll wait for you to present. However you want me to handle it. I can give a presentation if you'd like. Or? Yeah, I'll, I'll wait till after. Sure. Yeah, okay. go ahead, Director. Yeah, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of history about Bay Beach uh, and the financial aspect of Bay Beach and how it's funded. So prior to 2012, uh, Bay Beach was funded through the tax levy. So uh, all expenses and revenues uh, went through the levy. And uh, in 2012, we created a separate account uh, where all expenses and revenues went directly to Bay Beach. And then any extra revenues that were left over at the end of the season, we were able to reinvest back into the park. And on average uh, basis, we were able to put about 500 to 800,000 per year 
uh, to reinvest back into the park on any given year since 2012. Well, that all changed uh, once uh, the pandemic hit. So the last time we were able to invest any money back into the facility at Bay Beach was 2018. Uh, so that was the last time we put any money towards our development account. Uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, we lost a lot of revenue. Uh, and as part of the $10 million equation of lost revenue, 2.25 million of that is directly attributed to Bay Beach Amusement Park and the loss of revenues at the park itself. And so I put together a proposal uh, that uh, reinvest that money back into the park uh, to help get us back on track financially uh, so that we can start reinvesting back into the facility. Uh, so our proposal is actually, uh, it's, it's two proposals in front of you. So the item that I'm talking about right now is for two new rides for $800,000. There's a second proposal later on for roughly 1.4 million, which are other improvements to the park. So. I work very closely with the Friends of Bay Beach to, and staff to select uh, which projects we felt were uh, the best projects moving forward to get us back on track financially. Uh, so to give you an example for this uh, $800,000 for the two rides, uh, we recently had two rides that uh, were removed from the park, which had a big impact to loss of revenue in addition to the pandemic. Uh, so. Um, we, we estimate that uh, one of the rides, the Falling Star, we lose uh, $120,000 a year in revenue uh, by that ride being down. And then the Bay Beast uh, also is down and has been for the past year. And we estimate a loss of about $100,000 in revenue from that. And so what we're trying to do with this uh, proposal to replace these two rides is get that revenue source back into the system here so that we can continue to reinvest into the park into the future. Because one thing we don't want to do is get to the point where we can't pay our own bills and we have to then either bond for improvements or you know, look to taxpayers to, to help pay for um, future improvements. So, uh, so we really are, we're trying to get back to uh, where we need to be financially. So as you may recall, uh, the Friends of Bay Beach uh, recently donated a ride uh, to replace the Bay Beast uh, ride. And so that was great. That was one of the two rides that's already taken care of financially. Uh, we're still asking for $800,000 because the Falling Star ride is a much bigger ride. And so it's more expensive to, to purchase a replacement ride. So we actually uh, just came across a, a used ride that is for sale right now. Uh, the purchase price for that is $775,000. Uh, that ride has been on the market for about two months, and the manufacturer who owns that ride currently has been nice enough to, to hold on, on just selling. They're putting that ride on hold for the city of Green Bay, so it's not for sale for the open market yet. Uh, and they're willing to work with us. They really like Bay Beach Amusement Park. They like the fact that we, it's very economical uh, and we're really out there to service the public, not to make a huge profit. So, but then again, they are a business. Uh, so what they've told us is, you know, they've been holding the ride for us for about two months, uh, waiting for some decisions on the ARPA funding, uh, whether or not this would be funded. Uh, and they're to the point now where Hopefully, well, what I'm requesting is a decision is made today for the purchase or for the funding for this, uh, these two rides uh, for the 800,000. Uh, and if the council approves the funding tonight, they'll continue to hold that ride until the final council approval in about three weeks. Uh, but if the council decides tonight not to approve the funding for the $800,000, uh, then they plan on putting it on the open market. And the ride is a very good deal. Uh, it's normally a $1.4 million ride. Uh, it's for sale right now for $775,000, and it's only three years old. So it's a very new ride. As you know, when we purchase rides for Bay Beach Amusement Park, we always look for used rides because it's so much cheaper than buying them new. Uh, and 
this is such a great deal considering the, the age of the ride is only three years old. Typically when we buy used rides, they're 20 plus years old. And so the, in fact, you've seen that recently where a few rides that we purchased just haven't lasted as long as we had wanted, such as the Bay Beast and the Falling Star. Uh, so if we can find great deals on, on fairly new rides, um, it, it, we should try to take advantage of that when at all possible. So in essence, what I'm asking for, like I said uh, prior to this, is I'm seeking approval tonight uh, for the funding for $800,000 in ARPA funding. I know that that's a tough decision based on the last discussion we had. Um, but we would also have another request uh, for roughly $1.4 million for other Bay Beach funding. That funding is not pressing and we wouldn't need a decision tonight necessarily for the second uh, grant funded request, but um, this one's out there today. So, All right. Questions on this particular item, Alder Stoyer, then Alder Burnett? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, thanks, Dan, for, for that. The talk on this. Um, I, I guess the question I had is uh, with this ride, you know, it would be a good deal per se, but I'm just wondering uh, what kind of projected revenues are you looking at from this ride over a period of time and how long would it take to pay for itself? You know, I think one of the things that we got to look at is, as a city is the amount of revenues that we bring in. We're normally service orientated. We don't have a whole lot of opportunities to bring in money. Mm -hmm. so. That, that's what I'm interested in hearing about. Yeah, and so we're projecting that this ride, uh, this new replacement ride, would, would bring in about $170,000 a year in revenue, and it would pay for itself in five to six years. Uh, so that's our estimate. Uh, one thing that you should all be aware of, and you probably already are, is not only did we get hit uh, with the pandemic and the drastic loss of revenue, which directly impacted how much we can reinvest back into the park, um, but we got hit with a lot of other things on top of that. So we have a staffing shortage. And so that took a hit on us economically too because we had to shorten our hours. Uh, so right now our revenues are considerably lower this year than they were last year. And so you know, the sooner we can reinvest back into the park to get some of these um, large revenue generating rides and other improvements back into play, the sooner we can recover from uh, the damage uh, economically. So do you feel that with these rides and a few other things that we can't get to that sooner than later? It'll help, yes, definitely. Yeah, especially, you know, like I said, this ride is projected to bring in 170000 a year just for this one ride. Right. Thanks, Thank Alder Burnett. Uh, Director Ditch, I thank you for, for that. Um, I think you had mentioned you wanted to discuss something with me. It was this project, I imagine. Okay, sorry, yeah. we couldn't make that connection. So obviously, uh, I'm in support. I mean, this one makes sense to me because COVID, the, the issues at Bay Beach were directly affected due to COVID. I remember two years ago going there, having like every other car get wiped down between rides and it was obvious and and there's something worse than a family going to bay beach and knowing that it has to close early i mean it's directly affected them throw the staffing issues on top of it um you you've weathered a lot out there uh i guess my my concern is when you see something for sale that's quite a bit less than what you're saying it's worth well, is there a catch here is it is it gonna, is it i mean i'm not trying to say you're getting something that's not safe but there are some rides that work basically shut down because they prove not to be safe according to the manufacturer is that an issue here like a couple of years from now is there a possibility like are you forecasting that part out i just don't want to get any bad surprises a couple of years down the road here yeah obviously i can't predict how long a ride would last but uh, it's pretty rare when a, a ride doesn't last 10 20 years before it needs replacement as i mentioned this one's three years old and actually was only in service for two years. Uh, this is a brand new ride that was just uh, created about three years ago. And the first year, uh, the ride that we're actually purchasing, it was their first model that they built. And so they used it as a traveling model at, uh, at amusement park conventions. So they would set it up in the convention center, let people ride it at the conventions, and that's what they did with it for the first year. 
the next two years it was in, in a location where it wasn't really an amusement park. It was a smaller venue and they just uh, didn't have the maintenance staff that this ride demands. We have the maintenance staff. Uh, they're highly skilled with rides of this caliper. They know what to do. They know what to expect. Uh, the ride um, was actually sold back to the manufacturer that created it uh, and they are uh, inspecting it right now as we speak. So they dismantled it, they're inspecting it, they're replacing anything that's worn. Uh, and then as part of the, uh, of the purchase price, they're actually going to send somebody uh, to the city uh, for five days to help us install the ride and then train us in maintenance and operation of that ride. So it is considerably cheaper, but it's kind of, you can compare it to a car. Uh, when you drive a car off the lot, it loses a lot of value right off the bat. What would be the cost of operating? I know you said the revenue is 170. What would, what's the cost to operate? Have you kind of looked at that? Well, as far as we, we would need uh, either one to two override operators to actually operate that ride. Uh, but then we would add it to our general maintenance um, uh, daily routine so we would have to inspect it on a daily basis just like we would every other ride uh, the manufacturer also recommends um, replacing certain parts on a regular basis so we would build that into our into our budget accordingly you would anticipate then a profit I can't imagine it would cost more than a hundred and seventy thousand dollars to operate yearly so immediately yeah. paid for ARPA federal funds we're turning a profit immediately immediately and this ride would be available uh, and could be delivered if we do purchase this ride uh, it would be delivered in April of next year and we would have it in service um, next season okay did Elvis was this Elvis is one of his favorite rides or anything it is publicity not, no. there <laughs> okay no. Priscilla. Oh, Priscilla okay thank you uh, one final question uh, with the um, decision that this council made at the last meeting not pursuing the peer uh, is there some flexibility there using those funds, budgeted, bonded money to purchase the, or making the upgrades to the roof and that sort of thing with the other project? I, well, I'll be giving a, a presentation on that at one of the next parks committee, uh, but we still plan on moving ahead with, with that project with the phasing plan as, as laid out, which is phase one is the, the pier the shoreline um, walkway and the stormwater management. It's just the pier came in over budget. Okay. So we're gonna re-engineer it uh, and then rebid it for construction for next year. Fair enough, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, so my cue started working all of a sudden. Um, Alder Stoyer or Alder Johnson, are you still? Alder Johnson? Dan, you, you kind of said this, but I just kind of want to uh, reiterate it. Um, so you had, 2.25 million dollars of losses from Bay Beach during COVID. That's correct. Right, and that 2.25 million, then when we look at that 10 million dollars that we have with the greatest flexibility that was revenue loss, 2.25 million of that is from Bay Beach. Yes, that was part of the 10 million dollar uh, calculation. Okay, so if not for Bay Beach, we would have been talking about 7.75 million in that bucket. In that bucket, yes. Which would leave us with a balance in theory of 3.35 million because 5.6 remains unallocated. I'm just trying to put some context to that, that, you know, 20%, more than 20% of that bucket was driven by losses from Bay Beach. That would be accurate. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So other, other questions or comments on this item? Alder Act? It's not. Uh, no. Committee of the whole. The overarching. Oh, okay. Item E. Um, so, uh, a question um, and I know you know I'm on the park committee so I know there's been an issue with staffing and having to go lower hours um, and then having to close down one of the the pools and not having parkies for all of the parks um, so my concern and I love Bay Beach just want to say that um, my concern is being able to staff the ride as you know, we have, we've had to lower our hours because we don't have enough staff. If we could extend our hours, we could increase our revenue, but we need the staff. So you understand, like I'm just yeah. concerned about staffing it. Yeah, that's a valid concern and we'll be addressing that in our 2023 budget. And our intention is to uh, give the ride operators a, a raise in our 2023 budget. 
Uh, and again, like I mentioned previously, uh, Bay Beach has its own separate account. So giving the ride operators a raise would have no impact on the general levy or the general budget. It would just be a kind of a loss of the bottom dollar of revenues for the year out there. Okay. Um, and okay, I'm not really trying to be funny, but um, it seems like this would be neighborhood enhancement as well. Because it's under the capital needs and organization category. Just putting that out there. Okay. Other comments on this item or questions? Okay. Elder Grant. I'd, in the past, what have rides on average cost us? Are you are you referring to the purchase of the rides? Yes, I apologize. Sorry, the purchase. Um, I don't have that in front of me. I'll, I'll tell you that you know the the zip and pip and roller coaster costs roughly three point two million, if my memory serves me right. Uh, several of our last projects uh, were donated rides from the friends of Bay Beach, so I don't have the the dollars uh, they negotiated those purchases. Uh, that would be for the Sea Dragon, the Falling Star, the Bay Beast. Um, Jason, do you remember how much the tugboat ride cost? Uh, the tugboat was about 200 grand. So that small little tugboat ride that just goes like this and turns, that was 200000 uh to purchase that one. Okay. And I apologize because my old boss is here. Sorry, Jason. Um, but Bay Beach was my summer job in college, so I do greatly enjoy the park. But knowing our old staffing schedule a very long time ago, we experienced rides weren't open then too. And I know we talked about this. Um, but back then there was two shifts. There was a six hour shift in the morning and an afternoon shift of six hours. And then a seven hour shift of breaks or relievers, we called them. So you had three shifts. The park has had such a reduction of staff. It is actually down to practically two shifts, one eight hour to do the rides. And I'm guessing there's break people involved somehow. Mm -hmm. um, I know you mentioned increasing wages, but my big concern is staffing this ride at the amount that it's costing us, only because that you're not the only one experiencing staffing issues. Mm -hmm. There's places paying $15 an hour. So I'm worried that even with the $2 raise that we may not necessarily get the staffing and then we just we put quite a bit of money towards a ride that just input and that's a valid concern I will tell you that whenever we get a new ride that's usually our, our highest uh, revenue uh, generating ride so this one we would definitely staff first and foremost over our other rides uh, would that have an effect with uh, with a ride that doesn't make as much revenue there's a potential if we don't have the staffing uh, needs or the staffing uh, in place for next year that could happen uh, but this ride would, would bring in more revenue than some of the other rides would. All right, any other questions or comments on this? Alder Campbell. Dan, Bay Beach as a whole, I mean, I remember when we started this process, the original request was 2.25 or 2.5 million. Have you reworked this now? Has this ride added to that or is the roof and the pavilion something that can gain revenue all year round maybe a comparison to the expenditure of this ride and what it can do for bay beach overall i mean yep. if we can share it around a little bit i guess and everyone gives a little we can get a little but return on investment as far as bringing beach dances back to bay beach and and restoring a public historical building, which I don't, I have never heard that there can't be money out there for a historic grant of some sort. I, I've heard no suggestion of that to work this into the project. Um, it's a great facility. We could do weddings. We could do a lot of things. Um, it, it's a lot of money. You know, we got rid of the pier. Um, it's a great, it's a great business for the Green Bay. And you know, where can you ride a roller coaster for a dollar? Um, but I just find we got to <coughs> kind of try to balance our needs there at Bay Beach. And I think something that's all year round would take precedence <coughs> on just a good deal on a ride. Thank you. All right. 
Any other comments on that? If not, since you're up there, Dan, maybe a good segue just to address the pavilion. Um, that's sure. item 32, I think. Yeah, that's item 32. We can talk about that next. As you mentioned, uh, we did our re total request is 2.25 million. 800,000 is for the rides, and it would be 1.45 million uh, would be the other portion of it. And so that would be broken down into several different categories. And what we're looking at doing is when we created the master plan for Bay Beach Amusement Park, we had a lot of public input. And one of the largest um, requests that we had throughout that process is let's try to make Bay Beach a, a year-round facility uh, instead of just a seasonal facility. And so uh, the second grant really puts us in that direction to make it a year-round facility. This would be phase one renovations based mainly to the pavilion. Uh, which would set us up for doing more work to the pavilion at later phases. So first phase would be uh, 400000 to replace the roof. Uh, currently those shingles on that roof is, is at least 30 years old. Uh, there's significant leaks in, those, in the roof and we cannot repair them more than we've done already. It's hit its maximum lifespan. And as I mentioned to you uh, recently, we haven't been able to uh, put any money into our development account because of the pandemic and, and what that's done to us financially. So, you know, it might, it would take a few more years for us to, to generate any revenue at all to reinvest into any of these things that I'm mentioning now. So the first part is 400,000 to replace the roof. Uh, the second part of that is 500,000 to winterize the main pavilion. So that's the big white building in the middle. When I say winterize, what that would look like is to insulate all of the pipes and then to create uh, central heat and central air uh, throughout the entire building. Right now it's a seasonal facility. We shut the water down in the winter. We drain all of the pipes. Nothing is insulated. Uh, and we just have minimal heat in the main office and the rest of the building has no heat at all. Uh, so there is no way that we can open that building up year round at this point without doing central heat. And also for central air, that's a, if you're doing central heat, it's a minimal cost to provide air. Uh, that's one of the biggest problems we have in the summer months when we're open is that that building is not um, comfortable uh, when it's hot and humid. So you go into the restaurant, it's still hot and humid in there. There's not a lot of air circulation. In addition, we have a dance hall, uh, which is the east wing of the building. Again, that, there's no heat or air conditioning in that. So although people are renting that, uh, we're really not charging as much as we could if that were a, a heated air conditioned facility uh, because you know, right now people are just looking for a big space that's fairly inexpensive and that's what they're getting there. So by, by doing this improvement of uh, winterizing it, we can not only generate revenue year round, but we're also going to attract more people because it's gonna be a more comfortable setting for them. And we can also uh, likely charge a little bit more rent uh, for that facility with uh, another portion here. So we also have $500,000 in here for additional renovations to the dance hall. Uh, and so this is where we're, we would be upgrading our facilities. Uh, maybe it's uh, replacing the windows or the dance floor or the audio visual. Uh, we really haven't set uh, the parameters of what we would use that funding for necessarily. But really what the plan is, is to really create a better user experience so that we can charge more in, in rent and really make it a more desirable uh, facility year round where people would be excited about renting that instead of just finding a, a great deal. And so that would be the bulk of the funding. That comes out to 1.4 million. Uh, the other 50,000 would be for energy upgrades. And what we're proposing there is in our train storage facility, uh, which is that, that building, it looks like a warehouse behind the Zip and Pippin. Uh, currently, that's a seasonal facility. Uh, we would like to turn that into a, um, a winter maintenance facility also. So in order to do that, we have to put a heater in there and heat that building. 
And there really is no good way of doing that currently. Uh, we did some cost estimates and it'll cost $15,000 to run a gas line out to that building. Uh, so what we're proposing to do is to actually put solar panels on the roof of that building and that would power the, the new heat, the new furnace in there so that it could be a year-round facility, maintenance facility. Uh, but then more importantly in the summer months those uh, solar panels would also power uh, the rides such as the Sea Dragon, it would power some lights that we just put up along the shoreline. Uh, so it powers other things in the parks too. So. Uh, that's what that other fifty thousand dollars would be for. It'd be for solar panels and for heating. Okay. Thanks, Director. Um, questions on those items, Alder Galvin. Uh, Director, have you worked out um, what you think you could be charging for that facility if it's uh, everything is done and someone wants to rent it uh, for a wedding? Uh, we haven't calculated that out yet, but I will tell you that we are charging four hundred dollars a day to rent that facility. And just by comparison, uh, if you take a look at the new facility we built at the Wildlife Sanctuary, uh, we charge $1,200 a day Monday through, or Sunday through Thursday, $1,300 for Friday, and $1,600 for Saturday. And we are getting rentals on that. So now I don't think it'll be that high. Uh, I would see us somewhere in between $400 and and twelve hundred dollars but we haven't calculated it out yet a lot of it depends on what amenities we put in there and how attractive is it you know how much cosmetically can we do to that facility when you go in there now you know it doesn't look much different than it did in the 40s and 50s to tell you the truth it's the same dance floor it's the same audio visual same painting um, everything's the same as it was back in the day it, it really needs an upgrade and and this is where like I said this is phase one of a multi-phase renovation project so you know you mentioned potential of, of other grants uh, for doing historic preservation uh, to this building this is only phase one just to get us the basics we need so that we can look at doing more so we would like to renovate the the west end of that facility also in the future and that's when we can look at you know finding grants to do that and look elsewhere for funding for that okay. Alder well, grant are you uh, I'm, I'm sorry Alder yeah, I got, I, yep. a couple more um, so during the summer you'd only be able to rent it out after the park would be closed we currently rent it when we're open to and you know so people do have parties in there and and other events when the park is open to the public is that the east end that you're talking about the yes, dance hall it's, it's okay. the dance hall and then what do you think added extra costs like uh, employee personnel i mean plowing the parking lot during the winter so people can use it uh, opening it up shutting it down having people there at night to close up things like that yeah and that is it, it will add some more maintenance obviously uh, but just keep in mind that you know we do have three full-time staff members uh, who primarily work out of Bay Beach and Triangle Hill, uh, so they'll be able to do a lot of that work also. Uh, and we do have uh, full-time maintenance staff working out at Bay Beach uh, throughout the entire year. So that's all built into our, our budget for Bay Beach. So there will be a little bit more. Obviously, we'll have to have some, a, a cleaning staff brought in. Uh, and we should be able to do that with the funding, the additional revenues that we receive uh, from the rentals. That will pay for uh, the additional cleaning services and setup services. That's how we're handling it out at the sanctuary. All right, thank you. Yep. Thanks. Alder Grant? I kind of have a question for um, Attorney Hungert on this. In regards to this proposal and the previous one, Bay Beach is a city of Green Bay entity. Employees of it are city employees. Could this qualify, and the previous one, to providing government services to the extent of revenue loss due to the pandemic? That's what it's in. Yeah. It's in revenue. No, it's in capital needs. That's what revenue loss is. That's the revenue loss bucket. So the city survey, the city category of the capital is revenue loss under our bucket. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I just I asked things. you in an email, and yeah, that wasn't clarified, so that's why I wasn't sure if it was so five it, categories. In, right. In the memo, I, I said specifically so that it, it, okay. number one, capital needs and organization priorities, parentheses, revenue loss, because that we've been using that term so frequently, so okay. I connected those two together so it was clear. Okay. 
All right. Um, a bunch of people still in the queue. I don't see anybody that wants to speak, though. So just make sure your button's not pushed. Alder Stoyer. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks again, Dan, for the presentation. Uh, I think it's no small secret that Bay Beach is pivotal in the lexicon of Green Bay and Green Bay history. We have the Packers, we've got Bay Beach, we have a number of things, but Bay Beach is right up there. So, um, And I do appreciate the fact that you know you, you clarify the 2.25 million of loss. Uh, it's very acute that we see. Um, I guess one of the questions I had is uh, if, if you have, you know, the hall set up, you know, the, you know, you, you already have the wildlife sanctuary with, with events, but also at the pavilion that you would be having events too. Do you see any conflict at all in that or would that be kind of a separate, separate topic? I wouldn't see any conflicts. They're kind of two different venues with two different price points. Like I said, um, at the sanctuary, that's kind of the high-end price point uh, for venues uh, that has its own separate caterers, kitchen. This is not the same type of event, so this would be some catered to a different market. Now, is any of this very time sensitive? Of course, you said the you know the you know the roof needs repair and stuff. I mean, uh, that sounds time sensitive to me. But is there anything here that would talk about maybe? Um, combination of ARPA and bonding as well? Have you looked at other alternatives as far as funding? Uh, I, I guess the only thing with bonding that I would just caution on is we're, we, we don't really want to bond too much for Bay Beach uh, because, or at least I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, that's because right now uh, Bay Beach is paying off all of the bond payments. Right. Uh, and right now we're, we're still struggling to refinance the bond package for the, for the shoreline project. And I wouldn't recommend tackling another bonding right. uh, on top of that one until we get that one paid off and rectified. Um, and, and I don't think there'd be any desire to put that bonding for Bay Beach Amusement Park on the taxpayers. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm generally in favor of this project, so we'll see how, how the vote goes. Thank you. Great. Any other comments? Alder Weary. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, thanks, Director Ditchite. Um, excellent presentation. Within the, the presentation, it sounds like it really is broken down into a couple things. So we could do some of them. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. We're, correct? You know, there's the upgrade, energy upgrades, 50,000. The roof is 400,000. You could opt to do just those. Um, winterizing is another half million. And then you have a half million for renovations and hire an architect to determine what to do with it. Um, have you ever thought about maybe just doing the architect to determine the options and then coming back later with how much those options would be? That would be a way to potentially trim that 500,000 down. I don't know how much an architect would be. You know, you've, you've done these projects. 100,000? I, I, we haven't quoted it out. I mean, that would be the council's yeah. uh, directives if they wanted to pick apart, uh, you know, pieces or elements of the grant. Um, I guess that would be an approach that we could look at. My only concern would be, um, obviously, the finding the funding to actually implement it then. Right. Uh, is the other issue because you know I just discussed you know the whole bonding yeah. uh, concern and then the financial concerns we are with our you know just our revenues out there due to the pandemic and now the staffing shortages. So I, I appreciate it. I'm just looking for a way later yep. when we're meshing it all together if we have to give and take a little right. bit where we might do it. But I, I would say that the highest priority right now would be the two rides. Uh, or in, in this case, the one ride, just because uh, you know, if we, if you are considering funding that, uh, it would. This is a great opportunity to purchase that ride right now, um, and then the the roof replacement uh, would be the next highest priority, definitely, because that one does need to be replaced very soon. Uh, but I will, you know, I would like to just add there that you know, as we selected projects, you know, I, I think all of these projects, like like every other project on the list uh, are, are real needs uh, for the parks department and the park as a whole. So, But you have a lot of tough decisions to make. There's a lot of good projects to choose from. So I appreciate it, Dan. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. Older Grant. I, I, um, one more question, Attorney Bunger. Is there a reason the ride proposal is not in the arts, culture, and tourism category? I know, Mr. Ditchite, you didn't know that, but is there any clarification as to why that's in loss of revenue versus arts, 
culture and tourism. I didn't do an analysis. Microphone. Um, I haven't reviewed the proposal, so I don't know why it went into lost revenue specifically versus if it qualified for a different category. Could you see it qualifying for that category with tourism being a big piece of that? We do draw a lot of people here. I'm seeing a head nod from um, our ARPA expert, <laughs> Susan House. Um, Ms. House. Um, good evening. It would fit into the, it could fit into the tourism category as well. It did get placed in the revenue replacement um, organizational priorities category because of the revenue loss of Bay Beach. So that is why it was placed in that category. But ultimately, if we can get funds to Bay Beach under a different category and accomplish the same thing, isn't that an option? Potentially, I mean, you have you have to make the argument <clears throat> that's laid out in federal rule, which is 550 mm -hmm. pages long. So it's a possibility, but you have to be confident that you'll be able to make that argument. Okay, I just saw the word tourism and it made sense. All right, any other questions or comments? I'll direct. And, and, and mine is right along with the same um, question. It, the, for us, the roof, um, I just, I'm looking at the different categories and I think maybe small business for the roof of the the pavilion, that project. I don't know what qualifies for small business, but I'm just looking at the amounts in there and wondering if it would be um, something that would qualify. Okay, any other comments or questions? All right, thank you, Director. Uh, next up is item 17, which is a request by Alder Weary. Um, I think the recommendation is referral on this one. Yeah, Alder Weary, go ahead. Um, this one we can actually just receive and place in file. I, I talked a couple uh, late last week with the uh, DA, and they had also requested money from the county, which was approved. So while he would love more money, his needs are being met with what he received. So okay. it was well-intentioned, but they have what they need. So okay. there's one we don't need. Very good. Thanks, Alder. Uh, next up is item 18, which is an old one and doesn't have any dollars associated with it. Um, there was money that was sent to each uh, of the business improvement districts in the city of Green Bay, um, partially because of this request that came in actually from our old council. So Alder Story was part of that, Alder Vanderleest. Um, so I don't know if you have any comments on that, Alder. Well, that has been a while. I think it was one of the first things that we put in, and I think it was just more a general uh, fact that we thought the bids would be hurting and they would they would need some monies for whatever they'd like to do. And actually, I'd like to ask Alder Johnson, you know, if after you looked at this, if you felt, you know, being part of a bid, you know, there might be some other funding sources out there in that. And, you know, we, we, we put this in over a year and a half ago, so. Alder? I'd be a fool to say, <laughs> no, we don't want any more yeah. money. But well, uh, And obviously, if something ever came to a vote, I, I would abstain from it. But practically speaking, and, and I'm only speaking for the organization that I work for, and I don't intend to speak for Military right. Avenue or Downtown or Old Main, but we have brought forward a couple of projects that were intended to be handled separately, and I don't think it's necessary to consider another just allocation for the sake of allocating. I would rather have the projects we've proposed be considered um, right. and, and let this, this one, much like Alder Weary, I would much like see this one just receive in place and file. I, I'll throw that around. Okay. Thank you, Alder. On to item 19. Um, this is related to a million dollars to be used uh, for project 7-6-212 strategic vacant parcels project. Um, I think the recommendation is referral on this one and this is Alder Johnson. Yeah. I, and in fact, if I recall, I think when I submitted this one, I think I submitted it under the affordable housing and small business support. So if it, I don't know if there's a reason perhaps that it got moved, but uh, essentially from the from the very beginning, um, and I had this conversation uh, with uh, Assistant Director Cheryl when you were awake earlier today, from the very beginning, I've been an advocate of trying to find ways to leverage ARPA dollars, meaning that if you can invest a dollar here and get $10 out, uh, that seems to be a really good thing for our community. Um, and the intent of this was to strategically acquire parcels of land that could be poised for development for things like affordable housing, uh, industrial uses, 
um, could have temporary uses such as uh, you know parking lots and high density areas um, you know one of the things that um, oftentimes if you work with developers who of course big build buildings and add significant amount to our tax base which allows us to pay for other things throughout our community one of the biggest impediments to any type of development agreement is site control and if you have site control that process is so much more seamless and allows you to get buildings in the ground faster and so the intent of this was uh, to not only I kind of highlighted three categories but really it would be citywide but areas where I could see would have high intensity need for something like this would be any commercial corridor uh, obviously your downtown area which has your highest use per acreage uh, and industrial parks where where obviously industrial facilities come in and build you know 50 hundred million dollar buildings so so that was really the intent behind it okay thanks for that and just uh, just a point on I'm not sure exactly how how it was categorized kind of on the back end of things um, but if this were to be put in a different category we would have to be more cognizant of what the eligible census track mm -hmm. map looks like um, so that might kind of dictate things a little bit yeah and again I, I just kind of offered it up I, I really I, I, as long as it's considered in which category isn't as is, is important to me personally I'd obviously just love to see the merits of the idea stack up against any other proposal yep. um, so I, I'm fine with that okay thanks Alder any questions for the Alder on this one um, all right we'll move along to 28 which is well, out of the same category obviously 79,411 to be used for project 9-2-015 uh, Spanish translator limited term employee I believe this came from um, director Ellen Becker your, your department um, Clerk Jeffries, I believe, submitted that. So, Director Ellen Becker? Um, yes, that is correct. Um, um, there, I'm going to have to go to the exact page, but it is a roughly $79,000 um, request for um, to be able to translate um, documents over a period of time. I think um, I'm going to go to the page. I think that 79411 is an annual request. For how many? Three years? Or? For up to three years. So if you were to consider it, um, um, I believe um, our clerk believes that there's enough work for in different um, documents that need to be translated that it could take more than a year. So that way it was 79411 annually, and it could take up to three years. Um, so that was her request. Okay, got it. Questions for Director Ellen Becker? All right. So we'll move along to 29. This one is related to chamber hybrid meeting need upgrades here for um, City Council Chambers. Uh, Director Honick, there you are. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, much of the equipment in this room is uh, uh, over 10 years old. Some is 20 years old. Uh, if the controller went on on the equipment right now, there's an 18-month backlog on it. So we'd like to get in the queue to probably replace a lot of the equipment in the room, upgrade the cameras, microphones, things like that. Great. Questions for Director Hronick? <laughs> Seeing none, on to item 30. No. <clears throat> mm, yes. So this is $500,000 for city data, City Hall Data Center Replacement Project. This would include the City Hall uh, data center and the disaster recovery site at Fire Station 4. Uh, we implemented uh, our last uh, uh, replacement in the end of uh, 2019. Uh, we have a five-year maintenance program on that, so that means that the, by the end of uh, 2024 that uh, we will have a replacement. So this uh, will just provide us some funding to replace uh, both sites plus some interior uh, data closets inside of a uh, city hall okay. questions on that item on to 31 I think this is eighty thousand dollars for a city hall scanning project we could start with uh, yeah deputy <coughs> director Rainier wig go ahead so the city of Green Bay has a file like this for every property in the city of Green Bay um, they've been used for 50 plus years and whenever you had anything permits or invoices they're put into this hard copy file those files are located on the fourth floor there are 54 four cabinet file cabinets that are located on the fourth floor with all of these cards in them 
So our request is that we would like to scan these documents. So when we first hit COVID, um, staff in our department went through all these files and pulled all the staples and the paper clips and all that horrible work. So these files are prepped and ready to be scanned, right? Which that, that was part of the cost. So we brought the cost down to get this scanning project. These files are used by us, DPW, assessors, law departments, staff have to go down to four, dig them out, right? If we scan them, we put them all into Eclipse. So if we ever go back down into COVID again, all of our staff will have access to these files. So we have 80,000 as an estimate. We think that might be a little high. So we, we, um, we've been slowly, slowly scanning them ourselves when we get a permit in. We'll scan that file and like get rid of it. So it will take us a decade to do that though that way. So the request is, I, I know it's not sexy, but it would be really efficient if we could scan all these files. Yeah, and I apologize. Did you mention how much square footage approximately these are these are taking up right now? Oh, I don't know. It's half of the fourth floor. <laughs> yeah. Um, on one side. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot of space that could be used by either city staff or rented mm -hmm. out or whatever if we got rid of these files. But okay. okay. Question. If you ever want to uh, tour a fourth floor, I'll just get it. <laughs> it's a storage floor. Any questions for Deputy Director Nearwick, Alder Galvin? I, I would say that this is something we should really look at. Um, when the police department was running into a records problem, they, they literally spent thousands upon thousands of dollars trying to find different newfangled ways of storing paper um, with movable walls and everything else. The end result was they, <coughs> they, they, they scanned everything in. They hired some girls in the, uh, during the summer, sat in records, and that's all they did was scan stuff till their brains about blood out of their ears. <laughs> but uh, it was well worth it, and the amount of space that it opened up was uh, put to good use. Mm -hmm. So I think this is something we should really look at. Okay, great. Other thoughts? Alder Shore? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Cheryl, I think this is, I, I feel it's an important project. Um, I worked, used to work up in that office years ago, and so many paper, uh, items up there that need to be looked at and I think the fact is that many times as alders we we try to contact uh, inspectors and try to talk about different things and many times you know there's a time lapse sometimes I think if they had all these records scanned they, they could get the information out to us a lot quicker so I, I think it's I think it's an important project thank you Absolutely. And, and just on that point I guess the accessibility of the documents director chronic could you just speak to where they might end up or how accessible they could they could be ultimately? Well, they would end up in our open data portal. You type in an address, you type in a parcel number, and that scanned document would show up readily in our open data portal. Right. Everybody would have access to that. Cool. All right. Any other comments or questions on that item? Seeing none, on to 33, which is $300,000 for Project 93-202 Comprehensive Plan Updates. Director Sex Schulte. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is an item, uh, two key factors, I guess, with this one are number one, our current plan is 20 years old, uh, which is obviously not a good policy making document at this point for land use decisions. We've certainly been making efforts to update them on a case by case basis, but uh, we are certainly behind in terms of making a, a kind of a, a comprehensive no pun intended, uh, update to the document to kind of reflect current conditions. Uh, this is also a requirement by state statute. We are under actually required in order to uh, basically enforce our, uh, our zoning ordinances, our subdivision ordinances, our other land use ordinances must be consistent with this document. So uh, we are definitely behind in terms of making that happen. There are certainly plenty of ties to, uh, I think, pandemic conditions in terms of kind of reflecting new land uses, new policies, certainly related to our housing, related to making more flexibility for some of our commercial districts. Uh, you know, making some revisions to those things are definitely needing to be looked at. Uh, right now, staff's certainly looking at things with the housing market in terms of uh, accessory dwelling units, uh, lot sizes, other other very regulatory things that generally should come out of uh, a policy document such as this this document here. Um, essentially, we this will be looking to uh, pay for primarily for a consultant to help prepare the actual plan document. Staff would probably continue to to facilitate more, the majority of the public engagement 
process of this budget, certainly with the assistance of that. But more importantly, I think actually allow uh, some of that budget to actually require some implementation, uh, some review of some of our other ordinances and things that would actually help us implement the specific, uh, hopefully, items that would come out of this particular process. Okay. Great so questions. Certainly available for any questions on that. Questions for our director? Seeing none, we will move along to 34 which is $210,000 for Project 6-6-202 Cybersecurity Project. Director Honick. Uh, <clears throat> we've been directed by the, um, the insurance industry to uh, uh, <clears throat> better implement some uh, cybersecurity policies. Uh, uh, a couple of them are which are uh, uh, employee cybersecurity training, which is ongoing right now, multi-factor authentication, which uh, means you're, you'll have to uh, uh, put in a code on your phone to get in access to uh, a city a city computer uh, endpoint detection and response managed detection and response uh, off-site data storage uh, so there's like four projects uh, and schedule a penetration test there's like four or five projects that we have to do through this course uh, for the use of this money <clears throat> great thanks director any comments or questions about that all right, on to 35, $75,000 for urban design consultant. I'm trying to remember if that was, is that a downtown Inc. request or is that? This was from actually you? staff. Okay, go ahead, Neil. Um, obviously, this is an element that could be considered in, in kind of conjunction, probably should be coordinated with either the comprehensive plan element or possibly the, the, the downtown uh, urban design uh, consultant on that one. Uh, this was brought forward originally to kind of address. Um, certainly the existence of several downtown planning efforts uh, that are somewhat dated and just need to be updated in some of our conversations with certainly on Broadway and, and DGBI and, and other folks uh, there are certainly some areas that need to be updated certainly to provide policy direction not only to my department but as well as uh, other infrastructure improvements we may be looking to make in the particular area to provide kind of current guidance in those particular areas uh, I, I, however, staff does say that this, this can be probably coordinated in some degree with some of the other elements and does not necessarily need to be uh, held on its own. It certainly could be, um, depending on which what council's preference would be, but this, some of these items can certainly be addressed by a couple of the other projects that okay. are uh, within the list, I think, at this time. Great. Any questions or comments on this one? Clarification. Alder Scannell. You're saying that? This function could be taken up by another item in the in the list. That's, that's correct. Although certainly, some of this could be identified either in the comprehensive plan project, certainly by the downtown urban design uh, director that was being proposed by downtown Green Bay. Uh, there's also, I think, there was actually one other item, and I'd have to look it on the list. I think there was at least three possibilities that this could be coordinated with, and for some cost savings. Okay. Thanks. All right. Without further comments, we will move along to 36, which is $525,000 to be used for Project 7-6-206, a stipend program. Um, so that's Director Faults. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Got a ways to go. So um, this is a proposal for a stipend for employees. Uh, there's obviously a um, cost of living adjustment we give each year to employees which um, is the best route to go for um, being competitive with the wages. But the stipend is a short-term solution we could provide to employees if we, if our budget cannot absorb the cost of living adjustment. So it's just an option for the council to look at and think about for our employees and, and raises for them. Okay, thank you. And just to, I think on this one, the recommendation is referral. That last string of projects was, um, they were all recommended. Uh, but this one, like Director Falls is saying, is just for contemplation at this time. Alder Burnett. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Faults. Um, a question, though. Uh, if you're saying that this would be just a stipend, would this count towards a cost of living increase, and then the, the next year the cost of living adjustment would be even higher based on the 500 stipend that would be issued this year? No. What I'm saying, oh, what I'm saying is that this is a one-time stipend, so the cost of living adjustment would not be affected by this. It's a one-time stipend. Yeah. And just to clarify, we had done this already earlier. We used partial over, um, we had a favorable financial position based on previous year, and then we used some ARPA funds. So this would be another ARPA disbursement. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And just one thing to add to it, when we're looking at recruitment and retention, a lot of municipalities are increasing their pay for employees. Yeah. So 
we're looking at a cost of living adjustment that might be higher than what we traditionally have done. So this might be an option if we cannot go higher. It's a short-term solution to provide that uh, raise or that stipend for employees. But the rationale also include that they showed up through COVID. I mean, I think that was in the packet here. Yeah, I think that's part of the thought process is, you know, I, I don't think the pandemic has been declared to be over yet in a sense that I think it's we can still justify a stipend to employees, and especially with the lost revenue category. It's pretty general that we can still, I think, provide it to employees that are currently working. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a referred staff, so I don't want to belabor the point. But what, what I don't like about this particular thing is that it excludes the collective bargaining employees, you know, police, fire. Those are the folks that showed up i mean that really had no choice because it was public safety that don't have remote work options so i mean again refer to staff but i don't like the kind of segregating the employees uh, in this way um so anyways thank you guys okay. yeah director Paul. i just want to clarify that we just uh, were precluded from unilaterally providing a benefit to those bargaining groups so i'm not saying that we would not do that it's just something we have to go into closed session and discuss and then decide what to do so okay i just legally we cannot give fair enough to. Fair enough. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Any additional comments on that item? All right. So we've reached the end of oh, Alder Grant. Again, questioning the coding on this. Is there a reason we're not categorizing this as providing premium pay to essential workers? It's incred incredibly complicated. But yes, Director Fultz. <laughs> That's a short way. Yeah, it's the right way to say it. It's very complicated. You have to look at, I think it's like the minimum. They have they said salaries um, said it's like 60% of like the minimum. I forgot what it's called, the but median, it's very common. Median the median income, that's what it is. So there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through. There's a certain standard on the amount you can increase it on. Is it per wage, like a 25% or excuse me, 25 cent increase to wages? So it's really complicated, whereas when we use the lost revenue category, then we're not segregating employees who qualify who don't qualify, and we're not segregating employees that qualify based on what they make per year. So it's, it's a little more equal and across the board and easier to I guess apply it to employees, but it's it's a very complicated analysis. All right. Any other questions on that item? Okay. Like I said, we've reached the end then of that um, of that category, so we could return to item two for your motion, Alder Johnson. Uh, motion to approve and refer the findings back to the ad hoc facilities committee. All right. That, With the uh, caveat that it be kept confidential. Very good. Uh, motion made by Alder Johnson, seconded by Alder Stevens. Discussion on that? Alder Scannell? Yeah, I would also like that if we could have uh, an analysis of the structure of uh, how the condition of that building, number three. It, it, that's part of it. The different study. Uh, it's part of the wor work of the ad hoc facilities committee. Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. I should have scrolled down. Okay. Any other comments, Alder Eck? Um, is it possible we can give a deadline on that so it doesn't get pushed out? A deadline for what? For the, um, well, I know it's being referred back, but when is the committee meeting? Wasn't, weren't they meeting this month? Well, I think maybe as a, a point of order, I think if it's approved today and then subsequently at the next council meeting, staff would be authorized to order it right away okay. so it's really okay. out of our hands it's how quickly the consultant gets it back okay all right yeah. I, I thought you were saying refer back to the i don't know just that when the report's ready okay yep perfect get it alder scannell for yeah, i did time. have and does that include uh other possible uses for this building in that study for the current building yeah. the ad hoc facilities committee is tasked with assessing all of those Every, they they okay. have to contemplate every possible consideration. Every possible consideration. So could that mean selling so I that can't building? Think of could it mean renovating? <laughs> it could be, I mean, that's what we want them to do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. So we do have a motion by Alder Johnson, seconded by Alder Stevens, I think it was, um, to approve and refer the findings to the um, Ad Hoc Facilities Committee with the, the caveat that Chief Litton had offered about confidentiality. Uh, seeing no further comments, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. We're on to item three. Motion. I can't make motions, so. Motion to hold or? Up to you all. Quick question. Alder Galvin. If we do hold it, does that mean we have to hold $9 million? 
the, mm -hmm. which would effectively logically yeah. everything else that we're talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other comments, or I guess we need a motion on the floor. Motion to receive and place on file. Alder Galvin makes a motion to receive and place on file. Second. There's a second, seconded by Alder Stevens. On that motion, Alder Burnett. Yeah, uh, I'm against it. I think we can get a better motion than basically kill it. So uh, I'm going to vote against receiving place on file, and I'd be willing to offer a motion to have a little more substance here. here. Alder Johnson. I just want to provide some clarity again. This isn't a motion to kill the project. And, and, and again, I just want to reiterate, I think the conversation around the whole table here was we need to do something urgently. So I, I, I just... I'm still just very concerned about the number of restrictions placed upon the use of ARPA funds, the time label, timetable that we have, when bonding is a path that provides very little to no restrictions and is really kind of an appropriate path for this type of use. So I, I'm okay with the receive in, in place and file with, with the caveat to that, meaning that um, we're gonna go through each item here and we're gonna have that vote. And if there's surplus funds here and we wanna reallocate it to the committee or something, uh, for additional work that might be done, for example, site acquisition, right? Depending on the, the, what comes out of that report, I think we can sort of preserve our ability to kind of go back to this pool for any uh, unexpensed funds. But I think for the actual construction of the facility, bonding gives us the cleanest path forward uh, to do it in the most expeditious way possible. Yeah, people need to check the queue, please, <laughs> and make sure that you want to speak. Because it's, uh, it's pretty cluttered here, so I'm not sure exactly who wants to say something. Um, there's even more in it now. So I think Alder Grant and then Alder Scannell. Um, can we hear a brief finance overview? I know it's a big explanation, but um, Director Ellenbecker hasn't been able to speak at all tonight, just kind of the position of where we're at financially as a city. Just generally speaking? Well, talking about bonding, I mean, if... I would say good to very good. <laughs> it's a... I know we Maybe met, so I quote, guess, but, yeah. Um, Director Slight Allenbecker. overview of what we went over. Um, yeah, at a very, very high level, um, we started talking about the five-year capital improvement plan, which is what, um, you know, the directors have put in to say, um, say really their five-year needs. That typically rolls into our bonding requests um, for the future, for the next year. Um, you know, historically, every year our bonding request is higher than what we would like, than what we pay off. So there's always a request to either try to bring the number down or we make an intentional decision to bond more than what we um, pay off. Um, that was a situation we did in, in 2022. Um, as far as bonding, you know, we have a total amount outstanding um, of $211 million, um, million dollars outstanding. Um, that includes all of our funding sources, um, KI Convention Center, Bay Beach, TIDS, um, Sanitary Storm, General Levy. And so every year we have, um, you know, they go out and our bonding can go out for 20 years. And, um, you know, as far as another um, um, question that I was asked is, um, are we at a debt limit or what capacity we have? According to the state, you have a, um, a debt limit. The city is under 50% of what their capacity can be. So you could borrow more, you're just going to pay more in, um, you're gonna, um, your tax uh, bill rate is gonna go up and your taxes are gonna go up if, you're go if you wanted to borrow more. Okay, thanks director. That's very high level, but. <laughs> okay, um, let's see, Alder Scannell, then Alder Brunette. Just, I'm wondering also if, uh, instead of some of this money going to construction, if some could be set aside, I don't know if it can be put in a different, pot affordable housing there are people living there if we could put some money aside for i mean we don't want to put much into it if the place is going to be raised but if it's got other uses to make it more habitable for staff i mean it sounds pretty horrid it's just so if there's money we could set aside and i don't know what th that dollar amount would be uh i, would, you know, I don't know if uh, director grenier would have any ballpark you know a hundred thousand two hundred thousand it's just off, just of what you saw in the presentation today, any Director Grenier. ballpark figure roughly? That's coming out of the report that Berner Shorb Associates is okay. currently working, working on. on for the ad hoc committee. As soon as that report's okay. done, we'll have that number. Okay. Well, we're not going to be spending all our ARPA funds now, so we can certainly set some aside later, no matter what, uh, to address that, because that really has to be fixed. 
quickly. All right, thank you. Thanks, Alder. Uh, Alder Burnett, then Alder Galvin. Yeah, thank you. I, I really don't like the receive and place on file. The problem is that we're going to be voting on all these items one by one, and we're going to, you know, there are a lot of really good projects here, and we're going to run out of any dollars so that fire station basically is not even going to be possible then. So uh, I really like my suggestion to have city staff get a letter of opinion from the Wisconsin League of Municipalities. Uh, Attorney Bungart, I, I know there's a motion on the floor. Would it be appropriate or possible for me to change the motion, or do we need to vote vote on this particular motion before I make another motion, assuming that motion fails? Attorney Bungart. Maybe we can go to Alder Galvin while Attorney yeah. Bungert's looking that I just up. Need to check the rules. Alder Galvin. Thank you. Um, like Alder Johnson said, I'm fully in favor of uh, new fire stations, and uh, if, if, if it comes to bonding, I'm. I think that's the best route to go. I think it's the smartest route to go, uh, and I would ask uh, Director Ellen Becker. Um, you kind of scared me when you said 211 million, but out of that, how much is paid off by the levy percentage or if you got a, a rough percentage uh, about how much of that 211 is is levy responsible like 172 172 that's, that's general obligation that would include sanitary storm and um yeah it really would obligate it would really be everything other than the k convention center so i could get you that number if you gave me a few minutes i could pull up my sure. software but, I, but I, anyway, I, I just think it's the best way to go. We've got a lot of good projects here that that fire station would gut that I think uh, there isn't the will um, in the council to tackle and, and bond or uh, take out loans for those. And like Alder Johnson said, a lot of these are two and three year projects that uh, it would make no sense to be bonding for that kind of thing. When we bond for stuff like well, we've, we've built a number of new fire stations over the years in this, in this community. Um, we got a brand new pool for $7 million. We bonded for all of that stuff. And that's, that's what the purpose of bonding is for. Roads, long-term debt, that's what that stuff is for. I'm not saying that receiving place and file buries this thing. I also like Alder Johnson's uh, idea that if there is leftover ARPA funds, we could possibly use those to start the project and get it going, you know, with land acquisition or, and remediation and whatever else it needs. But uh, to tie up uh, nine plus million dollars, um, I, I just I don't think that's a smart way to go here. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Alder Weir, are you? Yeah. I think I get ten minutes. Nine point five. My math. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Obviously, you know we, we've had a debate and discussion about how much money is available, and I think that's still up in the air, um, and about when the completion date needs to be it sounds like 2026 it needs to be done and paid okay now i believe uh there could be another 1.6 million returning to the city right if the referendum passes <coughs> 1.3 1 1.3 million it's, it's a portion of it okay so that is something we have in the future to possibly look forward at um i think receiving and placing and file um, is the wrong motion right now i think we have other in between motions that we can do i think we really can show a commitment to moving forward with this we can put money towards the uh, the consultant and the architect that's something that you'd spend right away you could put money towards acquiring the land or uh, taking care of remediation problems i think that you could easily spend by 2026 so there are some in-between thing here that uh, that we could do besides just receiving and placing on file and the less we bond the better so this is money that we can put towards a very important project let's look at uh, something in between thanks okay thanks all there yes i'll, I'll just scan them. Just, just a question for the other uh, let's hear some in between motions i mean we get 900 million obviously that that we can discuss it we're as we're you can oh okay attorney bunker go ahead yes so a motion i'm to not making it discuss <laughs> motion to lay on the table which we refer to receive and place on file can't be amended so that's the procedural question okay as to the league issue, I just want to clarify, I can certainly ask the league for an opinion. I'm not very confident we're going to get an answer, simply because the league is more suited towards providing opinions and advising municipalities and its members with respect to Wisconsin state statutes and how they apply to municipalities. And this is a very complex federal act 
um, that applies across the board, and I'm not entirely confident that we're going to get an answer with respect to the, to this particular question from the league specifically. So I just wanted to put that out there. So and, and just another, and question. just another, just one second. Just another point on on that, I guess, is to let folks know that there is something called E311, which is a partnership between Bloomberg philanthropies and the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the League of Cities, they have offered an analysis which Correct. And I Attorney use that. Yes, I use that as part of my um, my research and reference in putting together my memo. The question was okay. put, can you use ARPA funds to um, build or replace a fire station? And the answer is yes, under lost revenue or under public uh, health and negative impacts. But because it's not an enumerated use, you have to answer the two-part framework question plus the additional analysis question. And that's where it ends. Then as a question, I'll just get on. is it out of order to simply discuss possible other motions without making them? The we discussion should, should be regarding the motion on the floor. So, okay. Yeah. All right, thanks, Alder. Alder Eck? Okay, I just want to um, clarify that um, Alder, Grant, and I are happy with funding and if it's not the whole thing we're we're we just don't want to the receive and place and file um is not a motion that i would like to to do i would like to put a number out there to like what alder weary said maybe do the land acquisition the architect some money towards a project to to show the firefighters that we're willing to commit to the project yeah okay thanks alder alder brunette then alder johnson yeah, so we, we have to obviously then vote on this motion if it can't be amended. So uh, I vote no. I'm going to vote no, and hopefully we can make a motion. I, I just throw out the Wisconsin League of Municipalities for lack of a better mm -hmm. agency that could provide some sort of written letter or correspondence, kind of someone from outside that can just say, okay, we we have a city employee, it's Ernie Bungart, finance director, who after this meeting can articulate the goals of the council like can this happen and they can provide a professional opinion on letterhead so that we can say yep an outside agency looked at this and said nope it's not possible or yes it is possible and this is how that's what I'm looking for I'm not saying that it needs to be the legal municipalities I just floated it out there for lack of a better uh, agency perhaps somebody at the the Wisconsin Treasury or someone from a congressional office or somebody else who can you look at this and, and let us know how to find a way to make it work if that's what the council decides. And then second of all, I agree with Alderman Weary, there's a there's a middle path here. We could, you know, hold two to three million of the ARPA funds for property acquisition or engineering study. I, that's the motion I want. So I kind of implore the council to vote this down, uh, vote down the receive and place on file and let's find a better motion to keep this on the table. Doesn't mean we need to vote on the resolution in the future, but at least it kind of allows us to hold some of the funds as a possibility. Thank you. So there, Attorney Bunger, do you want to chime in? No, never mind. It's fine. Okay. Thank you. Alder Johnson? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, okay, so so here's kind of what I'm contemplating. I, I, I don't think we need to fight this hard to pay for the fire station with ARPA. I really don't. I think this conversation here alone, no pun intended, holds everybody's feet to the fire. Oh, boy. We had a vi I really wasn't even intending that. We have had a very public conversation, everybody here expressing their support for this. So when the bond time comes, do you think anyone around this table is gonna say no? I don't think so. So I think we've already accomplished what needs to be accomplished here. Now that said, I've done some quick math on this and, and hopefully my Excel spreadsheet's working correctly. Um, if we approved, every single item in this category, which is probably not likely to happen, but let's say we did, it would still leave about a half a million dollars. So one thing that I could even get on board with is maybe even a million, right? And, and let's talk about some of those other items. But if we did a million dollars, from my experience with what site acquisitions typically cost and something that could be acquired before 2026, environmental remediation is a whole new Right, if you've got contamination, you need to be pursuing brownfield grants and, and doing some other things. So I don't know that I'd want to use ARPA dollars for that when there's other resources available. But site acquisition for a million dollars is sufficient enough. So I would be willing to support a million dollars to hold for site acquisition pending the outcome of the analysis. And then if I, I presume it would go to Director Stechschulte's department to do that negotiation. I don't know for sure if that would be the case, but I'd be comfortable with that. 
as a secondary motion if, if depending on how this one proceeds. But I think anything more that says we're holding funding to go towards the building that we can't guarantee will get done on time just seems a little bit, you know, not, not the, the fiscally responsible path to go when we have other options that are much cleaner that, that get rid of all the red tape. So I just want to kind of throw that out there as a secondary option. If the group felt like that was a reasonable compromise that allowed us to move forward and shows that good faith commitment that's being asked for, I'd get behind that. Thanks, Alder. Alder Grant. I just want to point out really quick, in some of the phone calls I've been making doing some research into this, um, when I did speak to a municipality in Tennessee, they did refer me to First Tennessee Development District, and they are responsible looking at all their proposals for municipalities within Tennessee. So is there consulting like that in Wisconsin that, like Alder Burnett brought up, that we can seek guidance from? Attorney Bunger? Right, so reviewing that email that you, that you sent, it looks like they have it structured a little differently where it's all kind of under the umbrella of the state and then the state gives them assistance to figure out whether their projects apply or are eligible. It was a, it was a different, it wasn't one that I saw. Gotcha. Um, so scratch that, but I, I'm not aware of a specific agency within the state that provides that types of guidance. I did connect with Susan House today. We are we have an email reaching out to Baker Tilly, I believe, to see if they can provide us any guidance. So so far we got a response from the E three one one. I did speak with an, uh, a city attorney in um, in Milwaukee who was dealing with all the ARPA um, projects for Milwaukee. Um, she also supported the conclusions that the Treasury provided, which essentially lost, lost revenue was a fit. The other category was a stretch because of the fact that it's not enumerated use and trying to get through those hoops is pretty impossible, which a lot of municipalities are moving to either doing enumerated uses or going the clear route of using lost revenue. So this <laughs> additional route of seeing what, the, what Baker Tilly can provide us can provide more information. Oh, sorry. I personally would feel comfortable going, putting this one just on the slight back burner, go through the rest of the proposals in this category, maybe even talk about, you know, are we okay with approving it for the full amount that's requested and seeing what's left. If it's three million of lost revenue purely, and we can agree on a council that that's a good compromise based on what's left. I'm okay with seeing what the other proposals get voted on and then coming back to this at the end because it seems like we're not all in agreement to pass it as is. Thanks, Alder. Alder Galvin. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, like Alder Johnson said, we're, we're fighting too hard about something that should be pretty easy. Um, uh, certain members of council seem set on this can only be done with grant money. I mean, uh, with ARPA money. And uh, I, again, I don't think that's a good use of it. I am willing to amend my uh, my motion to make it. Um, You'd have to withdraw it. Okay. Uh, any, okay, I'll withdraw my motion. Alder makes a motion to withdraw. Second. Uh, made by Galvin, seconded by Johnson. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. You guys have it. Alder Galvin. All right, and then I'll make a motion that we set aside a million dollars of ARPA money for land acquisition after the studies have been done and returned, and after we've had a the report from the uh, uh, ad hoc ad hoc committee. I mean, we, I'm afraid we're getting the, the horse in front of the car too much here. We're trying to rush ahead. We haven't even had the ad hoc committee to have an idea what the cost might be. And so we've got professionals out there looking at that, and that's what I'd rather we do. Thank okay. you. Is there a second for that motion? Second. Second by Alder Stevens. Uh, discussion on that motion? Seeing none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And that motion is successful. Director Allenbecker? 
I just want to answer Alder Galvin's question. Um, when I said we have about $211 million outstanding in debt, that was at the end of 2021. At the end of 2022, we're projecting it'll be about $213 million. And um, rounded numbers, but the general fund, um, general levy has about $98 million outstanding. Sanitary has about $15 million. Storm has about $19 million. Parking utility has about $3 million. Bay Beach has $4 million. Okay, convention center through room tax is about 34 million and our kids have about 30 40 million outstanding and that will make up about your 213 million outstanding this is principal only not interest okay and, and out of that how much do the taxpayers pick up through their tax levy I think if I remember on our in our budget book about nine to ten percent of of your tax levy comes from the debt for the general fund in total, our debt is about 17 or 18 percent of our budget, but uh, again, about half of that is picked up by other funding sources. I do believe the general levy picks up, your general tax bill picks about 9 or 10 percent of your tax bill, but I could confirm that. All right. Thank well, ten, 10 per, I'm sorry, it's the, the, the portion of the Green Bay, Green Bay's mill rate, mm -hmm. <clears throat> not the full mill rate. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Director. Now we're on um, item 5, which is two rides at Bay Beach. Entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Johnson. Discussion on that item? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. That item has been approved. On to 17, which is uh, 100,000 for the DAs. Motion to receive and place on file. Motion to receive and place on file made by Alder Johnson. Second. Seconded by Alder Galvin. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. That has been received and placed on file. Item 18, which is Alder, Alder Stoyer, makes a motion to receive and place aye. on file. Seconded by Alder Eck. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. 19, a million dollars for strategic vacant parcels project. Motion here. I would move to approve. I like it. Second. <laughs> <laughs> a motion has been made to approve by Elder Johnson and seconded by Alder Galvin. Discussion? Elder Weary? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, on this one, I would really need a little more specifics on just throwing a million dollars at something. You know, we, we really talked to death a lot of the other projects on this one. Uh, I'm not sure I'm, I'm behind. I get the idea mm -hmm. behind it, but right now I'd be opposed thanks Mayor, could I comment on that yeah Alder Johnson and I appreciate that the intent um, the way that I had it written up is that it would go to the RDA and it would become much like a revolving loan uh, like we do with other a lot of other grant programs that actually have been proposed here with ARPA is we've proposed that pools of funding become available for grant applications it would operate in, in an identical fashion so I appreciate what, where you're coming from uh, but I just wanted to point out that it would be very comparable to many of the other programs we've not only authorized already but others that are on the agenda and just to note this was um, recommended to be referred to staff I think it's a it's a great concept could use some fine-tuning uh, director Stuckschulte I don't know if you have any thoughts yeah, I think just in terms, of, I guess, from staff's immediate priority would be uh, looking at maybe some downtown parcels for either short-term parking solutions and longer-term redevelopment opportunities that are still out there. There's some strategic locations, I think, uh, certainly in the downtown area that would be uh, feel a little bit better if they were under city control, maybe long-term, uh, for future redevelopment opportunities. Uh, it is difficult to, uh, to dictate what happens to those things if we do not control them. Um, I think, you know, the other I, I think that was mentioned, I think Alder Johnson mentioned in terms of potential uh, industrial and employment-based types of projects, uh, in terms of some possibility of acquiring some land for, for those areas would probably be the two priority areas I think staff would certainly uh, lean into this program with. Okay. Very good. Um, and just a question for finance staff. Are we keeping a running total so we, okay. Where, where do we stand with the category? Five million six twenty three eight thirty five is a balance left in the capital or the revenue loss. We have now allocated twenty five thousand for fire station analysis, a million dollars for land acquisition for the fire stations, and eight hundred thousand for baby rides, leaving us four million five ninety eight eight thirty five. Okay. Very good. Um, and just a kind of an overarching note, I guess, on this category, um, I would imagine we're going to have a pretty big um, bonding request 
for our capital budget. Uh, we also allocated some of our ARPA um, into our operational budget for this year for some one-time expenses. So just want folks to know, it'd be nice to have some of that flexibility come budget time. Uh, Alder Burnett. Actually, agree with you. <laughs> oh, everybody, <laughs> please. Yeah, let's uh, let's make a note. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's true. I, I, I like the refer to staff. There's more details that we need to get. It could be very a, a very good program, but we just need a little more details. This is a million dollars. That's a lot of money. We could buy a lot of property, do wonderful things through redevelopment, but the mayor is correct in that the refer to staff allows staff to work on it, and then if there's other, because this, this is that big list, the capital needs and organizational priorities. There could be things that come up this budget year that we could allocate a million dollars towards. So I think a refer to staff would be appropriate. Someone would vote against the motion. That, that motion would be in order. Motion, um, to, refer. motion to refer to staff. Second. Motion has been made to refer this item to staff. Second, that uh, was made by Alder Burnett, seconded by Alder Johnson. Further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. I'm going to get that quote. The mayor is correct on a, on a loop. <laughs> I said I agree. <laughs> I actually agree with you. I think is what I said. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and then you said the mayor is correct. But. Not always. Yeah. We, get, we got footage. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Uh, what are we on now? 28. Item 28, and that is $79,411 $79, for Spanish translator. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Stevens. Um, discussion on that? I, I Alder do. Burnett? I do. I, I think it's important to, to consider the demographic of the city, and I don't know who the best person to ask this question to. Um, perhaps I cannot, I don't know, but the, the Hispanic demographic in the city is what, nearly 20%, is that correct, of the population? I believe over, yeah. Yeah, and when we kind of talk about um, finding ways to accommodate a growing portion of the population. There could be some that look at this and go, that's crazy, why in the world are we spending? Everything should be in English. I understand that, but there has to be a period of transition for a lot of our city residents who live here, who speak Spanish, who don't yet speak English. So I think, you know, it seems like a lot, but I'm gonna kind of defer to the clerk's uh, discretion on this. There are a lot of gov government documents that need to be translated and I, I think it's a, a good use of ARPA funds so I'm gonna vote in favor of this thanks Alder additional questions or comments Alder Eck uh, yes um, it says limited term employee um, is there a possibility of um, looking for employees in different areas I, I know that a lot of times when I'm, I've seen different job postings where it says they want them to be bi bilingual because um, it being limited term, I don't think there's going to be an end to the need for it. So, what is the question? I guess my question is um, rather than doing a limited term employee Spanish translator, that we would add that to a jobs description for employees in City Hall or an, exi an existing position within City Hall? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. Director Ellenbecker or anyone else has a response to that. Director Grenier? The Human Resources Department has put out numerous uh, surveys to city employees, current city employees, looking for those who are multilingual. And that's kind of how we're trying to get through some of this uh, right now, is relying on those who have those skill sets. I think putting it into a job description would be challenging. Uh, we're having trouble across the board recruiting and retaining employees to add another layer like that to a job description which could potentially preclude somebody from applying for employment would be short-sighted. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot, of, especially for uh, Spanish language uh, services, we're relying very heavily upon one officer in the Green Bay uh, Police Department right now. So although this is not our request uh, in DPW, working closely with the clerk's office as we do, uh, this is something I think is incredibly is much needed if we can start the funding this way uh, I would strongly encourage you at budget time to start looking at adding that to the table of organization and making that a, a regular full-time position That's levy supported. Thanks director uh, Alder Johnson uh, Just a question for staff. How rigid 
does this definition need to be? Because in the motion it says for a limited term employee, uh, but certainly there are many translation services out there. And I'd like to preserve the flexibility for staff to evaluate which which path that makes the most sense. The translation services? Right, Should, could, could we subcontract this out? And so my question is the motion is limited term employee. Yeah. So if, if I wanna give it more flexibility. Amendment? I mean, is that necessary or can staff just do that? I mean, we're really approving a position, right? So I think but I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion to amend this um, to just allocate the funding for uh, for translation services, and then uh, the intent is that motion would allow the administration to make a decision if outsourcing or or an LTE is the the best path forward okay. for that. Second. Is there a second for that? Second. Then? Alder Brunet, and then just to go back to I think what Director Ellen Becker said a little while back, the request is actually for is it two hundred and thirty eight thousand for three years. So just want everybody to be clear on that and see what the council is thinking um, mm. if that's the appropriate dollar amount okay. Alder Johnson I think you still have the floor yeah I don't know that that was clear I'm seeing a lot of puzzled faces <laughs> around the <laughs> around the horn right now yeah um, Uh, it, yeah, it, can I can I keep rambling with my amendment? Sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> to authorize a hundred thousand dollars, and and not put a time frame on it to be used at their discretion. And if we don't overspend this bucket, they can always come back. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So the amendment um, is proposed, still seconded by yeah, Alder oh yeah. Brunette. So it's uh, to amend to a hundred thousand dollars for translation services, Spanish language translation services. That was made by Alder Johnson and seconded by Alder Brunette. Discussion on it? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. That motion is approved. Um, under the chamber hybrid upgrades, item 29. Move to approve. Oh, go ahead. Motion. motion to approve made by Alder Eck, seconded by Alder Johnson. Discussion on that? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. On to item 30, which is $500,000 for the City Hall Data Center Replacement Project. Second. Motion to approve made by Alder Galvin, seconded by Alder Stevens. Discussion? There. Yeah, Alder Johnson. Just a question. I guess this would kind of apply to all of these. I mean, this is obviously a very round number. So if the project comes in at 450, I assume that 50 comes back. And then, like, what's the, the timing in terms of when we would know that? Director Hronick, just on the timing, maybe? I would, I would say we would do a, a, most of our research in 2023. They implemented in 2024, so I'd say by the end of 2023, you would have that number. Okay. I just want to make sure we obviously have enough time to react if, exactly. when there is potentially a surplus yeah. in any of these accounts. Yep. Yeah, yeah, maybe mm -hmm. I think it would be reasonable to have staff update the Finance Committee on a semi-regular basis in terms of you know what the, what the precise dollar amount is on these categories. Is that... Makes sense every couple months, or okay, okay. Thank you. Yep. So we have a motion and a second. I think. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. That item has been approved. Eighty thousand dollars for city hall scanning project. Item thirty-one. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Weary. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. That item has been approved. 32. This is 1.45 million for the historic Bay Beach Pavilion improvements. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Stevens. Discussion here. Alder Burnett. Yeah, I'm going to. Uh, I think it needs to be done. I'm going to vote no on this one for the reason that, you know, that possibly that 1.4 could go towards a more pressing facility need. I think we have the facility ad hoc committee. Um, I'm not going to belabor the point. I'm just going to vote against this one at this moment. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Alder. Other discussion? Alder Scano? I can't imagine a greater need from uh, the, the roof is kaputs. So 
I can't imagine a greater or a more immediate need. And it is Bay Beach that was hardest hit, or extremely hard hit by uh, COVID here. So I'm, I'm gonna support the motion in its full. Thanks. Thanks, Alder. Additional conversation? Alder Johnson. Yeah, and I, it, I certainly don't begrudge Alder Burnett's point, and I think it's a valid one when you're thinking about citywide. Um, I also go back to the conversation that we had earlier, which is 2.25 million of the loss and really the subsequent revenue that came into this account was because of Bay Beach. So I, I personally feel a strong sense of obligation that the city maintains its investment in that park and that 2.25 million ought to go directly back to Bay Beach. And if staff is coming to us saying our highest priorities at Bay Beach are, you know, a ride and some of these improvements, I, I'm, I'm supportive of that. I haven't heard any other more uh, pressing needs come out of Bay Beach and those that have come forward, the friends of Bay Beach have taken care of. And I kind of want to honor their commitment to that facility and park as well. So I, 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 I'm going to get behind this motion. Thanks, Alder. Uh, Alder Grant, then Alder Galvin. I just want to clarify this item was the roof plus upgrading the pavilions, correct? Okay, I, I support helping with the roof, but I don't know if I can support with the information we received as far as revenue and whatnot, upgrading the pavilions at this time. Okay, thanks, Alder. Additional comments on? Point of order, Mayor. Alder Johnson. Yeah, it's a point of order. Uh, uh, Director Ditchite, the, the if, if we take action on this and we're kind of holding that money for all those improvements, would you still need to come through Parks Committee with actual uh, quotes to be authorized for all of those improvements? Yes. Okay, so council would have the ability at a future date when those quotes come forward to say, eh, we're not going to do that whole thing, we're only going to do pieces. Anything over 25,000 yeah. would have to go back to committee and council for approval. Yeah. I'm not saying that I would, I personally would do that, but I just, I, I wanted to at least be transparent that there's another opportunity to, to have that discussion. Right. Good question. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Alder Galvin. Thank you. I'm, I'm in favor of this. Uh, Bay Beach is uh, historically, uh, it goes back almost to the beginning of uh, modern Green Bay. Um, it's been a, a destination for people throughout Wisconsin. Uh, you hear people even from Chicago that talk about coming here and how much they enjoyed it. It's been a money maker for the city. It's been so positive and it took such a hit during COVID. Um, I think we're duty bound to help it recover and get back to where it was. And uh, by doing this work at the pavilion, we actually open up another revenue source for this, for this uh, uh, jewel that we have so I'm in favor of it thank you thanks Alder Alder Hutchinson um, I'm also in favor I've had two kids who work there and now they're grown I guess there's Alders here who worked at Bay Beach so I want to continue that tradition and keep it going so I too worked at Bay Beach oh, okay so. there yeah. you go thank Just, you you know every other person in Green Bay worked at Bay Beach <laughs> <coughs> thanks for the comments Alder any others <laughs> with that all in favor signify oh, Alder Stoyer quick comment I'm in favor of this as well and like I mentioned before you know Bay Beach is iconic in this community and it's people come from all over the Midwest to come here so I think anything we can do to help is great Alder Johnson did mention too that 2.25 that we lost million uh, very substantial and they took the biggest hit that I see in this city so I support it thank Thanks, you Alder. He was there for the original ribbon Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alder Morgan. Where did we just sit? <laughs> In all this recollection, and I was thinking about what uh, Alder Campbell had to say, it'd be nice if we could uh, get back to the days like when I was a rock and roller years ago playing at dances there. It might be something that helps our youth, too, to have something more to do, and that's mm -hmm. something we need to do is occupy our youth with something other than a computer screen or something so I'm definitely for it thanks Alder Alder Burnett yeah you know I'm in a rare form tonight I'm going to change my 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 opinion <laughs> and I'm going to uh, vote in favor for the reason that I want to show hopefully I, I'm not going to tell the council how to vote but hopefully we can show unanimous support Friends of Bay Beach are do outstanding work there and it is a cultural institution it's a bedrock organization here in Green Bay so I'm gonna uh, the council kind of convinced me to go ahead and vote in favor of this thank you very well said all in favor will signify by saying aye, aye. aye. opposed nay 
The ayes have it unanimously. On to item 33, $300,000 for the Green Bay Comprehensive Plan update. It's approved. Um, motion made by Alder Johnson, seconded by Alder Galvin to approve this item. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. 34, $210,000 for cybersecurity project. Motion to approve. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Galvin. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. That item has been approved. Item 35, $75,000 for urban design consultant. Move to hold. Motion to hold by, um, I think we need to do a, either a refer or a, a date certain. Uh, I guess move to hold to the next time we talk about ARPA. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be our next meeting, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and maybe a little narrative on this. Okay, the reason yeah, I'm making this motion is because I, I, I think it's, it's fruitful for us to determine the outcome of some of the other items that are coming up that also impact this category. Okay, so the motion is to hold until our next council meeting, which be August yeah. 30th? Yeah, I, th I think that makes sense. Okay, yeah. Alder Johnson makes a motion, seconded by Alder Weary, Alder Eck. Oh, I just wanted to know where we're at as far as the funds. Do yeah, we have good, an update on good where question. we're at? Good question. Dr. Ellenbecker? I'm trying to keep track. Yes, with um, the change or the addition up to two hundred and ten thousand dollars, holding the seventy-five and not taking the, um, we have one more item correct for capital. At yep. this point, we have one million one hundred thirteen thousand left and change. That is already taken into consideration. The million for the fire station land acquisition. So one million one thirteen is left. Okay. After this or before? We'll get one more. Item. Before um, that is a, a, through number thirty-four. So yep. it's including the million. Yes. So the motion is to hold this item until our next council meeting, which is August 30th. Made by Alder Johnson. That was seconded by Alder Weary. All in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. On to item 36, which is $525,000 for a stipend. Uh, and that was the recommended refer. for referral. Move to refer. Motion to refer <laughs> made by um, Alder Burnett. Seconded by Alder Scannell, so that would be referred back to staff. All in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. That item has been referred back to staff. Uh, Alder Weary. Susan. Yes, we may. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, so we'll, be, we'll be back at 947 sharp. Okay. okay. We'll reconvene. The special meeting of our Common Council. All right. We have, I'm going to attempt to call an audible. We have a few people here for stormwater. Um, just wondering if maybe, I don't think we need to do that. Um, there's not even, I don't know that it, we made a motion to take these in any particular order. I so I made the motion to divide, I, I, I meant for that to be the second item that we take up. There we go. Yeah. So we will appreciate that, Alder. So we will move along to item four. Um, so item four is for $250,000 to be used at the Nicolay Stormwater Runoff Project. That is a recommended project. Entertain a motion. Move to. Approve. Motion to approve made by Alder Grant. Uh, no. Seconded by Alder Weary. All in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. And that project is approved. On to, what do we got? 24, which is $520,000 <clears> to be used for Alder Eck. I'm sorry, I was trying to catch you before you did the motion. Um, I, would, I wanted to find out what the remaining balance was in that, um, that last category and make a motion to add whatever's left to the money for the fire station. Okay. Um, Director Ellenbecker, if you have the balance left there. Yes, with all the amendments we made, there that leaves $1,113,246 remaining in the capital or revenue loss category 
that was allocated $10 million. Okay, point of order. Uh, Alder Johnson? Is that motion in order? That would be a question for Attorney Bungert. We don't have any other motions on the floor currently, do we? Right, but we don't also, we also don't have the item on the floor. Correct. Um, I think what item is on? Motion to reconsider that item. So I, w I would just uh, gently one. make the same suggestion yeah. that I offered when Alder Johnson had his item of a million dollars. Like to reconsider <laughs> mine too. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, you know, we do have a, a big budget coming. We've got a, a capital improvement plan coming toward us. I think we all experienced a win here. Um, and so I think it would be great if we could just keep moving along. Just my thoughts. Um, is there a motion to reconsider? Um, I don't think there's anything. I don't think a motion to reconsider is proper because we're not reconsidering any kind of action. Um, I think if item 24 is on the floor because you called it, mm -hmm. I think we need to dispense with that. And okay. I think we would then need a motion to return back to the first category for additional discussion and then an additional motion could be made if so wished. But there isn't a clear way of like, Dispensing since 24 yep. got called, 24 needs to be handled first. Okay, so okay. we are on item 24, which is $520,000 for the Baird Creek Burgundy <laughs> Court Sediment Control Project. The recommendation is uh, referral on this one simply because it is a you know fairly complicated project and would want Director Grenier and uh, in all likelihood Matt Heck and Libel to dig into this a little bit and and see what's what's possible and what's you know recommended there. Motion to refer to staff made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Galvin. Additional comments? Alder Hutchison. Okay, so this is referring it back to staff, and so it's not dead, but what if the money goes away? So that's my concern. Yep, no, that's that's a fair question. Um, you know, we, we still have dollars available um, if, the two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, I believe. Well, I don't know if that, Director Allen Becker, could you do a remaining balance on this category? <clears throat> One million four nine hundred forty thousand dollars left over. We have now uh, allocated two hundred fifty thousand. And then, are you asking what the remaining items? If we approved all of them. Um, Sure, remaining balance and then um, and then outstanding total, I suppose. Okay, oh. Okay, so, um there is a little more request than there is remaining balance, but that is assuming that we held the $520,000 aside. So let me just clear that, let me clear my balance. So at this point, we're still sitting at 1.6 million after the 250,000. Okay. I'm not sure if that's the answer you're and looking I for. And I think um, we have two sort of overlapping requests. Mm -hmm. There's a million dollars that could be used 30. pretty flexibly to help with development projects. And then there's a $250,000 request that's for a specific project. I think we had comments from Mr. Bader saying that he was comfortable with the, the million, did I say thousand? The million dollar um, more flexible pot of money so that could minimize the outstanding request a bit. Okay. Alder Hutchison? Um, thank you, that's what I wanted to know. Okay. Alder Galvin? Thank you, Your Honor. As we're moving through and we're voting in these things up or down or to be referred to staff, um, obviously if we, we vote yes and then it's voted yes at council, the money's gone. But I, I think to be fair and to be honest and transparent, if we're going to refer something intending to pass it, if, if staff can work it out, I think that money that's listed there should be adjoined to that. It, it makes no sense to me to refer this to staff, give people the hope that this is going to go through, 
And then with all the maneuvering we're doing here and some of these little side passes we're doing, we start trying to grab money from other accounts because we have some pet project um, that's, that's sitting there. And I, I don't think that's fair to the people here. And I don't think it's fair uh, to the citizens of Green Bay to say, yeah, well, it looks like this project can go, but someone came along and took the money when we weren't looking. Yep. Um, I, I, I think if we move forward with this, if it's referred, the money goes with it. If it turns out staff can do it for less or they can't do it all, then it goes back in the bucket and we can figure out some other deserving project. Yep. Thank you. No, I think that's a that's a good comment. That's certainly the intent of the administration is not to oversubscribe all this stuff yeah. and then come back with no money. Um, broadly speaking, that's kind of where we sit, is we, we do have the resources for, for most of these categories, even with the referrals included, with some work there. So, so we have a motion and a second. This is to refer to staff. Any additional questions on that? Seeing none, all in the grant. Um, just also, a refer to staff sometimes, though, is we want more information, right? It doesn't necessarily mean we back the project. We just need to know more about it. Not this specifically, but mm -hmm. overall. Okay. And then secondly, um, this is where I kind of brought up the point that if we do over-approve in this category, we can motion to take it from a different one if we see these as more important, for lack of better words. That's accurate in this okay. instance, yep. So just a reminder. Mm -hmm. worry. Mr. Mayor, just for uh, <clears throat> just, excuse me, general information and for the, the people who are still here waiting, what this will do is send it to our Department of Public Works, and then would it come to uh, the Improvement Service Committee at some point, or where would it go? That's and a, when yeah. do we expect that? That's a good just, question. Just I mean, we've, we've sent most of this stuff through finance, but um, that's a great question for both Director Allen Becker and Director Grenier. The way I envision this happening is we would prepare the technical report discussing the merit of the project, and that would go to Improvement Service Committee under an informational, but the actual expenditure of funds, because it originated at finance, would go back to finance. Appreciate that, uh, Director Grenier. Do you have a timetable on that? I know it's kind of just been thrown at you here, but you've probably known about it for a while. Well, we haven't, we haven't, re we knew in base, in, in general concept, but we really haven't gotten into it. So uh, I would like to think that by the end of this year, we would be in a position to make a recommendation. All right. Thanks. I got it in stone. End of year. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh -huh. kidding. All right. Thank well, you, Stan. <laughs> Alder Scannell. Since this isn't coming from finance, since it's coming from Committee of the Whole, does it come back to the to Committee of the Whole? That is a, a good question um, right, so the motion, for Attorney Bunger. The motion is to refer, refer to it, staff. refer to staff. So everything that's happening here tonight is still, is going to be reported out under Committee of the Whole, but for Council on the 30th. And then once Council approves that referral, it'll go back to staff. And then, but as part of the motion, you could say refer back to staff who then will report back out to a particular committee so that it doesn't have to come back to committee of the whole. If you, without a... So do we need with, to amend all the motions? Well, with a, without a designated committee, though, wouldn't it be within the purview of staff to bring it back to the appropriate to find, committee? Right, to either finance or committee of the whole. So. Yeah, so we, we can be flexible with that. Mm -hmm. I'm not Alder, flexible. Alder Galvin? Would, would it make sense just to send it back to the committee of the whole? Let's face it, when there's some real hot button issues here, and if it goes to finance and it fails, it's just going to get pulled at council and then we're going to spin our wheels for around five hours right now. Um, when we're going to put a lot of people who want to get a lot of other business done at, at council at a disadvantage of sitting through this. Um, I, I would prefer to see whatever gets referred once the staff is done with it, it goes back. We have another meeting of the committee of the whole. Or just uh, council. Well, but how much time do you want to spend in a council? I mean, look how much we spend five hours here. I don't foresee, I mean, who can who can tell the future? I don't foresee these discussions being quite as lengthy as, as tonight's, but who knows? <laughs> so we have a motion on the floor to refer this item to staff. It's been seconded. Additional comments or questions? Seeing none, all.
Yeah, uh, Alder Eck. Would this be appropriate time to say reconsider the um, the motion for um, item number three? Alder makes a motion to reconsider okay. item number three. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second. Seconded by Alder Campbell. Uh, discussion on that, Alder Eck? Um, well, as I mentioned about the, um, that there's extra funds in the account that, um, so my request would be that instead of one million being put two million towards the project. Mayor. Alder Johnson? Yeah. yeah, if I'm gonna be honest, like this kind of ticks me off a little bit. Mm -hmm. I acquiesced on my motion mm -hmm. because I said, hey, we're going to refer it to staff. We're going to respect this process. And then we, we swoop in and say, oh, I'm going to try to take it now for my item. When we had a really good conversation, a really good victory, we got some money for things that we can immediately take action on. This is not a good motion, folks. This disrespects the process of collaboration. I absolutely do not support this. I support the concept, and I support moving us in the right direction, but when you have somebody who fights for you, who fights for you to come up with a compromise, to get a win, and then you pull the carpet out from underneath them after they say, you know what, I'll refer my item, and let some flexibility around this, and let's vet the program a little bit more. And I don't mean to be super animated about this, but man, that's a punch in the stomach. I, I, I oppose the referral. I don't think that that is good practice. Thanks, Alder. Additional comments on the uh, motion to reconsider? Alder Eck? Oh, or, sorry, Alder Grant. My mistake. I don't think her intention is to disrespect anyone. I think the point is to be to save bonding, um, to reduce that amount to the taxpayers. I think that's the purpose, because that was our first initial intentions, was to complete this project with the least amount of bonding. Additional comments? Alder Gallen? I agree with uh, Alder Johnson. I mean, I, I changed my motion. We could have buried this thing and put it to bed once and for all, and yet you keep coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back. And that's not how people work together. That's not how teams work. It's not how you accomplish things. It's give and take. If it's going to be all or none, you know, I'll, I'll ask to reconsider it, and then we'll just uh, we'll put in a uh, receiving place on file. I mean, geez, it's it's come on. It's been a long night. We've done some good here. Let's continue to do that. But if every time there's a dollar left on the table, we're going to try and grab that and put it towards the pet project, that's that's not the way to do this, and and it's not good governance. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Any additional comments on the motion to reconsider? Seeing none, all in favor will signify by saying aye. aye, aye. Opposed, nay. 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 The nays have it. That motion is denied. On to item 25. This is $200,000 to be used for Baird Creek Chris McAuliffe Park Sediment Control Project. This um, is also a, a recommended referral. Motion to refer. Second. The motion has been made to refer this item to staff by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Galvin. Any discussion here? Seeing none, uh, Alder Hutchison. Okay, this is uh, the similar project to the one that just got referred to. I wish that they would go in tandem mm -hmm. to the, and so they're, one doesn't lag, that's all. Is that reasonable, Director Grenier? Okay. Sounds good. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And those items are referred. Um, this next one is $50,000 for LeCount and Fritch Park erosion project. I believe this is also a referral. Um, that was offered by Alder Burnett. Yeah. I, I really didn't know what to put for a dollar amount. There is some constituents who have culverts and there's <clears throat> they're being washed away and some conflict if it's city or private property and try to work that out. But in addition to that, there's some erosion issues in the creek down in Fritch Park. And so I think a refer to staff would be great. So right. I just want to let you all know that I don't have a firm dollar amount any. Yep. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Alder Burnett makes a motion to refer. That was seconded by Alder Scannell. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. On to item 27, which is $230,000 to be used for the East Town 
parking lot flooding project. Um, this is one that uh, I had suggested could be um, addressed with the million dollars that has been um, offered. So I'll entertain a motion here. Okay. <laughs> uh, right. So I, I'll reiterate what I had said, I guess, in, in case people aren't clear. But um, we have a million dollars in here that could take care of this type of project um, rather than earmarking directly to, um, to a private person. It might make more sense to have a grant program where different developers and other entities could apply to it. So there's a little bit of redundancy between the 230000 and the million dollars. So we receive. That would be a motion to receive and place it. Motion has been made to receive this item and place it on file by Alder Scannell. Is there a second for that? Second. Seconded by Alder Galvin. Uh, Alder Burnett. Yeah, um, the funding I'm not so concerned about. Uh, Alder Morgan and myself were, you know, we proposed this together. It kind of was attached to my name, but it's the timing. Like, how soon can this be done, regardless of, of the, the funding? Uh, Director Grenier, like, how soon can this be done? Because my work with the developer, it seemed like, their shovel ready. Yes, so. and I think the question is both for Director Grenier and Director Steck Schulte since this is kind of like private side stormwater stuff. So, Director Grenier, if you want to kick it off, we would have to develop a program. <clears throat> well, first of all, you'd have to approve the allocation of funds. So, a bare minimum was going to take the end of this month. But during that time, we could start taking a look at what the grant application would look like uh, and criteria for applying for that grant. And obviously, we know Mr. Bader would be first in line to apply. Mm -hmm. So we would be looking for his application first. Director Steck Schulte? I think I would certainly work with Director Grenier on kind of using some of the existing grant programs we've been trying to do and obviously fitting it into this, a stormwater framework. So obviously, we've done our, our tourism grants, our facade grants. We've got several other programs that I think between the two of us, we could probably establish something fairly quickly. Yeah. You think the okay. project could be done still this calendar year? I think ideally that would be that would certainly I think I said I certainly in terms of getting the program approved and up it shouldn't be take us more than a couple of weeks at the most so I would think I I would certainly be my intention Alder Brunette. Thank you appreciate it guys. Yeah. Alder Morgan. My comments are that I'm really for this I as soon as I was elected. Oh. I'm sorry. I am definitely for this as soon as I was elected I was able to uh, reach out to our developer, Mr. Bader, and we had a, some good conversations. I know as I was campaigning, going door to door, I actually talked to some of the business people on that 1900 block of Main Street that have been affected so much by uh, the flooding there. Uh, Arby's just opened, and then a few weeks later, they got water up to the top of their counters. The people couldn't work, they couldn't do anything. so. When I talked to him and I heard his experience, his degree in civil engineering and all this stuff, I, I take a lot for what he tells me. He says that this isn't a guarantee it will stop flooding, but any kind of a thumb we can stick in the hole that Dyke I'm for. So uh, I hope we can get this through. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Alder. Any other comments? Alder Grant. <clears throat> Yeah, I agree. I think this should be handled separately only because stormwater management is one of our top issues in our city. We have a lot of people complaining about flooding, and it's true. Um, so I think the more people we can help under this category, the better, even if it means pulling from a different category. All right. Any other comments? Motion to, is to receive and place on file. All in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it and has been received and placed on file. Mayor? Uh, yes, Alder Johnson. Even though it was received and placed on file, if you could just have the record reflect an abstention. Oh, yes. Alder Johnson abstains from item 27. Item 41 is the million, do yeah, million dollars for, um, for stormwater uh, on private property. Uh, motion is Alder Ellenbecker, or <laughs> Director Ellenbecker. <laughs> Um, we started with 1940000 and then we allocated 250000 
And right now we have three items referred to staff, 520,000, 200,000, and 50,000. If they were, if we were to hold that money because it's being referred to staff, this item balance would be 920,000. There would not be a million left in this category. Um, you know, you always have the option if any of these come in or under their amount that could be put toward this grant program. But right now, if we're gonna hold the amount that we referred to staff, you're, you're at a balance of 920. Okay. Well, it's up to council if you wanna make it 920 or go over slightly. Currently the motion is to approve million dollars. Uh, motion to approve 920 with any excess money from the other items okay. going to this program up to 1 million. Alder Scannell makes a motion to amend this item to 920,000. Um, I'm good at it. With the caveat that any excess funds in the category would go to make it the, the whole million. Um, so that was an amendment offered by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Galvin. Discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Motion to approve as amended. Motion to approve as amended. Offered by Alder Scannell, Second. seconded by Alder Galvin. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. And that item has been approved as amended. We'll go back to item six, which is $25,000 for a, a tiny homes project. Can we get an overview from Diana on this category? Yes, on uh, the dollar amounts? The affordable housing, yeah. Yeah, Director Allen Becker, could you just give us an overview on remaining dollars here? Yes, the original allocation was $6 million. Prior to this meeting, we had 1,310,000 allocated, leaving you a balance of $4,690,000. Okay, that's very good. And on this one, I'm gonna go to um, Deputy Director Rainier Wig, because um, I know that she's been doing some research here. So I spoke with Alder Stoyer on this. I think this probably will be a receiving place on file. We've, we've got a lot of research on this already and are, act, are working the bets group right now so okay yeah, we, we've done a lot of work on it i'll receive it place on file if anybody has questions they can ask but i think the nice thing about this project we're gonna have the county the city possibly nwtc some of the carpenters unions habitat for humanity uh, a number of groups coming together so stay tuned absolutely thanks for your work on this so motion to receive and place on file by alder okay. stoyer seconded by alder scannell all in favor <coughs> signify Five is saying aye. 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 Proposed nay. The ayes have it, and that item has been received and placed on file. Item seven is a million dollars for grants to homeowners in floodplains. The recommendation is a referral on this item. I believe it was a request from Alder Galvin. Thank you. Um, we've been able to use uh, some different processes to try and reduce uh, flooding and. and uh, the mitigation that goes along with that, um, using uh, the retention ponds and things like that. But along the East River, uh, there is no place to do that. Um, some of the options were to buy a property and just turn it into green space so it would absorb water. Uh, but I've got many residents, uh, constituents there that they've lived in these homes. Some of them built the homes. Uh, some of them have been there. They raised their children there and they'd like to stay there. Um, some of the solutions they've been finding is to raise the house up raise the basement and then it doesn't flood and it uh, prevents uh, the damage uh, that occurs. So I was hoping that uh, with this grant process, we could get upwards of 40 or more homes that they would be able to uh, get some funds towards fixing their houses so they wouldn't flood in the future. Um, so that's, that's my story. Okay. And I think that, you know, I maybe defer to CED, but I think the, you know, the thinking was that we might want to do some research to see you know how many folks might be interested in something like this and then bring back a more concrete number um so director stick do you have anything to yeah, add just staff has had discipline obviously we're still waiting on certainly the federal government in terms of making some if there's any some map revisions pending and so forth uh, but certainly in terms of even looking at you know what the actual cost to elevate someone's foundation would be obviously we think that's certainly probably even higher than what we when we first started entertaining uh, the concept certainly based on costs we've so trying to really fully evaluate exactly how many how many um, properties we think we could benefit from this so certainly just requires a little bit more research I think from staff's part okay sounds good thank you 
Uh, so do we have a motion here? Motion to refer to staff. Motion has been made to refer to staff by Alder Galvin. Second. Seconded by Alder Scannell. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. That item, item has been referred to staff on to item 8, which is uh, $300,000 to be used for a director of urban planning and design position for three years. Alder Johnson. Yeah, and I, I, I proposed this um, after working with downtown Green Bay. Um, and, and of course, they, they came and spoke on this item. Um, you know, this, this is a position that is, is uh, we're involved, uh, and I know the mayor's part of this too, he co-chairs the Chambers Downtown Task Force. Um, and, and we've done a number of site visits to other cities. And if we uh, take a look at one of the items that consistently emerges as something that differentiates really great urban cores from those that maybe are uh, maybe struggling in certain areas is they have a position dedicated to this with uh, that work directly for their downtown organizations. Um, and and it's, it's part of it is intended to accelerate uh, some of the modeling that goes on when you're talking about for, you know, vacant parcel development, affordable housing, uh, larger scale commercial development. Some of it's looking at corridor development like the shared vision corridor plan that this body approved, uh, the EPA corridor plan that this body also approved, uh, taking accountability and responsibility for the authenticity plan, again, which is a council adopted proposal, uh, the design standards that are set. So the idea is that this position actually helps focus and accelerate investment in those areas, particularly with securing uh, other types of uh, grant sources and revenue. So personally, I'm because I wrote this proposal, I'm comfortable taking action on it tonight. But I also know that um, this is listed as a refer to staff, and I'd be comfortable with that referral if it meant getting, you know, staff on board that truly fully understand everything that's going on. So. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe I'll just do that just to facilitate this. I'll just make a motion to refer to staff. Second. And then it, does that come back automatically? Well, it's a referral, so, yep. so we'll <clears> it comes <throat> back when, when it's ready? When staff's prepared, yep. Okay. Okay, so that was a motion made by Alder Johnson, seconded by Alder Scannell to refer this item to staff. Any additional comments? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. That item has been referred on to item nine which is $60,000 to be used uh, for an employee in the neighborhoods division part-time for a three-year limited term position. Uh, this is offered by Alder Story, but I know some conversations have occurred with the uh, department. Heard, uh, uh, okay, Deputy Director. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm still here, I'm still here. Um, so this really came out of the discussions that was had at council with regards to our neighborhood associations that are inactive right now. We have um, about 15 that are inactive. We have 47 total, 15 are inactive. And it also came out of the fact that we've got maybe 10 to 15 more that we should form and we, we want to have the entire city covered. So this is a position that we had uh, originally through our department that did a whole lot of neighborhood work. This would only be a part-time position that would be exclusively for the, like look, working with the associations that are not active now, getting them up and running, and then working on forming new associations um, within the rest of the city. Alder Eck. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering what is, how is this different from Vicki's position or, um, over at NeighborWorks and you know what she does from this? So I would say the, so the GBN does a lot of support of the neighborhoods. I mean, there's a lot of activity that happens that way. The city has really been the, the impetus to form the associations because they are recognized by city council. So we want to make sure that when you form them, that you're following the process to get that done. You're, you're inc inclusive, for in other words. You're getting your bylaws, all that fun stuff together. And then reforming is just a matter of, I think it's time. I know the GBN has done some work on that, but it's just, it's a time suck to do that. So. Um, I think we just need someone dedicated strictly to the to reforming the associations that are inactive. It um, it it just seems like, and I you know maybe it's a completely different position, but I know in the past we've had different people that worked through the city and they didn't last. It was like it there was a, um, you know it was a part time position, so mm -hmm. it just that's why I thought it went over to NeighborWorks and it was the same type of what you're describing, but. Maybe I'm we've had a number, we've had a, a part-time position for a really long time in the city. A lot of times it was a student intern that did that work. So there was movement 
that way because they'd graduate or they'd move on. But mm -hmm. okay. Any other comments or questions? It's getting late, so uh, do we have a motion on that? Motion, motion to approve made by Alder Stoyer. Second by Alder Scannell. Alder Burnett. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a little <clears throat> conflicted. I, I support neighborhoods. I have areas in my district where I could really use a neighborhood association. We all know the value. I guess some of my concerns with a three-year commitment um, with benefits, not, not that I want to withhold benefits from a potential city employee, but if it's no benefit, it's said in here. Yeah, go ahead. Deputy Director. Looking at, we're actually looking at limited term, three yeah. years, like 20000 a year, no benefits. Okay. So yeah. we're looking for that student kind of level um, person to come in and do this kind of work. Okay. I, I just want to make that clear yep. because it's in the, okay. Um, I guess I could support it then. Uh, my, my fear, though, is when we add positions, even though it's 20-hour 20 20, 20 limited term, is that we get accustomed to the employees. They, they become a part of our organization. And, and when that time comes three years from now, many of us probably won't even be here, but on the city council anyways, I'm assuming we won't be living. But it, it creates like this obligation to continue. So I just want to make sure we're aware of that. When we add positions, they're not always temporary. We become attached and we know the work that these employees do. It gets difficult to eliminate the position down the line. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Additional comments? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. That item has been approved. On to 37, which is <clears throat> $1.5 million to be used for gap financing for development of affordable housing projects. This was um, from the department, so the dire deputy director. So I think it's no surprise that we need to create more housing in the city of Green Bay. And if we're going to do affordable housing, we need to work with our developers to fill that gap, period. There's just no way to do affordable housing without some type of subsidy with the city. We have um, currently, we've allocated TADA, those are the tax increment district affordable housing dollars from holding the TID open for one year. We had 1.1 million in that account. We currently have 813,000 as a balance because we've allocated some of those dollars. I can tell you now that I have seven projects that we're working on. And I know I've got two meetings with set up with the mayor's office on people coming in looking for funding for affordable housing. So this would be a pool of money that we'd put towards affordable housing um, to help subsidize those gaps in the creation of housing. Thank you. Second. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Johnson. Alder Burnett? Yeah, um, Cheryl, uh, direct, Assistant Director Rainier Wig. It's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> when you say gap funding, would that, that would just be a, that be a forgivable extension? How does that work? Is it a repayment? The ARPA dollars, it can't be a loan. It would need to be a grant. But I would, I would work it under the TADA funding policies that we have now in place which kind of lists out requirements for equity and, and some, I'd run it just like I would the TADA, the TADA funds. So there's a lot of things in could place you, that- Could you describe that program just for people that might not remember or might not be familiar? Okay, so that was just a director bonk. Mm -hmm. Ta-da. So <laughs> we have the ability to hold, in the state of Wisconsin, we have the ability to hold open a TID district for an additional year and use that money to create affordable housing. So we did that with, I'm not sure which TIDs they were for the first round, for the 1.1 million? Seven and eight. Seven and eight. Um, our plan is to hold, hopefully, TID 12 open, but we, we're not sure if we're gonna do that in 23 or 24, which will create some more money. So we're gonna have a gap year when we need gap funding. So the tax, and so we, the, actually the tax increment policy went through council. Um, it's administered through the RDA. Um, and it's really to, to create affordable housing units, whether that's multifamily, it could be single, it could be apartments above businesses. It's really supposed to be um, just to help with the creation of those housing units. And then every year we go back to the RDA with a um, plan of action on how we're gonna spend those dollars. So. Is it enough? I mean, 1.5 million when you're talking in really large developments of housing? I is it enough? Well, we've been, uh, so far we've been looking at 
three to four hundred thousand dollar requests that are coming in if it's five hundred or more it's got to come to council for final approval sure um, are you asking me if I'd like more money <laughs> well the reason here's here's why I ask this is a trick question <laughs> here's why I ask uh, I, it makes sense to build a lot of units that are affordable the, the prices of homes the price of rent is escalating like never seen before in my life and I'm still relatively young but it's scary mm -hmm. out there and we don't have enough housing in the city and when you see something like this it, it and I don't want to make Mr. Alveson nervous in the audience but it's like some of the other things that we're going to be considering right after this vote mm -hmm. I'd much rather put more money in this program to build a lot of units throughout our city rather than some of the other programs we have coming up next no matter how wonderful they are I, j I don't think 1.5 million is enough we could probably allocate more for this program so comment okay. on that if you could uh, well I think when I when I thought about the 1.5 I knew that in a year or two we would be having some additional funding coming through with that closeout on TID 12 which is going to be a little I think it's a little less than 2 million I think maybe we don't know yet we won't know that number but it'll be less than two million for that amount. So I figured this would be, you know, 1.5, which would hold us over until that TID. We could close that TID in a year or two. Director Sexual, did you want to chime in? If I could, Alder, just, certainly this is kind of one more, I guess one more program in the overall stack of programs that we would use to kind of close that gap. Certainly the TADA funds would be one. These ARPA funds could be one. Obviously, we did tax credits is another. Uh, and even just general TID financing if it's located in a tax increment finance district. So, so it's just kind of one more, uh, I guess, bullet in the gun, so to speak, in terms of how we can kind of deploy programs to try to close that gap. You're certainly not really looking to any one particular program usually to close a program. We're actually pretty fortunate if it's closed enough that we can actually affect a project with just one program. Uh, so we're seeing, we're seeing you know, the requests we're dealing with right now. Uh, usually trying to leverage two, uh, two or three of these programs together to kind of close a gap is not unusual. So Seven just, housing projects in the hopper. Mm -hmm. The average, you said, is about half a million dollar request? Well, mm -hmm. I think we're looking, it depends on the project. It could be two to four hundred thousand dollars we're looking at. It's four hundred thousand. So I just, it's just, <laughs> I, I support this more than I support the mm -hmm. other projects. So. If it's possible, I'd like to make a motion to uh, amend. I don't know if it, there's a motion on the floor, but I would like to approve it for two million. And if I get a second, I can explain why and how. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alder Scannell. Yeah, uh, we did. Yeah, that's, yeah. Well, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, we did not do that on the entirety yeah. of that last category. Yeah. Um, but we can start doing that again. Good yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We can, we will do that. Director Allen Becker, could you just give an update on where things stand with this category um, at this point? Yes. Started with four million six hundred ninety thousand. Um, we approved, we referred a million to staff, 300,000 to staff. We approved 60,000. We approved one point, well, we're working on the one five. Um, so if I take those out, that would leave right now. Um, that's assuming we allocated the dollars for refer to staff. It'd be 3,330,000. But otherwise we started with 4.6, Four four million six hundred ninety thousand, and we've approved sixty thousand so far out of this bucket, and referred two items to staff. Okay. You know, we also, I mean, I think part of the consideration too is moving the money. So, you know, when we have a diversity of this fund, these funding sources, we can help more people and move more money. So. Absolutely. So I would still want the other programs funded. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yep. So I think um, to honor what Alder Grant had just mentioned, we maybe should withdraw this motion to approve and then just go run through the rest of the items. Um, who, who made that originally? Withdraw. I don't know if there was a motion on the floor. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll withdraw. Motion okay. to withdraw. Motion to withdraw has been made by Alder Brunette, seconded by Alder Scannell. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Um, so we will move on to item 38, which is $500,000 for the HILP program. 
Um, Mayor. Mr. N Halverson spoke to this. Yeah. Sorry, I, I still just had a comment on this last item. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll see how the conversation shakes out on these other items. I'm not necessarily opposed to, to giving more money to this bucket. What I like about it is it's, it's what the staff asked for, and I don't think we have to be compelled to, you know, dispense of it all tonight. And if there's an opportunity to come back later, if there's a surplus, we can do that. Um, if I recall correctly, we set uh, a $500,000 limit on this, and I think with rare exception, we could go to a million for certain types of large-scale development. But the, the, the thing is, when you start getting into that type of development, I think it's important to recognize that this is gap financing. And somebody who's coming forward with that type of large-scale affordable development really ought to be going through WIDA because those tax credits are a lot more lucrative um, and, and achieve the overall like bigger goal, broader goal. And my fear is if we make it too easy, right, where people can come in and get larger sums, that they'll kind of bypass those other sources because, oh, it's easier to get it out of this fund, and then we're not leveraging other people's money. Still taxpayer money, but you're not leveraging other, like, state and, and maybe federal programs that, that can also close that, that financing stack. I would say that the, the other programs we have for housing, this HILP, the curb appeal, the grade being home, if for some reason that money is not moving, like we're not going to sit on it. I mean, if it's not moving for some reason, we should reallocate it. I could see that that happening, but let's say it's not a maybe that's not a home buyer market. Let's mm -hmm. okay, something's wrong. Let's move this money where we can spend it. So, right, that's an option as well. Okay, any other uh, Alder Scannell? Yeah. Just I appreciate where Alder Burnett is coming from this, I really uh, support that. Uh, but I was hoping we could do it without robbing Peter to pay Paul. So, let's see where we end up. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, all good on 37, Alder Campbell? I just need a little definition of what you call affordable housing. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Director Stick Schulte or Director Rainier Wig? When we talk about affordable housing with regards to this HILP program, it's 80% of median income according to household. And with Tada, it's a so, little. Tada, it's eighty percent as well. So per customer, per project, is this private people that purchase land want to buy build a house, or is this more apartment complexes? So for the large scale, that gap financing, it's generally a developer who's doing multifamily. So they want to do a lot of units. Apartments, individual yes. structure, duplexes. Um, I would say apartments. They're apartments. looking to do apartments. So low income, affordable. Well, I would say 80% of median income um, is considered affordable for Tada. And some of them are lower. So, I mean, some apply. If they use the weeded tax credits, they you're at 60%. I mean, if you're so depending on the housing project, it could be lower than that, but. Okay, thanks for the explanation. Any other comments or questions on 37? I'm hitting the thing, so I don't know if you're not seeing it. Yep, go um, ahead. Or if I have to go in the category. Oh, um, so my question is, um, on a lot of these items we are referring back, are we take, just so I can clarify and understand, um, that when we're saying all these are referring back or holding, is that money being set aside or what what's happening yeah director allenbecker had noted the dollar amounts there okay because yeah. there was quite a few there so mm -hmm. any other comments on 37 all right we'll move to 38 um this is that five hundred thousand dollars for the <coughs> help program this was addressed by mr halverson uh a few hours ago um but any additional comments it's the, it's from It's just from the staff? additional funding on top of the home improvement loan program to help make the house more energy efficient. Yep. Cheaper for the people to live there. Sounds good. Any questions for staff on that one? Alder Johnson? Maybe just a comment. Um, you know, at this particular program, I obviously represent uh, kind of a lower income census tract within our community. And I've spoken probably to at least a half a dozen residents over the last couple of years that have wanted to apply to this program, but there haven't been funds available. And these truly are individuals that don't have the ability to tap into a savings account. They don't have the ability to go get traditional financing. Um, so I've, I mean, I've 
talked and looked in the eyes of, of some of these folks that would really, this would have a huge impact. People who have flooding basements, but they have no other way to take care of it. They have, you know, different needs within their home, leaking roofs or whatever. So I, I do like this program because of how much of my district's impacted by it. I'm sure that's the case with many of you. Um, but this is a program that's been underfunded, I think, for a long time, meaning that the demand relative to the supply just is not in balance. And I think if this could help us get rid of some of that backlog um, and, and eliminate some of that waiting list, I, I think that would be a really good thing for those most in need in our community. I think some of those things that normally would be covered under the regular loan program, like your furnaces, your windows, the energy, could be covered with this grant, which mm -hmm. makes the dollar go further. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments or questions from council? Right on to 39, which is $300,000 for the curb appeal program. You might remember we talked about this one. This is for the exterior improvements to properties and neighborhoods. Um, we made some amendments to it. It was going to be originally just a straight grant, and now we're going to actually model that after what we did in the shipyard neighborhood, which is 25% from the owner, 75% would be the grant amount. So these are for things for landscaping, exterior, structural things, site improvements, things to make the neighborhood look nicer. Questions, comments on that item? On to 39, which is the $500,000 <clears> to be used for the Great Being Home Program down payment assistance initiative. Yep, and I think um, Director Halverson did a great job explaining that program, down payment assistance, help people buy homes. Green Bay, employee assisted. Any questions on that one? Alder, uh, Alder Eck and then Alder Wee. <coughs> Grant, sorry. I'm, I am a little concerned about this grant just because of the housing market. Um, everybody is typically buying homes at the top of their budget, and again, with the economy the way it is, we are encouraging people to possibly strap themselves in an unstable economy. Um, I get a little worried that I know from experience, when you buy a house, it's good to have extra money, but if you're needing assistance for the down payment, you are going to be strapping all of your assets that are extra. And again, you are, people are overbuying for houses right now or overpaying, and I don't think we're setting people up for success. If they need assistance to begin with to buy the house, I don't think that's wise, not to mention there aren't many houses available right now. Thanks. Uh, Alder Weary? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, if I'm reading correctly, it's only certain employers that we partner with or that are partnered with? So I think there are a couple of employers that have expressed official interest in participating, okay. large employers who would be participating as, as matchers. Um, but the program's open to any employer in the city of Green Bay with less than 25 employees, nonprofits and businesses. And then the, the city as an employer our employees are, are eligible as well. Okay, and there's no, for this, there's no income requirements, just anybody who wants to purchase a home, is that? So, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Deputy Director Rainier Wig, but um, in qualified census tracts, there would not be an income qualifier um, because of the impact on that neighborhood would be positive by diversifying the income. Um, outside of those qualified census tracts, there would be that 80% of median income as a, as a qualifying threshold. Hmm. Okay, because I see the value of diversifying it, but however, <clears throat> I don't want somebody making six figures, us giving some grants out to to buy a house. I, I really have no interest in that at all. So yeah. this one I could chew over a little bit more, but I, I don't know if I like this one as much. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Alder. Additional comments on that one? All right, and that's it. So we will go back to item 37. Motion to Alder Burnett makes a motion to approve. That was seconded by Alder Johnson. Additional thoughts? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. You guys have it. 38. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve made by Alder Johnson, seconded by Alder Scannell. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. You guys have it. That's approved. 39. Motion to approve. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Galvin. Any comments? Alder Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
Director Renier Wig, um, for this one, I, I think we've seen, you know, some of the results of, of what it's done. I mean, on University Avenue, I think is a good one. I don't know how many years ago that was done, but by Nicolay School, that whole strip was done at one point. Um, could you utilize more money in this? And I, I know you requested 300, but could you spend if you got a half million dollars? For curb appeal? Right. Because um, we can give you money, but if you don't have the time and the resources to utilize it, it's going to sit there forever, and I don't want that. You know, I kind of feel like when I talked with staff, I feel like 300000 is probably where we're at for being able to package all of that. Okay. I, I would say, I mean, I... So you don't want... I'm going to defer. I I really... <laughs> do you, do I don't we, want to take the money and then not be able to spend it. Right. Yeah. So I do guess Do we know how, say, uh, how much was spent in the shipyard area? On curb appeal? Um, we did 29 uh, grants back then. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have that. Um, I don't have that number of what we spent there, but we did, um, we did 29 um, curb appeal grants, and that was a targeted effort in the shipyard. Yeah. So, I mean, I think if we did like mailings like we did with the shipyard, there'd probably be a lot of people interested in the program. I think we, I mean, there'd be a lot of interest in it. So if you'd, if you'd like to give me more money <laughs> on that, um, I would say that we will do our best to spend it. But if we don't, we want to bring it back to reallocate it. Well, I would make a motion for this to be a half million. And then if not utilized, obviously it would be turned back. Okay. Alder Weary makes a motion to amend the dollar amount from 300 to 500,000. That was seconded by Alder Stevens. Discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Nay. No. The ayes have it. That amendment is adopted. What is going on? <laughs> that was great. I love it. Let's keep going. Entertain a motion. <laughs> motion to approve is approved. Is amended. Motion to approve is amended, made by Alder Weary, seconded okay. by Alder Scannell. Discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. That item has been approved as amended. On to uh, 40, which is the $500,000 for Great Being Home Program. Receive and place on file. Motion. Okay. Receive and place on file. I thought I had his <laughs> motion here, but um, motion to receive and place on file by Alder Weary. Seconded by Alder Grant. Alder Scannell? I, I don't support that motion. I understand where people are coming from on this, but on the second hand, I mean, it's to help people move into our community and that we want to grow the city that's not growing is dying and I think if we, I would like to see us perhaps reduce this reduce this by 200,000 and uh, at least it's something um, I think it's a program that that um, will have will improve our community we will help it'll help our community grow and that's important to me I think it we need to grow as a community and we need to look at making it possible for people to move in. And if this helps defray some of the costs for them to come to uh, be a part of Green Bay, uh, where they're gonna live, play and work and spend their money and uh, increase our tax base and help us grow, um, I think it's worth at least 300,000. So I'm against the motion to receive and place on file. Thanks Alder. Uh, Alder Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. I admit, you know, when, when Finance Committee first took oh, this sorry. one up, I think we, we supported this one unanimously when it came through. And I've, um, I don't want to say that I've soured on it, but I, I've since kind of contemplated, um, you know, if you had that amount of money, is there a different program perhaps that you can invest into and, and have a bigger impact? Now, that said, I do like the private sector investment. I've seen this program work in other communities, but in the other communities where I've seen it work, it hasn't been the same tight housing conditions that we're seeing and there there's i think some other gaps that that we're just not seeing right now right and this is meant to have an impact and needs to be spent in the very near future when this when these conditions right now are, are prevalent so um i i was initially thinking gosh i i i'd probably support a receiving place on file but i'm, I'm with alder skin on this i'd like to see maybe a reduced amount and the reason i'd like to do that is because of something that noel helverson said which is can we get some funding to get this program up and running and then see if it can maintain itself afterwards with the private sector support? And so I, I would support a reduced amount just to see if we can provide enough seed there 
to get this thing rolling, secure that private support. Because employers that I've talked to in particular, and I know these guys have done a lot more work on it than I have, but I have talked to employers that have expressed that they would potentially get some support on that. So if we can seed it and then turn it over to the private sector, I'd love to at least give it the opportunity to do that. So I'm going to vote against the motion only because I'd like to see a different motion that offers a reduced amount. Thanks, Alder. Um, Alder Galvin and then Alder Brunette. And then if people could just check the queue to make sure you don't want to be in there. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in favor of this program. Uh, I see a number of houses in uh, the blocks around my home that are up for sale, and they're starting to sit. And that's probably because of the prices and or uh, interest rates. But at the same time, we have a lot of employers trying to get people to move into our city and to take jobs. We have a number of people that are living in rental units that are just looking for that one opportunity to own a home, to sink their roots down, you know, raise their families. And I like the idea that if we put some seed money out there and if uh, the private industry responds well to it, we could see something that really takes off of here. I mean, there's a lot of companies right now offering uh, employees $5,000 for moving costs. Um, they're offering to, to pay off student loans, all sorts of things to make it feasible for them to come and work for them. And the more we can do to get people to move into this community, I think the better off we're, we are going to be served. Uh, so I'm in favor of, uh, like Alder Johnson said, if we want to redo this at a reduced amount of money, um, I, I, I'm very much in favor of it. And I, and I think it'll pay off. I think we'll see some real benefits uh, from this. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Alder Burnett. I'd like to thank you. I'd like to correct Alder Johnson. I most certainly did not support this at the committee level. No hard feelings, oh, though. Sorry. No, the reason is, <laughs> listen, you know, there are a lot of programs, there are a lot of opportunities to put money. We're looking at half a million dollars, which is way too much. I, I would be okay with $100,000, but even 300000 is too much. Alder Grant raises a really good point. There are a lot of houses right now that are on the market that are astronomical in price and the interest rates are high. And I'm not gonna get in the way of a personal business transaction for potential residents, but by having the grant here, it just seems like uh, there, it doesn't seem right uh, to spend money on this when perhaps we could put the money towards the gap financing for those larger units to develop multiple affordable uh, units. Uh, Alder Weary has also a good point. There are a lot of people who could access this program that don't need the grant funds, but the funds are still there. So I'm uh, I'm in favor of the receiving place on file. I would I would consider a much smaller amount just to have the program to see if it's successful, but not at half a million dollars. That's excessive. Thank okay. You. Thanks, Alder. Uh, Alder Galvin, and then we have Scannell, Act Burnett, still in the queue. So, um, Alder Galvin, Deputy Director Cheryl Rainier Wig. Um, with this grant, does the city oversee the expenditure of the money? Oh, NeighborWorks Green Bay actually is our subcontractor now for down payment <laughs> assistance through the home program. I see. So they they would administer this program as well. So we would oversee it as like a funding, a sub-recipient. Are there systems in place to prevent somebody making six figures from accessing this money? You could limit the income to 115%. I mean, we could put an income cap on this program if, if you choose. So you can, you know, make more than, no more than 115% meeting income, right? I'm thinking on this program, so okay. we could set the limits. On the program so so we have the ability to control it no one's going to take advantage of us and scam us I mean there are checkpoints in place here and the only point that I would make to director Rainier Wig and, and the alders is if we want police officers and firefighters to live in the city um, we wouldn't want to put that cap on right so as, as long yeah. as there's checkpoints right. in place things to stop people from from taking advantage of us and who are we to tell someone well, I, I don't want to get you in financial trouble by offering you money so you're going to take a loan that you can't afford. I mean, really, that's, that's, that, that to me is, is, is counterproductive. There are people paying more now in rent than they would have to pay for a loan on a house. So we're going to sentence them to living in a rental unit where they'll never be able to save any money to buy a house instead of trying to help them to buy a house? I, that makes no sense to me. 
and, and that's why I'm in favor of this program. I'm in favor of it at $300,000, and I, I hope it is as successful as it has been in other communities. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Alder. So the motion is to receive and place on file. All in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. 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 The nays appear to have it. We can use the board. And again, this is a, a motion to receive and place on file. Six, I vote no. Oh, so that receiving place on file fails. Motion to approve two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Alder Johnson makes a, a motion to amend <coughs> the dollar amount to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Seconded by Alder Galvin. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. No. <coughs> the ayes have it. The amendment is successful. Motion to approve is amended. Motion to approve is amended, made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Stevens. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. <coughs> hey, opposed, nay. Nay. The ayes have it, and that is adopted as amended, or approved as amended. On to the next category, which is crime prevention and neighborhood enhancement. Number 20. Yes, that'd be great. Um, coming in, um, crime prevention was allocated $2 million. <coughs> to date, we had allocated or prior approved $760,000, $760, leaving a balance of $1,239,900. And I just want to, there are two, four, six, seven items in here, and there is a request for almost $4 million. There's $1.2 million remaining. And so this is a category. You, there's not going to be enough dollars for all the items that are requested. Okay. Thanks, Director. And then where did we end the last category? Um, yes. <clears throat> affordable, ba uh, affordable housing balance was $4,690,000. We referred a million dollars to, um, we referred a million dollars in a $300,000 item. We also approved a $60,000, 1500000 and then the two fifty dollars That leaved a, um, a still a balance of $580,000. Okay, and that's with everything. Yeah, that is taking the million and the three hundred thousand that was referred to staff. That is still allocated, and right now is whole, it is being subtracted. It's being held. Okay. Um, those dollars are being held. Okay, thank you. Alder Eck. Is it possible to move that into the neighborhood enhancement and crime prevention? I, I don't know how that works, but not tonight because it is a resolution that's governing okay. those categories. So that would have to be a. A separate action. Okay. Item 20 is $650,000 for the Farland Park playground improvements. I believe that's Alder Campbell. Yes. This is a 16 year project of a park that was poorly designed back in the day for what odd reason. We have parking problems. We have drug problems this park is attracting problems and all of we're asking is to move the entities over to the design to make it more useful uh, to make it work uh, I was there today taking pictures there's no parking signs lady pulled right up there bunch of kids got out and I was just gonna go take pictures and I'm like um, ma'am did you see the no parking signs and it was, the sign could have fell on her car oh she didn't move the car we had some pizzas I introduced myself talked to a couple other people there uh, we had one constituent here uh, seems to have the problem I, I've witnessed I've taken uh, 
counts on the parks compared them to the other parks. Uh, there's some beautiful uh, tennis courts there hidden behind the, the mounds. Probably a good secret if you play tennis. I don't can't see them from anywhere practically. There's a nice trail that leads through the park. <clears throat> Looks like you get. I mean, if this was my backyard and 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 that's the way I bought it, I, the first project would be is to change my backyard to be efficient and and much more attractable. Uh, I don't know where these mounds came from. I know this was something that was uh, given to us uh, free. Uh, for the design from I think from New York here um, and it was, a, it was a bad design uh, originally this was to move the splash pad the playground the uh, miscellaneous uh, the shelter I'm sorry the shelter uh, and it came in at $1.2 million. I have a really hard time believing that it cost that much just to move a park from one side to the other a couple hundred yards. But I can understand. Uh, this park either needs to be functional or we should figure out what we're going to do with this property. It's been waiting a long time. It's got turned down many times, uh, three times. It was turned down, no funding available. It seems like it's always at the end of the list, but yet we can pump tons of money into other areas of the town that seem to be just attracting more and more and more money. And one of the things, and I discussed this with a few people, uh, you know, where do you live? I live on the northeast side of Green Bay. Oh, that's kind of a rough side of town. Well, remember when they used to say that about, about uh, Broadway? Now look at what we did with Broadway. A lot of hard work, a lot of long years. You know, people raise an eyebrow at that and they go, well, wow, that's really cool. So I'd like to see something done with this park. I know, I know there's other people that have great, great plans out there, but uh, just trying to do my uh, job, trying to keep the kids that are there uh, out of trouble. I mean, there's the, the splash pad. I can't, wish we had those when we were young. but. Uh, really we need to make this functional get this thing project going it's it's waited for too many years I don't know how many excuses there's probably a lot of council members here that have heard this several times um, anybody has any questions I, I'd surely answer them best best I can thanks Alder any comments or questions Alder Burnett uh, Commander Warwick is this a uh, park have a lot of criminal activity is this is the parking situation is this an at-risk neighborhood can you fill in this from a police perspective yeah the chief Davis is also online too uh, he's on zoom um, and he can explain but from from my perspective Farland Park has had its problems over the years I don't recall anything about parking I'm not saying it's not an issue but nothing that raises to the level of what got to me um, but the the parks on the on the north, northeast side tend to um, attract criminal activity. All right. Obviously, you probably didn't review the specifics, and I'm not asking for official position at you know whether you support it. But you're you're saying that that is an area of town that has a lot of criminal activity. In well, the park. not not that town. I mean, I'm just saying parks. I mean, when you look at crime prevention through environmental design, parks bring people together bring families together and if they can bring families together it's, it creates a sense of ownership in the neighborhood and once you have that ownership of the neighborhood that the tend the criminal activity tends to disperse so having a, a park as a designated place is a good place to have in a neighborhood okay uh director Ditchai, can you kind of fill us in like the background on this why is it taking i mean yeah. i was on the parks committee i know there's a lot of projects but what's your what's your perspective on this Sure. Uh, the majority of the park was developed prior to 2005. And at the time, uh, the park was about two thirds the size it is now. And we purchased property around 2005, which expanded the park. But by then, the park was already developed. Uh, so when it was originally developed, uh, it was intentionally designed with no parking lot. And the intent was to put everything close to the dead end roads uh, so people could park on the roads. 
and, and walk into the park and be close to the facilities. <clears throat> um, that is what has caused the problem. So people are doing that. They're parking on the roads, blocking the driveways. Uh, this has been brought up a numerous times throughout the years at Parks Committee and uh, the decision was to you know look at enforcement so we have been working with the police department on on upgrading the enforcement of the parking regulations there uh, but since 2005 when we expanded the park we did build a parking lot in the new area of the park and unfortunately what we're finding is people still prefer to park on the roads uh, close to the houses uh, instead of utilizing the parking lot because that's where everything is. So the long-term master plan for this park is as things get replaced, we'll move them closer to the parking lot so that people will want to park there and use that instead of the road parking. Uh, we just don't have the funding in place to do any of that at this point. Uh, the splash pad was installed in 2000. Uh, the playground is over 20 years old and we are planning on putting that replacement in our five-year CIP uh, for replacement soon. So if this funding does get approved, uh, we would not have to bond for the playground replacement uh, in our CIP. But um, yeah, this is, we're proposing to move the basketball courts, the playground, the splash pad, do the associated uh, stormwater management, and the ADA accessible walkways. So that's what this will fund. And $650,000 is enough to accomplish everything? I believe it is, yes. Okay, so it's a, idea was to refer to staff. So I, that's kind of what we have been doing. I don't know if we're gonna make a change here, but I'd, I'd be in support of this project tonight, but I could understand a refer to staff as well. Thanks, Alder. Um, Alder Weary, then Galvin, then Scannell. I can just give you a brief historical perspective, having been here for all those years. Um, I do know Alder Fredette, Alder Pitt, and Alder Sartwell, and Alder Lefebvre all banged their head against the wall with, with the problems created here. And they tried doing small, piecemeal approaches to solving it, and they never really worked. I think the long-term goal that's being presented here is what, what it's going to take. So I know they've all tried, but they knew it had to be a major project, and we just never fit it in. It never got fit in. Thanks. Thanks, Alder. Uh, Alder Galvin and then Scannell. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. I've worked at this park when I was when I was on the job, and it it it's the same as it was 30 years ago with the same issues, same problems. Um, and I don't know if, unless you're going to put a cop in that park. 24 hours a day, I don't think you're going to solve all the problems out there. There's a lot of more issues going on than just the park itself. Uh, we even had security cameras installed when I was in charge of the community police uh, up on a pole there, and we had to pay money to run that in there. Um, I, I would like to see you know, some changes done, but I prefer that being done through the five-year plan. But um, you know, as you can see, uh, from what the director just said that they're only looking at moving one item out of all the things that need to be done there so um, But I'm not sure if I'm in favor of, of six hundred and fifty thousand dollars either. That's that's uh, That's a big ask, but I could see a smaller amount that to kind of kick-start it get one project going so uh, People start using that parking lot more, but uh, you know Maybe they we have to go to a residential parking permit for some of those streets around there like like in my district um, we have residential parking at Astor Park on one street. Um, but anyway, those are my suggestions. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Alder Scanlon and Johnson. Uh, yeah, I, I think I support the whole thing. I think this park really has been <laughs> kicked around and kicked back, and, and I think it's time to really grab it by the, the throttle and, and get her done. Uh, but I'm wondering, to me, this doesn't, it seems to be in the wrong category. Uh, this sounds like an infrastructure thing more than a, a policing thing. I mean, there's, the, the park is policed and there are police issues, mm -hmm. but the changes aren't really made for policing purposes that I can see. It seems more like this is, uh, should belong in our capital needs. Uh, and I'm wondering if that's possible to move it there where there's more money for cover this and since there's not much money in this pot. Um, 
I, I think I support the whole thing, and I would support moving it, if possible, to the capital needs. I don't think uh, we need to look at it from a police perspective. I'm not sure that all these changes yeah. are, are made for the police. They're made for the community. They're made for the neighbors to uh, make the park uh, a better park. And in doing that, I'm sure that helps the police, or at least some. But as I think Alder Galvin mentioned, the, the policing needs supersede the park. It's, you know... Um, so I, I, uh, I support it, and if we can, I'd like to see this move to capital needs where I know there's enough money for it and would t uh, loosen up some money in this category that is kind of tight. Yeah. Thanks. I think the rationale would be the neighborhood enhancement piece of it. Um, but, you know, I don't, you know, I don't have the survey at my disposal here. I don't think parks projects were something that came up regularly. Um, and so in terms of the categorization, there isn't like an obvious place for parks projects to go so I would imagine that's why I ended up right. in neighborhood well, well, I'm wondering well I mean we did uh, there's thanks Dan well I if we can place it elsewhere where there's money for it and loosen up some pot here I mean uh, um, the uh, Bay Beach I mean that's a park so we did that in that area. So I'm wondering. It's a little bit of a different. It's a little different. Situation, it's a little yeah. different, but I'm wondering if we can squeeze it in. Anyway, yep. just my two cents. Thanks. Sounds good. Thanks, Alder, uh, Alder Johnson, and then Campbell. Yep. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Director Ellenbecker, uh, could you just uh, restate again what amount is available in this pot? $139,900. And. Right now, on the on the table, there is request for three million nine hundred seventy thousand five hundred dollars, which would be an over. There's two point seven million dollars more requested in this packet than available. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I, 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 so when I initially pushed my button, of course, I'd like to go through and 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 talk about all these items, but I'm kind of with Alder Scannell on this one. I like the project. I'd, I'd love for Alder Campbell to get a good win for his district on on something that that has really been struggling for a long time. And uh, and to Alder Campbell's point, to see some investment in that area that's maybe been struggling a little bit, I, this makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I would also support a refer to staff. Uh, as we've done with some of these other ones, only because I'd like us to, to staff to have the ability to maybe kind of, and, and if the referral, again, contingent like we've done with the others, is going to hold that money somehow, I, I don't know how that would work here with, with an overspent potentially account, but uh, I do agree that if we can maybe get this out of capital needs or uh, some of these other buckets that maybe have a little bit more flexibility. Um, and and uh, maybe just a quick question for Director Ditchite, the 650, I mean, have we actually done the work on that to quote out that that's exactly what the number is going to need to be no that's a real rough cost estimate with no engineering done at this point okay and that I just was curious so thank you thanks Alder uh, Alder Campbell and then Eck uh, officer I mean Mr. Ditch I, I think when we went over this you, you had said you had quite a few other playgrounds that you could come up with that pretty accurate estimate as you told me um, and I just want to clarify too uh, this came in at 1.2 to move all the facility over there in fact I think the uh, basketball which does attract quite a few of the cars that come there not just uh, vehicles full of kids these are people that play basketball of all ages um, and they use that and that seems to be when I witnessed most of the parking issues now I'm not it's not just a parking issue it's a poor design of a park now I want to state this is a 1.2 million dollar project as we first said it and I we sat down and we scribbled on some paper and we threw around moving what needed to solve the problem and that did include the shelter the shelter was the most expensive part so we were able to cut it down and budget it back down to half which now and we agreed that if we moved everything over there including the plumbing including the electrical over closer to the parking lot that now we had all that in place which would really cut down the next step when that would be to move the ADA facility over to the parking lot which would make the park complete it would give privacy to the neighbors all along the east end of the park where the trail comes through that connects the Eastman through three other, connects that whole neighborhood there. 
pretty much divides the whole side. And, you know, I have I go down there all the time just to check on it. Of course, I compare it to Kennedy, and I compare it down, down the street a little more uh, uh, to another park. And there's even another park in that area. Now, you know, th this is a busy park. I don't agree that maybe when you were on duty then, you know, times have changed. We can't compare that today. Maybe they're worth but maybe there's a whole there's a whole new generation of kids there. So I think that's out of line to say that they're not doing their job. Um, you know, I think this park is way overdue. Um, like I said, I budgeted it down to half to make it probable so that I thought it was reasonable that we could pass this through and, and, and share some of the funds to some of the other projects. And... Uh, and that's that's how I feel about it. Uh, like I said, basketball court, the splash pad, the playground, everything will be in place. The parking will actually get used. Um, you know, <laughs> there's more cars parked on the street than there is a parking lot. There's a problem with it. It needs to be fixed. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Alder Eck and then Stoyer. Um, okay, so two things I wanted to clarify. Um, uh, Director Digit, you mentioned that it was on a five-year plan. I just wanted, and um, did you say how many years into that plan we are? We are currently updating our five-year CIP, which will be presented hopefully around budget time. And in that five-year CIP, we we are going to have a hundred thousand dollars for playground replacement at Farland Park in that proposal. I don't remember specifically which year, uh, but all of, of all of the improvements listed in this uh, grant or in this proposal uh, that's the only one that we're recommending funding through the CIP so if this gets approved we would uh, recommend to replace a different playground instead of instead of Farland Park okay and then I also uh, second question is um, just to clarify because uh, you're mentioning the capital improvements which is technically lost revenue um, it, how much is left in there? What was the question again? Um, the, is there, there the request for from Randy uh, Alder Scannell was possibly taking it from capital improvements or technically lost revenue. What is the amount left in that fund? Director Ellenbecker. After all the items approved tonight, there is one million one hundred thirteen thousand two forty six left in that that bucket. Is that including the amount that was referred back? Wasn't there a million referred back? I, the, um, am I right the, on that? The I thought there was. Property and I acquisition, there was Alder a, Johnson's million dollars. Wasn't that included as the saved amount? That million dollars is included in there, correct? We started with $5.6 million. Tonight there was an allocation of 4.5 million, still leaving 1.1 million left in that category. That w it includes the 1 million set aside. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. It's not calculated. It's not calculated that that potentiality. Yeah. Alder Stoyer. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I've been over to Farland Park a few times too, just just taking a look and talking with other alders that have been there. It, it really needs some work. And Alder Campbell brings up some very good points about a park in his district, and I'm in support. Sounds like he did a lot of work along with uh, Director Ditchade on this. And I, I feel very strongly about it. I think that we should approve. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Any other comments on this item? Mayor, just Johnson. More, more of an inquiry um, and again it, it, when I had suggested before a referral just to figure out like what other buckets might be out there on, on what's really right now seems to be an overextended bucket if we approve this say tonight versus at the next meeting uh, director did does that change your timeline at all in terms of when the work would get done no it would not okay it's all there all right good discussion no Good discussion. Uh, We're going to go through all the items. Yeah. <laughs> it's an, kind of an odd, odd thing. Um, on to item 21 for discussion. This is $22,000 for speed boards. Alder Burnett. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, 
you know, we, we know we have a speeding issue in the city and the police department have done a wonderful job lately with very limited resource. Chief Davis has, you know, prioritized this amongst all the other things that he has to prioritize. Uh, but this is a request for speed boards, you know, those flashing signs that, that show the, the speed that a person's going, in my opinion. The evidence has shown that they're a huge deterrent to speeding. I think we should do more, but I think two for $22,000 is good. And where the police want to deploy them, then, you know, that's up to them. But I, I would love to have one in every single district because they work. But anyways, um, I, I would be in favor of this. I think staff approved it. So. Thanks, Alder. Is, does that get us two boards, Alder Grenier, or how many, roughly? Well, I guess I'd, I'd be interested in what exactly you're looking for <clears throat> the one that i'm thinking of is a speed limit sign that has the feedback underneath it or are you talking about the trailer mounted ones that you can put in the terrace uh, well i maybe uh, susan house if she could answer her and i responded maybe i'm not using the right language for the engineering world and i'm i'm gonna have to refer to the police we worked with the police officer um yeah, I, I mean, think it was a trailer. There were 11,000, yeah. I think, each. Okay, so the, the, the trailer mounted with the batteries on, right? Yeah. Okay, well, now I know what you're out. talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Okay, so. so that's for two? That would be for two, yeah. Okay. 11,000 sounds about right. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. And the police uh, referred a upgraded model to have a solar something to make sure that they work during the winter. Okay. Very yeah, that, that's probably one of the biggest problems we have with them is the battery goes out and then it serves no purpose while it's sitting there dark. Right, makes sense. Okay, additional comments on that, on this item? Alderweary? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, for the police department, how many do we have right now? Five. Five, okay, and I know they're always in high demand, right? <laughs> I always tell people to put in their name and eventually you'll be, you'll be called. <laughs> The, the five that we have are, is different than the trailers. We don't have five trailers. We have the five ones that we mount on poles or right. other locations. It's not the trailer okay. kind. So this would be new? Okay. Yes. All right. If there anything, are, I think that's a low number, there too. There are but some we can talk about that. on the trailers existing, right? Oh, there's two? I, I apologize. I haven't seen them in years. <laughs> there's one sitting on the north here on the road. Oh, good to know. There you go. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, if, if anything, two is low. I, yeah. I, I think I, I like the idea of having one in each district, but I know they're fought over. The alders can move them around? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I would do that, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other comments on this item? All right. We'll move on to 22, which is $1.8 million for sidewalk improvements. Uh, Alder Galvin. <coughs> thank you, Your Honor. Uh, when I became an alderman, uh, one of the things that I noticed in my district was a lot of people walking in the road, elderly people, mothers with babies in strollers, joggers, you name it. Um, they were walking the road, and when I would stop and ask them, uh, they told me because the sidewalks were in such bad shape. So I started looking into sidewalks, and I found out the city had kind of a goofy way of uh, getting sidewalks uh, repaired, uh, getting them up to ADA standards. So I talked to Director Grenier, and he started a program where he divided each side of the river into 15 different sectors. And they budget $300,000 a year uh, for sidewalk repair and replacement, but not all that money went to that. That money went to projects where they're putting in sidewalks, and any money left over was used in those districts. They started out far east and far west, and the first year they had enough money to get each get one of the, the districts done. And after that, they start getting in areas with older sidewalks, and so they haven't been able to make much headway since then. Uh, we have communities around us like the pier. They have a 10-year program to get all their sidewalks totally replaced, and uh, they budget the money and they do it. Um, we don't seem to do that. So I looked at the, uh, uh, the maps, and I talked to the uh, person in charge of sidewalks, and she said right now to do the, about, she estimated to do the middle of the city would run about $300,000 a year to do one section on each side of the river. To do the near Fox River, east and west, would run about six to $700,000 a year to get two sections done. So I'm asking for 
and uh, that way we would get three sections on each side of the river. Um, I, I apologize I didn't bring the maps here with me, uh, but the, the areas would cover roughly from the Fox River to Abrams Street um, and north, and on the west side it would cover in some areas almost up to Oneida Street, um, north and south. Um, we've had 10 claims made by citizens who fell on sidewalks in the last two and a half years due to injuries that they received, uh, broken shoulders, wrists, concussions, you name it. Um, I've had two emails unsolicited just this month alone from two other constituents talking about the sidewalks and how dangerous they are. Uh, as a grandfather trying to walk my grandchildren on a stroller on any of the sidewalks around my home, that kid's not going to sleep. He's going to jiggle like a milkshake and it just it doesn't work out very well. So I'm asking for uh, your support uh, with this, um, or at least some support. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Director Grenier, any comments on sidewalks generally or the program? Uh, sidewalks are probably one of the most misunderstood programs that we in DPW uh, monitor. The sidewalk itself is the responsibility of the adjacent property owner to make sure that it stays in compliance. Every year we go out and do an inspection uh, in certain areas of the city or on complaint and when we identify sidewalks that are non-compliant, the first action that's taken is the Common Council passes a resolution ordering that sidewalks are repaired. That's the big sidewalk resolution typically that comes out in May. If a resident fails to correct the problem within a specified time period, then the city by statute has the ability to go out and correct that sidewalk and charge the cost back to the property owner. So although the program is there, the only city costs that we're talking about are things that are a city, a city function. If it's a tree root that's caused the damage, if it's a pedestrian ramp, which we don't uh, assess for. Uh, so if there are sidewalks in your district that are non-compliant and need to be addressed, that's really that, that's very misunderstood. That's not a city responsibility to correct that. That responsibility actually lies with the adjacent property owner. Much like mowing their grass or anything else, it's their responsibility to ensure that that sidewalk is actually compliant and ready for somebody to walk on. Now, should they fail to do that, that's where we intervene, complete the action, and invoice them for the cost of that service. So just something to keep in mind. Just before we go back to you, Alder Galvin, so what what in reality would happen if if the Common Council appropriated this one point eight million dollars? How would that function? What what that money would be used for would be to repair the city's responsibility. Mm -hmm. These sidewalks, uh, I saw one the other day. It was stamped 1961. It is twisted like a pretzel. The trees that did it have been gone so long. There's no evidence of their existence anymore. There's actually sidewalks where the tree roots were so big, the city did a cutout, like a crescent cutout of the sidewalk, and that tree has been gone so long, there's no evidence that it was there anymore. I have people telling me that the sidewalks were broken by trees 50 years ago that were never repaired, because the city's never had a process to make sure that the sidewalks are compliant. Now, I've, I've had neighbors that have called me, and the city has worked with the neighbors to identify sections that they're responsible for, uh, but a lot of them have avoided having to have the sidewalks replaced because they can fill in gaps and holes with compound. They can have the sidewalk mud jacked up. I had one gentleman, he owned the corner lot, uh, corner of Baird and Grignan. His cost was looking to be $5,000 until I went through the process with him and the people from city, uh, from DPW that are in charge of sidewalks, and the cost went from Five thousand to two thousand dollars, so we had a considerable savings there. Um, but unfortunately, what happens is when someone complains, and the city comes out, they look at that buckled sidewalk by a tree, and they go, "Well, okay, the city's good for these two or three sections, but the rest of your sidewalk needs to be replaced." At that point, the citizen says, "Whoa, well, forget I called you," and the city says, "Fine, we'll forget that you called us." But that doesn't get the problem solved. We've been kicking this can literally down the sidewalk for 20 or 30 years, and our sidewalks are a travesty. I mean, I, it, it's, it's sad when you see old people in the middle of winter walking in, in the street because it's safer. And I, that, that makes no sense to me. So um, 
you know, the, the city has, has, has done a lot, but I think they can do a lot more. And so the, the 600000 would cover the city's cost in this process. Okay. And just Director Grenier, if you could kind of explain, that would that money ultimately come back to us because you're then assessing? No, that, that would be for sidewalk that the city cannot charge for because the, the longstanding policy of the city is if it was a city impact that caused the damage, like a tree root on mm -hmm. a terrace tree, a city-owned tree, or if it's a pedestrian ramp, which we don't bill for, that the ramps have an upcharge because of the special shaping uh, to come down to street level and because of the detectable warning fields for ADA compliance. So we only charge for straight line sidewalk up to the ped ramp, but the ramp itself, the city absorbs all those costs under normal construction. Mm -hmm. uh, so what Alder Galvin is talking about is those, our program, the, the new program that Alder Galvin's talking about uh, is capped at about $300,000 worth of city impact. Mm -hmm. That total contract is somewhere north of $1.6 million worth of sidewalk that's being built where only 300,000 of that is a city cost, the rest is going to the property owners. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments or questions on this item? Alder Eck? And we've got Johnson, Eck, Brunette, and Scannell in the queue, so. Alder Eck. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm on the Improvement and Services Committee, so I understand what um, Director Grenier is talking about, and you know, we had voted to um, change the requirements to make you know their ADA, ADA compliant which allowed a little bit bigger, I guess, holes or whatever in the sidewalk because walkers could, or um, strollers, wheelchairs, things like that would be able to pass. Um, so I guess I do look at this at like, uh, it seems to me that this is something that the, the property owner takes care of. So I, I feel like it, it's something that maybe shouldn't be um, funded. Okay. Thank you. Alder so Grant. Um, can I just ask for clarification as to how, I guess, this wouldn't be revenue loss? I guess, how does this fall within, a, sorry, Attorney Bunger. The recommendation um, is for referral, and that's partly why. Okay. Okay. That's what I was wondering. Thanks. Any other speakers? Alder Scannell? Yeah, I think I agree that uh, we should get going, on, but obviously we don't have the money to do it. So I'm hoping that when we come back to this, we can agree to uh, maybe three hundred thousand, six hundred thousand, something to get us through a year or two, and then we can start maybe figuring out how to pay for this regular. Uh, but obviously, there's just not enough money in the pot to take care of this, and uh, I'd hate to see uh, one item take up everything. So. Uh, but I think it's, you know, our sidewalks are pretty bad. And it's the sidewalks that the city is responsible for we're talking to about. So thank you. Okay. Thank, thanks, Alder. <clears throat> we good on this one for discussion. Move along to item 23, which is $500,000 for Packerland West Mason Intersection Safety Project. Uh, I think this is Alder Burnett. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm just going to right at the front say I don't know how much this would cost. I put $500,000 on there for lack of a better figure. Uh, Director Grenier, um, first let me explain the project. So Packerland and Mason's probably the worst intersection in the city. We know this. There are four frontage roads there all converging in a big mess. There are a lot of businesses. There's a high school. There's a technical college. There's a lot of uh, social service agencies through the Oneida tribe. There's just a lot going on there. And so the council in partnership, the city with partnership with the county, uh, we are moving forward with a, a rework of the intersection, but not a, a huge budget. It, it's more of a, a phased approach to improve vehicular safety and vehicular traffic. Don't quote me, but I believe the county of, uh, official that I spoke to said that every six weeks on average, there is a incident there that causes an injury. Uh, of a driver motorist that's pretty substantial and so um, I had a meeting the, the the project for next year next fall should be complete but it's phase one it is to deal with vehicular safety that's the priority at this point 
but then we talk about bicyclists and pedestrians. And so I had a meeting with several entities, the county, the Oneida uh, Nation government officials, Wello, and just a number of other people who have expressed some interest in securing funding through grants and other gifts towards this project so we can really focus on that next stage. I, I wanted to kind of bring it up now to see if the road work could be redesigned, but I don't want to delay this. This is a rather substantial change in an upgrade, so I don't want to delay that. But what I'm looking for, hopefully, is some dollars that the city can commit through ARPA. It doesn't necessarily have to be the full half million dollars, but it kind of that, I hate using this term because I just I cringe when I hear it, but the skin in the game. It, it gives us some skin in the game to say 100000 200 half a million dollars, and then the other entities that can write grants and secure funding through their government funds, we could really focus on the pedestrian and bicyclist safety. So I guess the question for Director Grenier is, uh, you know, I this is your world, obviously. What would uh, a figure be for phase two of the project, if we can call it that? Well, borrowing a phrase from the mayor tonight, that depends. Uh, Quite honestly, it's going to depend on what exactly we're looking at it, uh, as far as future improvements that need to be uh, included in that area, uh, how far out they go, and exactly how extensive they are. And the county is taking the lead. It's their step. I mean, we're working in partnership with the county, but Mr. Fontecchio is kind of like the lead engineer on the project coming up this Correct. year. Correct. Again, right? as you had indicated, this is for well over three decades. Right. Um, there's an insurance group, I don't know if it's AAA, I believe it is AAA actually, uh, that comes in every couple of years and does intersection crash study analyses across the county and for, uh, for at, least the last, at least the last 20 plus years, this intersection has been the most dangerous uh, intersection in all of Brown County. It's one of the top five in the, in the state of Wisconsin, if I remember correctly. Um, so the plan, the project that we had entered into with Brown County was primarily to improve vehicular safety out there. And we do understand that there are community partners that want to improve pedestrian safety. Now we have added some of those pedestrian safety improvements into the project that Brown County is doing, but the county as an entity doesn't deal with pedestrians right. yeah. within municipal boundaries, that becomes a local government responsibility. So when we started introducing all the pedestrian improvements in there, that was a, a major scope creep for the county, mm -hmm. and it was blowing their project out of the water to the point that it almost killed the project twice. Um, so we were very upfront that we're interested in working with those same community partners. We've entered into grant, uh, grant applications jointly with the Oneida Nation and with NWTC to connect the Three Sisters neighborhood to the commercial neighborhood. Um, so we're still interested in doing that, but it's going to be down the line some point. Yep. We need to get this vehicular project done first. Okay, yep, D definitely. I don't want to delay that. That's not without question anything I want to do. So um, I'd be fine when we get here to refer staff. Uh, if we need to reduce the dollar mm -hmm. amount, I'm fine with that as well. I just I want the city to have something pedestrian related that we can work on that can leverage the additional resources from all those other community partners. So, all right. Thanks, Alder. Uh, Alder Scannel? I'm sorry, I thought I... That's all right. Not me. Anyone on this item? No all right, so we will go ahead to 42, which is, this is an RFP for a gunshot detection project. So we'll go to Commander Warwick or Chief Davis if he's still around. Commander, or it looks like Chief. Chief, Chief's still here. Yeah. Go ahead, Chief. Yeah, I apologize for uh, being kind of casual tonight. I'm actually on vacation. Um, so this, for elders who were on the council last year, you probably remember this one. Uh, we came to council in the original wave of police department ARPA requests with one for gunshot detection technology. Um, the direction council gave us at that time was to go back and do an RFP 
to see what kind of technology was available out there. We estimated the cost of this project very conservatively at about $655,000 for three years, I think it was, of coverage. Um, we have since gotten an RFP posted and we're waiting to get responses back and we expanded the scope of the RFP for crime reduction technology more generally because we didn't want to just limit ourselves to gunshot detection. The idea is to find something that meets our specific needs in our city. Um, this is related to another item that I can talk about when that comes up for license plate reader technology. I could possibly see those two projects merging down the road, but it's just a little early to tell. Um, so our recommendation would be that we just stay the course on this RFP process, come back to council with a nice detailed plan for crime reduction uh, technology just in general. Great, any questions for Chief Alderac? Um, uh, is, do you have an idea of the cost? And it says that we're gonna get it on the 25th, but just an, uh, an estimate? It's really hard for me to give one right now. I, and part of the problem for me is I need to be respectful of the city's procurement process that we have started. We've solicited bids from vendors in good faith, and so I, I need to be really careful about speculating too much about what we might decide meets our needs. Okay, and um, second question, um, and I think we uh, that I had talked to you about when I when uh, I met with you, um, the effectiveness of the gunshot detection system. If we um, don't have it everywhere, how effective is it? The idea would be to to place it in the neighborhoods where we have the highest incidence of gun violence and in, in public spaces, not confined in people's houses. Um, it, you'll never have it in as many places as you wish you did, and that's one of the downsides of this technology is that it's pretty, pretty expensive to deploy over a large area. I think that's one of the reasons why we wanted to take a little broader view uh, and look at, at crime reduction technology just more generally because there might be some combination, for example, of gunshot detection technology with some kind of cameras or uh, license plate reader technology like we're doing the pilot program with now. But we, we wanted, we didn't, that's one of the reasons why we didn't want to limit ourselves so much. Okay, thank you. All right. Thanks. Any other questions for Chief? Great, we'll move on to 43, which is $126,500 for violence reduction strategy project. Is that you as well, Chief and or Kevin? Yeah, this is for, uh, as you know, we recently had an outfit called the National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform do an in-depth analysis of gun violence and the drivers of gun violence in our city. One of the recommendations that came out of that was the establishment of a, like a violence prevention, uh, violence interrupter program. And so this would be for technical assistance from some entity. There are a few that I, at least two that I know of that do this kind of technical assistance to help us set that. That program a lot of pitfalls to setting up something like, for example, an office of violence prevention. That you will, the, it's a hundred and whatever it is, $126,000 now. Um, that is money well spent if, to set up a, a project like that to avoid some of the headaches that it can cause you if you don't know what you're doing. Alder Burnett. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Chief. Hope you're enjoying your vacation, showing dedication. <laughs> it's almost midnight, for heaven's sake. Um, regarding this plan, now I know we did the, the partnership with the National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform. Would that group be taking the lead on this next step? Um, I am enjoying my vacation. I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing on vacation. Um, and it, it could. Um, I think 
the smart thing to do if we get this funding approved would be to uh, uh, go through a procurement process to, to find the right partnership. You know, yeah. I don't want to speak for NICJR, but sometimes these entities can get pretty busy these days. And so, um, but yes, I mean, it, it, that is a service that NICJR provides as far as I know. You said, you know, we would have to go through the bid process, and it would be the the most qualified bid on a, a number of criteria that I would imagine the purchasing manager would work through. Is that right? That's one way. We may end up doing a sole source procurement, um, you know, but whatever we do for that kind of money to secure professional technical services, we, right. we have to follow the Okay. Rules. I, I'm just going to be completely blunt. I mean, I, I'm looking at this organization. I mean, I, I love the, the work that they did with us, and they identified some of the issues and the problems. When I look into this group and, you know, reimagining the police and championing police cuts and budget cuts and officer reductions in other municipalities, that stuff kind of makes me nervous. So when we uh, go to – we're going to allocate dollars towards this initiative – I want to make sure that the organization we pick is a good fit for Green Bay, that we don't get into some of the more controversial things that I think a good number of people in the city would reject. So thank you, Chief. Thanks, Alder. Any other questions or comments for the Chief? All right. And then number 44, $217,000 for a license plate reader recognition project. Chief. So this is related to crime reduction technology, and this is where, while we have been having the gunshot detection conversation that morphed into crime reduction technology, meanwhile, uh, we had approved, before I got here actually, I think they approved this uh, pilot project for a, a vendor to come in for free for 60 days and provide us with automated license plate reader technology. That 60-day pilot project will end on September 1st. Again, this is something that if we decide we want to we want to buy it, we'll have to go through the city's procurement process. Uh, and this is to set aside money. We estimate the cost of the of a license plate reader program, the size of the pilot project we have now, at about seventy thousand dollars a year. And so between this and some community block grant that we have, uh, this would cover us for three years, we estimate, just for something the size that we have now, which is about 28 cameras at fixed locations. One of the other things we will likely be exploring in the larger crime reduction technology discussion is is this technology we want to mount on patrol cars, for example, like a lot of agencies do, and they get really good results out of it. Uh, but this would just be to maintain this program. I don't think anybody realized how, uh, how useful this technology was going to turn out to be just in, in a, a limited-term pilot project. Um, so this is to secure something that we're pretty sure we're going to want regardless of the outcome of the larger conversation about technology. Great. Questions on this one? Comments? All right. Thank you, Chief. Mayor, real quickly. Alder Johnson. Uh, Chief, you had mentioned that that pilot program ends September 1st. Uh, do you anticipate that there would be a lag from the, from the end of that pilot program to the time that you would start something? I'm just trying to understand maybe the time sensitivity around uh, around that authorization? <coughs> there pretty much has to be a lag. It's because we don't want to put out any kind of RFP or anything like that in the middle of this pilot project, and we have the larger one going, so there will be a lag no matter what between when this pilot project ends and hopefully the day where we start a permanent license plate reader program in the city. Okay, one more question, Mayor. Um, would you, would you perhaps, Chief? Um, and I'm not sure where the, you know, where the rest of the council stands on acting on this item tonight. But if, if there was a referral, would you be comfortable with that it, it, to give us maybe the ability to have you report back on how that pilot program went in its entirety? 
Yeah, I, I would be comfortable with that approach. Um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to want something like this, just having seen how successful the pilot project has been. But I'd be happy to come back uh, in September with some detail about the results. Yeah, and I think, of course, another option, we've done this with a few other items where it's, it's conceivable, and I'll leave it up to council here, but where maybe we authorize the funding, but that process still occurs, you know what I mean, before we choose a final vendor. Yeah, I think, you know, in an ideal world, we would have waited until we were a little closer to, to needing the money. But just given the timing of the ARPA conversation, we wanted to put a marker down on, on a portion of that um, policing related two million dollars for for something like this. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alder. Any other questions? All right, we'll go back to item twenty, which is Farland Park. Uh, the recommendation is referral here. Any motions? Move to approve at six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Motion to approve by Alder Brunette, seconded by. Approve the project. Motion to approve the project made by um, Alder Burnett and seconded by Alder Stoyer. Discussion on that. Alder Scannell. Well, I, I do support this, and I, I'm wondering if we can somehow make the motion about switching it to another bucket somehow. Uh, that's, I mean, that's part of the reason for the recommendation is to allow for staff to work on on eligibility questions. So, it's a, so, so it is a motion to refer, not to a motion to approve. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm saying that's why the recommendation existed, was to do some of that work and to fine tune the dollar amount that would be appropriate for for some of this stuff as well. Right. So I, I don't know if I want to approve this. I think I'd rather refer it back and see if we can't, or refer it to staff, and see if we can't move the bucket and uh, move to another bucket and uh, get this done. Is there going to be any money? Yeah, for a second time. Enough money. There's yeah. just not enough money here. Yeah, I, I think um, the way I understand it was neighborhood enhancements. That's the way I looked at it, not necessarily from a policing or public safety standpoint. I, I'm curious, Attorney Bunger, are you still here? Uh, maybe you went home. Okay, she's still here. <laughs> I'm not sure who's here yet. Uh, she's dedicated for sure. Um, would it be appropriate, because I really wanted to approve it, that perhaps the motion would be to approve contingent on staff determining uh, the dollar amounts per category, and then we could vote on it at the council meeting in a few weeks? Help me out here. <laughs> Theoretically, you could do that. I'm practically, I'm not sure if staff is going to be able to have that information ready. So I guess at that point, you could also do um, at that meeting, you could just do a motion to hold. Um, if you don't have the information, or if staff doesn't have the information available to be able to give a determination as to figures and a determination as to a qualifying eligibility like a solid determination because it seems like that still seems that it it appears that that is still up in the air so do we have enough uh, director Ellen Becker do we have enough for the 650 and the neighborhood enhancement funds keep in mind we haven't voted on the sidewalk at 1.8 million yet yes coming into tonight we have one million two hundred thirty nine thousand nine hundred dollars available Yeah, maybe uh, I'll withdraw my motion just in case council or um, Alderman Campbell wants to make a motion or yeah, motion yeah. to withdraw made by Alder Burnett. Second. Seconded by Alder Johnson. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Alder Scannell. I'd make a motion to refer to staff to find out if we can't maybe put this in uh, the capital needs and organization priorities. To me, it seems a lot like Bay Beach. I mean, we're Bay Beach, we worked on the pavilion here. We're moving, we're working on a, a, 
a shelter, and maybe each we worked on a ride, and here we're working on playground equipment. It seems to me it's all equitable. Uh, but anyway, to see if anywhere or any other pods. The, the rules doable. are 450 pages long. <laughs> yeah. Just, just so you know. I know. I, know, <laughs> I, I don't care. It's too late. Motion to approve. Figure where the funding's going to come from. Period. Motion to approve. Well, refer it. Refer it. Motion to refer back to staff to. Uh, He's, he's got you the floor. You can talk about the motion. Okay, I just have my hand raised. Yeah, Alder oh. Scandal has the floor. Yeah. Uh, so a motion to refer back. Uh, I want to see if we can't uh, approve this in another bucket. If not, uh, it can come back to us and we can approve it in this bucket. I, it, it needs to happen one way or another. But if we can get into another bucket, that's my preference. So that's my motion. Okay, so Alder Scandal makes a motion to, to refer. refer back. To refer to staff is that seconded seconded by alder galvin alder eck um okay so there's 1.2 million and um if we take out the 1.8 million on the sidewalks we have enough for all the rest of it i guess that that's what i wanted to to um consider um because the 1.8 is more than we have in the bucket to begin with right. is my whole point on that one so and I realize there's more left in the other one, um, but just keeping that in consideration. Thanks, Alder. Alder Johnson? Yeah, I, it, it maybe our math, you know, obviously without being able to compare notes, uh, I have it in an Excel spreadsheet here, but I'm showing that if you take out sidewalks, you still have 1.5 million worth of requests. And that doesn't... Right, and that doesn't even include the amount that the chief can't put a dollar figure to. So I, I don't, and that's hard to pinpoint, right? It could be anywhere. Okay. So, so my point is though, I have $1.5 million of tangible requests minus sidewalks. I don't know how far, you know, Alder Galvin wants to fight on that one either, but I just wanted to at least kind of frame that up a little bit. That's why I think a referral, I, I, I like that motion. And really, to me, it's like staff, Figure out how to get this done and just tell us where the money's going to come from. <laughs> and it allows staff to just give some options to for council right. to contemplate. Mm -hmm. uh, additional comments? All right. Motion has been made to refer to staff. It was seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. That item has been referred on to 21, which is uh, $22,000 for speed boards. Motion to approve, made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Stevens. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. On to $1.8 million for sidewalks. Motion to approve. Or Re refer. Ref refer would be. <laughs> refer? You want to refer? For staff. No, I mean, I, th yeah, I think all that stuff can be worked out with the alder and with staff. All right. and motion, to refer staff. motion has been made to refer this item back to staff by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Stevens. Discussion? None. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. On to 23, 500,000 for Prackerland West Mason. This too, I think, is recommended for referral. And the only thing that I would say on this is, um, I know council has kind of made the point that if there are existing grant funds available, you know, they want to be made aware of that. There is a Safe Communities Act that is open for submissions. I think it closes early September. Um, I did flag that for Wello, so I know that they're doing some some research on that. Um, so just wanted everyone to be aware of it. Yeah. Uh, I'll second that. Okay. Alder Scannell makes a motion to refer this item back to staff, uh, seconded by Alder Burnett. Alder yeah. Burnett. Yeah, uh, refer to staff would be great. Obviously, Director Grenier knows the project well. We're going to move forward with the project and do the vehicular safety. So we're looking at that stage two, phase two. So just look at, give me ideas on what it would cost and some options, and then we can continue that conversation with some of the other partners. Sounds good. Any additional comments? Alder Eck? So I'm just clarifying because we, you know, before we were talking about refer to staff, 
then the money was being tagged with it. Am I correct in this? I, I think this one's a, uh, in a different. Because the one point eight. This is in a different category, right? Okay, I mean, it because is because it's so oversubscribed as it is. Yeah, that's right? why I was wondering. I just want to clarify because the other yeah, ones we said that. I don't it, think there's any way to do that. Okay. Yeah. So it's a possible yeah. not five hundred thousand, <laughs> right? Well, and to you know Alder Scandal's point, I think there is the possibility of of fitting these things in different categories potentially. Um, so that that'll be part of the work. Okay, thank you. Additional comments? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it, and it's been referred to staff. 43, 126,500 for violence reduction strategy. Uh, motion to approve, made by Alder Scannell. Seconded by Alder Galvin, Alder Brunette. I, I mean, I can go on board with the motion to approve, but I, I, I want to put that caveat on there that we are guaranteed that it would be a competitive RFP process. I, I don't like the idea of a single source provider on this particular issue. Any comments on that, Chief? Does reduce our flexibility a little bit if we find a, a provider that we think meets our needs and would in a sole source, but I, I'll make it work. Well, Alder Scannell, are you happy? So the this group you're working with, you're fine with them. I'm sorry, Alder, can you say that again? Yep, the group you're working with, you're fine with them now? Um, I would say that the group that we're working with has been very good up to this point. I know that they are also very busy because they work with a lot of, of major cities. Um, but, you know, we've certainly, I've always had a good relationship with NICJR. This is the city that I've worked with them in, and I've never really seen a lot of reason for concern. I know that they do have some uh, experts on their staff with considerable policing experience, mostly out of Oakland PD, uh, but you know, certainly we want to make sure we find the right organization for our city to work with. Okay. Additional comments or questions here? Alder Galvin. Thank you. Uh, just going to ask Alder Burnett, again, what was your concern? I mean, we're, we're talking 100 and Twenty-six thousand dollars. What were? What was your concern? The chief seems very happy with the group he's working with. They it seems like they have a very good relationship. Um, okay. I'm not sure sure what what your concern was. No, sure, a, a competitive bid process I think would be appropriate. Uh, they do do a, quite a bit of work in larger cities. I, I grant the chief that. But if you again, I don't want you to assume that I'm being overly political. But we need to have organizations that understand Green Bay and understand our history and I'm not comfortable with the whole defund the police reimagine police vernacular all that language makes me very uncomfortable and so there are organizations out there that can provide the same sort of work that aren't as politically charged you're so you're saying that this group that the city has done work with is politically charged I didn't no, I'm saying I'm trying not to be politically charged, but they are very clearly uh, discussing things like reimagining policing and highlighting that other municipalities have reduced their police forces and cut staffing. I'm not comfortable with that as a single source provider. I think we need to look at other organizations. I mean, just on their, because on their, you asked, and I wasn't going to mention this because I don't want to, question their integrity I'm just saying I feel more comfortable with a competitive bid process like we do with a lot of these sorts of contracts and and if all the bid process all the companies that come to us have this same kind of material on their website what do we do then well you're minimizing the competitive bid process there could be other organizations that can do the same quality work for a lower cost than what we're proposing I, I, I guess I'm just concerned. It's, it's, it's we're going down this rabbit hole again. Of uh, you don't like some of the material that they've dealt with, 
some of the recommendations they made or some of the articles that they've written. And because of that, we have to go out and spend time getting competitive bids. If it was merely a money thing, I could get on board with that. But again, it's, it's because you don't like their I ideology or, or I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm having a hard time struggling because in some cases, some of the stuff that, that you're not agreeing with may be the answer to some departments. Um, you know, I mean, police work has been redefining and reinventing itself for hundreds of years. And, and the only way we're going to progress is if we keep staying, you know, on, on as, as sharp as we can and, and not getting into a rut. So I'm, well, I'm, I'm struggling with this, supporting this. Alderman Galvin, before I even mentioned that, um, Chief Davis mentioned that they'd be going to a competitive process. That was his ideal. He said that before I even mentioned this group. As, as concerns. Well, I guess I misunderstood him. I, I thought he was saying that that uh, we've had a good working uh, relationship with them, and now, yeah, that's correct. Uh, we did. I mean, I I'm not questioning the work they have done for us to this point, but when he proposed this, he mentioned that is their process to go through a process to go to bid. Like I didn't put that words in his mouth. I'm just making sure that the motion reflects what he originally said all right very good I mean and, and I will say this and I, I take no I, I'm not going to apologize for this when organizations out there not saying this particular organization but organizations when we had a whole situation with riots burning down our cities and you had a large political movement saying things like reimagining policing cutting down on weapons that police can buy uh, diverting funds from police officers in a lot of ways villainizing police officers I'm not going to engage in that for the city of Green Bay I think we can do better and so a competitive process that goes through all of those things I think is very important so thanks Alder. Alder Scannell? Yeah. Just to the point of uh, what uh, any group may propose they may propose a police force be cut that doesn't mean it gets cut. We're the ones who make the decisions here. So I don't care what group we work with and what they propose. And they can, you know, spit storm, you know, as much as they want and see what sticks to the wall. Fine. We're the ones, we're the wall. We decide what sticks. So I'm not concerned at all about uh, uh, what the former alder <laughs> seems to be concerned about. I, I, I don't understand. We decide what happens. Not, not what a group advises us to do. And I think every group should come in and they should tell us, you know, be honest with us, tell us what they think, and then we work with that. And I'm not afraid of any group proposing anything. Telling us we need 100,000 more police officers. Telling us we need 50,000 less. I mean, go right ahead. Spit it out. We'll work it over. We decide. So I don't care. Thank you. All right, Alders, it's tomorrow. So, uh, Alder Eck. Um, okay, so uh, in reading through this, it's uh, reducing recidivism. This is working with people who have been violent um, with, you know, the gun violence. Um, so it's a group working with the people. That's part of it, right? Uh, this is what I'm reading correctly. So it's it's a mentoring program. It's things like that, working with criminals within our city to reduce recidivism. I just want to clarify that because it, it sounded like um, it, there was maybe a misunderstanding of what, what is on the table here. So it's basically hiring a... Um, life coaching that's listed on here um, so I and I agree and I actually have a particular program I could recommend but no, I won't do that here um, so it's a bidding process and I think that makes sense okay thanks all there so I um, can maybe just yeah, clarify Chief, go ahead. a little bit to help with the discussion um, you know like I said I've worked with NICJR in two different cities and the comments about them um, Engaging in any kind of anti-police behavior is news to me. I've never seen it in, in the two cities that I've 
work with David Muhammad and his team. Um, and I, I feel like it's important just to surface that issue here tonight. And anything that we come to council and seek to actually fund uh, once we identify the right fit is going to be what works for us here in our city. Um, and the, the NICJR work is exactly as Alder Eck describes. It, it's more than just a policing solution to a violent crime problem, which is what works and, and reflects best practices. We, we just won't police our way out of a gun violence problem. And so, you know, that's why we need the technical assistance to implement a plan like this. So hopefully that helps. Thanks, Chief. Any more discussion on this? And do we have a motion? Right. On this one? I think the motion was oh, to no. approve as long as it's a competitive bid process. process. Okay. There is a motion on the floor. Okay, motion to approve with competitive bid. Yes, yes, yes. Was made by Alder Brunette. Was there a, a seconded by Alder Eck? Alder, Alder Scannell is claiming, claiming seconding on that. Oh. Um, <laughs> any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed nay, the ayes have it. And that has been approved. I apologize, I need to go back to 42. Thanks to uh, Treasurer Manley for spotting that. Um, so this one is the RFP for gunshot detection project, which is not really just gunshot detection any longer. Um, so I don't know if we would need. Hold, motion to hold. Sure. To the next council meeting. Okay. So I heard from police chief. Okay. Second. Motion to hold until our next meeting made by Alder Johnson, seconded by Alder Scannell. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. On to 44, which is $217,000 for license plate reader recognition project. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Grant. Mayor, just a question. Alder Johnson. Uh, Chief Davis, if you're if you're still there and can hear me, uh, there's two hundred seventeen thousand dollars being requested here. Uh, I think you said it was seventy thousand a year, which would be about two ten. Uh, but you had also mentioned that block grant was going to be covering some of this expense. Uh, could you just help walk us through that? Sure, we've got about sixty-ish thousand dollars in unused community block grant funds. Uh, for use on projects that impact quality of life. I hope I'm describing this the right way uh, in HUD areas. And so a number of the places that we have identified through the pilot project where we would want to permanently install license plate reader cameras are in HUD places. Some of them are not because we used a, a kind of equity informed process to decide where we wanted to put cameras. And so we're, we've been working with the finance department and we are sure that uh, that block grant money can be used for this project. It just has to be for the cameras and HUD areas. So when you add all that up, the math comes out and it's enough to afford this for three years at our estimated cost. Okay, so, so again, I think just my math's off maybe then. Do you need 217 or do you need 150? Yeah, I should, I should actually clarify that so for three years at seventy thousand dollars a year that's 210 um, I, this is where I, I ask for help from the finance department on the math but there's also a uh, startup cost that gets factored in there and I want to say that's about seven thousand dollars so the total cost of the project would be 200 so yeah this number is wrong of 217 thousand dollars it doesn't take into account the block grant money i see what you're saying now okay so if we did a motion for was it 157 157 that that's adequate i would check with uh director ellen becker before we commit to that just to make sure we're not making a mistake but that sounds right director when we met and we um, discussed this project, um, correct, we said the total cost would be about 217000 backing off what we think is available for CDBG. We actually put in the detailed request of 147000 is what was requested from 
basically ARPA money with um, CDBG bringing it up to that total of about 217. So it's 147? just seems to be one of those accounts that again is over oversubscribed so if you can save 60 <laughs> yeah might help yeah I apologize I don't have the details with me I can't remember how much CDBG said they would have available to this project um, it was 66 okay not it, right it was 150 Correct. It says 147 are supporting documentation, but if, if there's 66 available from CDBG, 217 minus 66 would be closer to 151, 151,000. Amend my motion to approve 151,000. Okay, Alder Scandal makes, uh, offers an amendment um, to change that dollar amount to 157? One. 151. 151,000. That was seconded by Alder Johnson. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All right. Opposed nay. You guys have it. Alder Scannell offers a motion to approve as amended. Seconded by Alder Galvin. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. And that item is adopted as amended. On to last category. It's very exciting. Um, this is arts, culture, and tourism. Oh, maybe an update on um, crime prevention and neighborhood enhancement. Yes, uh, we started with one million two hundred thirty-nine thousand nine hundred dollars. We approved twenty-two thousand one hundred and twenty-six five one hundred fifty-one thousand. That still leaves a balance of nine hundred forty thousand four hundred. Then we referred three items. Really referred referred four items back to staff. Okay, so we've got we've got some work to do on that one, and then arts, culture, and tourism. Um, balance there, director. Um, the original allocation was one million five hundred thousand dollars. To date, they was there has been approval for three hundred twenty-five thousand, leaving one million one hundred seventy-five thousand available for allocation. And in your packet, there is a, um, a total allocation or a request for. Two million one hundred thirty thousand. So with all the requests, you will be nine hundred fifty-five thousand over. So you've got one point one, um, and you have a two point one million dollars worth of your requests. Okay, thank you. Uh, on to item ten, which is from coming from Alder Scannell, fifty-five thousand dollars to be used for a bronze tree marker project. Uh, I think referral is the recommendation here. Alder Scannell. Uh, yeah, just a little background on this. I've been working on this for like five years or so. Um, uh, we got the site for it allocated. Um, it would be just north of the Ray Nitschke Bridge by the boardwalk there, uh, between, by the, between the hotel and the bridge, um, where there's a marker there already uh, about the old military road. Um, I don't know if there's any questions for me. I think I wrote up quite a bit on it. Uh, I think it it uh, fits into the programming for our Arts Commission, which is uh, to promote art in the area. It uh, And it's not just local artists. We want to include, there was, I remember when I first uh, started with the commission, we talked about networking with other cities to have um, maybe buy some of their uh, local artists work and they'd buy some of our local artists work and establish those networks and in any major city you know you're going to have artists coming in from from uh, uh, larger cities that which would be the case here but it all promotes the arts and, and encourages the arts and it's good for the arts locally so um, I think it'd be a good thing I'm tired Thanks, any questions for the alder? Alder Eck. Okay. 
Um, so I, I have a question, and one, uh, it, have you checked into any grants um, in cooperation with um, say Oneida? Uh, actually, uh, the Oneida, uh, I would expect us to honor all the local trans, but the Oneida never used tree markers. Oh, okay. So it was the Ho Chunk and, and uh, Menominee, and we uh, initially we went to the Ho Chunk and discussed th this with them, but they didn't have any funds for it, or, and there was no grants available. Then I sent, went to the Art Commission to see if we could get grants, see if we could get things going, um, but. Uh, they had a lot on their plate at the time as far as getting their fundraising going and everything, and then COVID hit, and then here we are. Okay, thank you. Merry Merry Christmas. Christmas. Additional questions? All right, we'll move on to 11, which is $100,000 for the Chris Kindle market. Um, Ms. Koken gave us the overview yesterday. <laughs> um, oh, any true. thoughts or questions on that one? I think the recommendation is referral here as well. Alder Galvin. It's for Alder Johnson, because this would be taking place down in the area. What, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, to be clear, I, I submitted the proposal, but this is also funding for, my, uh, for the organization I work for, so I'm going to abstain from the vote. Uh, as long as it's not poses a conflict, I would be happy to factually answer questions without bias. Sure. I'd appreciate that. Uh, so, again, your, your direct question. What, what, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, it's, it's, it's <laughs> that's, value. That's a pretty it's, biased it's, question. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's, it's worth to our community. You know, I mean, she talked like the, these have been done in other places. Um, how effective have they been? How many people does it bring in? I, I mean, because I, I know you guys have had programs down on the weekends during the holidays before. I've participated and I enjoyed it. Uh, but it sounds like this actually adds, you know, it takes it up quite a bit compared to what you've done in the past. Um, again, just factually speaking, I mean, this overall project has about a $200,000 budget uh, on Broadway would, would assume the rest of the responsibility. Uh, as Chelsea mentioned, it's it's... We are estimating 115,000 for the construction of the chalets. The balance of it would be related to programming. That would occur 12 days. Um, if you look at Chris Kindle markets in other areas, they generally drive thousands of attendees, uh, even in smaller communities. Uh, we've had smaller ones nearby in Door County, uh, in Elkhart Lake. Um, they're, they're, I mean, substantial is kind of obviously a very, uh, subjective term, but it, it does generally drive substantial foot traffic. And it would be an all-day type event, not just like an evening like some of the other events? It would be were. every Friday night and every, uh, so Friday night from, I believe, 5 till 9, and every Saturday from noon and, uh, or maybe 11 till 5. Okay. And would you still have some of the nighttime, uh, like wine walks and that kind of stuff yes. that you've had in the past? So that yes. would be an addition too? Correct. All right. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Alder. Alder Eck? Um, I did not mean to hit the, I thought it was unhitting. You don't have to speak if you no, I don't, don't even. want to. Alder yeah, Scannell. He quick yeah. runs, of, yeah, I don't even see me in there. That's right. Yeah. Go ahead, Alder. I'm everywhere. Uh, how, uh, if we reduce this, how, how big of a, would it be too much of a burden for this project to go forward if it was reduced, say, by half or uh, a quarter? Um, the budget calls for approximately 12 to 15 chalets. If you reduce it, the chalets would be proportionate, proportionately reduced. So, for example, if you cut it in half, uh, it would likely mean you know, seven maybe chalets. And I think the question for you to contemplate is, does that would that draw people at the same level? Yeah. I thought you just meant the Shelleys got smaller. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I mean, that's technically possible, too. Yeah. Thank you. But the Shelleys are already pretty small. <laughs> uh, additional questions? All right. We will move on to 12. It's $500,000 for the Artist Residency Project. Mayor, I, I submitted this one as yeah. well. Uh, and again, I, I, I'm perfectly fine with a refer to staff on this one. 
we're, we're, we gotta we, we gotta come back. We're coming. We're coming back. Okay. Thanks, Alder. Thirteen is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for Discover Green Bay. Any comments on that one or thoughts? All right, and that that's a recommended referral. Fourteen is twenty five thousand dollars for the Shipyard uh, District Inc. Elder Johnson? Yeah, it, this one, uh, again, I thought I had submitted this under the small business support one. I think I'd rather see it come out of that category. I don't know if it's, I, I'm okay with making the motion on this one right now. It's a small amount. Uh, again, all the other bids have been supported. Um, and this shows a really nice gesture, I think, with the hard work that we've been doing to uh, work with that group that's been organizing down there. Um, you know, and they're, they're really looking to make some investments and enhancements to the streetscape design. Uh, to some of the other things that would help support the small businesses in that area. So again, I I appreciate the referral and some of these bigger dollar items. This is a small one, and it did it was written with the contingency upon the successful passage of the resolution that we are currently drafting with them. So I, personally, again, I, I'm good with committing it. I don't know if it would be when the time comes. I'm happy to make the motion, Mayor, but I don't even know if it's possible to kind of bump it back up to that other group or if staff would need to verify that eligibility yeah and, and that's the only issue is is possible eligibility because it talks a lot about streetscape which yep. is a, a city obligation um, and so a lot of these you know a lot of the the supportive programs that are eligible go directly to businesses um, and so it, that might just be the only yep. hurdle okay let me noodle it until we make motions okay uh, on to 16 uh, $200,000 for City Deck Fox River Trail signage and improvements project. Oh, sorry. This is $300,000 for City Deck improvements. And this was uh, Downtown Inc., which they spoke to. Any thoughts on that one? All right, on to $200,000 for the City Deck Fox River Trail signage and improvements. Questions or thoughts, uh, Mayor? Yeah, it, it maybe just kind of over overarching thoughts on both of those. Um, I do think that we're overdue for some investment in that area, and obviously the programming that they provide uh, is really impactful. Draws a lot of people, uh, positively impacts tourism, uh, and, and I'd really like to be able to support them in some capacity. Um, you know, I think these are listed as referral as well. And obviously these proposals are, are maybe lacking specifics and maybe that referral would just buy enough time. Uh, but I do think it's important that we find uh, some way to make those investments because we've struggled, at least my understanding is from a city perspective, uh, to really do some of the maintenance or maybe the, the investment and other capital enhancements uh, down in that area. And, and I think this would do a lot for that, for that corridor. Yeah, well said. Just some of the same eligibility issues with it being city infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Um, any other comments on those items? With that, 45, which is a total of 150,000 to be used for the arts grant program. Deputy Director Nair Wig. So this is a, um, a continuation of our annual arts grant program that we run through the PAC. These are um, grants that are given not just for sculpture, traditional art in that capacity, it's also for teaching, visual arts, literary performances. Oops. West High got some grant money. There was some money from GB for the opera and past things. So it's a more comprehensive grant that would be available for anyone to apply for. And if anyone has any questions, my, my uh, public arts coordinator is actually in the Zoom meeting. So <laughs> I almost want to ask her a question just because she's hung in here so long. <laughs> right? that's, uh, that's dedication. It's a great program. Any questions on that one? Next one is $50,000 for the Rotating Arts Program. Yep, and this is a continuation of our Rotating Arts. We want to add four more sites and then just to continue to fund this program for three years. It allows us to put new artwork in neighborhoods across the city. Um, four would allow us to expand and some further on the east side. And I think we should support it. <laughs> Great. And then last but not least, $500,000 to be used for snowmaking at Triangle Hill. Director Ditchite. Yes, we're trying to provide additional outdoor recreation uh, opportunities for winter uh, opportunities. And 
out at Triangle Hill, uh, we've the last few years we've really had a, a problem with uh, lack of snow. So last year we weren't able to open a single day uh, because we didn't have adequate snow in order to operate our tow lift rope system. And the previous two years prior to that, uh, we were closed nearly six weeks on average. And usually our, our season runs 10 to 11 weeks. So that's over half the time that we're closed due to lack of snow. Uh, so we're requesting $500,000 in funding. Uh, we're estimating that it will cost a total of $600,000 to complete this project. So we would be short about $100,000, which we would, uh, if this uh, gets funded, we would put $100,000 in our bond request. And it would be broken down into about $450,000 for the snowmaking equipment and infrastructure related to that, and then about $150,000 to buy a used um, tractor or snow groomer so we could push the snow around and, and put it into lanes. And just to give you a comparison, uh, last winter, Kiwani Park, uh, they have a very similar uh, tubing hill, uh, skiing hill as our facility. Last year, they had 16,000, nearly 16,500 visitors to their facility. We had zero. So um, by making snow, we'll be able to attract a lot of people to that facility. Thanks, Director. I was there 50 degree weather and there was still snow, so mm -hmm. it was kind of nice. Any uh, comments or questions on that item, Alder Galvin? Director, you do get the snow machine, you get this thing up and running. Uh, do you plan on being open seven days a week? Yes. And when would you be open? I mean, uh, at, just at night during the weekdays and then all day on weekends? Uh, we haven't we haven't looked to see if we'll have different hours, um, but yeah, we'll be as open as much as we can. Uh, obviously, weekends we'll have extended hours. All right, thank you. I, I've been in favor of this project. I've been talking about doing something like this out there for years. That is a a item that in Brown County no one else would have. I think we would attract people from a much larger area, much like Bay Beach. Uh, certainly we wouldn't be bringing in quite the revenue that Bay Beach does, but I think with everything we've been doing, all the improvements out in that area, I think that this would be huge for the city of Green Bay. I, I think it'd be a, just a, a real good money maker for us. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Uh, Alder Eck and then Alder Storer. Um, I too am in favor of this. I, I grew up by there. My mom still lives by there. And I every night there was enough snow I was out there and it was very disappointing when you get there and there wasn't enough and I don't know if it's my imagination but I feel like it's been closed way more than when I was a kid but it could be the, just my memory but um, I think that it, it is a revenue um, source because people pay for renting the tubes they pay for the tow rope would this also be in the ski area uh, yes, we can make, with what we're proposing here, we can get two snow cannons, and one of the ski hills will be able to make snow. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Alder Storer? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Director Ditchhead, is there any way to put a number Sorry. on potential revenues that might come from something like this, or is that too early to tell? You know, let's say It'd be a projection, but I'll tell you with Kiwani, um, like I said, last year they had 16,500 visitors. Uh, they charged $10 for, for two hours of tubing. And then in addition, they sold quite a bit in concessions in addition to that. Uh, that is significantly higher than what we budget for. Uh, currently, we budget for about 1,500 patrons at $5 each. Because uh, right now we only charge five dollars to rent the tube for the entire day. Uh, if we do get snow making equipment, uh, we will probably look at our fee structure a little bit differently and go to something a little more comparable to Kiwani, because we're expecting a lot bigger crowds uh, that we wouldn't be able to rent the tubes for the entire day like we currently do now. And like I asked before about you know payback on something like this, how long it might take to over how many years it would take to pay off something like that even though we're getting the money I understand but and that I haven't calculated okay. out I would right. just be guessing tonight that's fine all right thank you all right thanks Alder any other questions or comments on this one Mayor. Alder Johnson 
Yeah, I, I like this one too, high impact project. The uh, procedural question perhaps that I have is because, in, and I don't wanna be presumptuous about the will of council right now, but it seems like this might be a popular uh, project. And so if, if we wanted to make a procedural motion that could address that one first, how would we go about doing that? Make a motion. Just to <laughs> reconsider the agenda or can I? No. Can I just take it up first? Sure. I. Nobody cares about procedure. <laughs> <laughs> I I would move that we approve the. I would we'll go move in reverse that, order. I would move that we approve five hundred thousand dollars for the Thanks. snow machines. Motion made by Alder Johnson to approve. Seconded by Alder Scannell. Additional comments. Seconded by Alder Ack. Yes. Uh, any comments? Seeing none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and we'll we will go in reverse order. Forty six. Uh, Your Honor, which ones were referred to? Were referred to staff? Uh, we didn't. We haven't yet. taken an action on anything, other than the snowmaking. Right, but there were. Yeah, yeah. So yep. I can I I can call those out. Um. Sure. Keep it up at once, just like we've been doing. Alder Grant. Um, so I would almost like to see how the rest play out before we approve any further because we just took half of this amount with the one proposal. So I motion to hold the remaining until we can figure out what all qualifies. To the next meeting? Um, I would propose to September's meeting because to give staff enough time to go through all of the remaining proposals. Okay, there's a motion to hold this over until the first meeting in September? Yes, it is September 20th. And then you're making that motion on all of the remaining items within the category? Correct. I would like to separate the uh, Just, do you have a second for that motion? Second. Seconded by Alder Morgan. The, the only thing that I would say about that is, you know, it, it prevents staff from doing the work on these projects um, to sort of you know, figure out eligibility or if there's a different category under which it would make oh. some sense if we're just holding them. I apologize, then I mean to hold the two that staff recommends, uh, 62211 and 62212. Mm -hmm. to, to refer, uh, well, those ones are already recommended so they could just be held until the other ones that were referred back to staff have done, gone through their due diligence. No? Okay. So. Well, those three the staff already recommended. Or those two, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So 45 and 46? Yeah, sorry, I have the proposals up, not the item number. That's 211 and 212. Correct, yeah, 45 and 46, I motion to hold because staff already recommended them until we know if the rest of the proposals apply. I think it's the opposite. Am I saying that backwards? So Alder Grant is proposing that we hold the staff recommended projects, 45 and 46, until our first meeting in September. Is there a second for that? So point of inquiry, Mayor? Yeah, Alder Johnson. Yeah, I mean, in theory, and, and I appreciate what Alder Grant's doing, it makes sense, uh, but in theory, I think we could still just refer them all and, and, and have staff bring them all back once they've done their diligence, right? Sure. If, if that is agreeable with Alder Grant? Sure, I motion to refer all back to staff. Okay, so <laughs> there's a motion to refer 10 through 40, or, yeah, 10 through 46, is that right? Back to staff. When would they report out? As soon as we're ready. <laughs> Number 10 is kind of time sensitive. Seconded by Alder Morgan. All in favor will signify by saying aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Those items are referred back to staff. Now on to resolutions. Motion to, uh, Motion to adopt, made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Eck. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll use the board.
motion succeeds. Who wants to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn made by Alder Scandal, seconded by Alder Campbell. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. We're adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.